by John L. Ransom Andersonville Diary, Escape and List of Dead To the mothers, wives, and sisters of those whose names are herein recorded as having died in Andersonville, this book is respectfully dedicated by the author. The book to which these lines form an introduction is a peculiar one in many respects. It is a story, but it is a true story, and written years ago with little idea that it would ever come into this form. The writer has been induced only recently, by the advice of friends, and by his own feeling that such a production would be appreciated, to present what, at the time it was being made up, was merely a means of occupying a mind which had to contemplate, besides, only the horrors of a situation from which death would have been, and was to thousands, a happy relief. The original diary in which these writings were made from day to day was destroyed by fire some years after the war, but its contents had been printed in a series of letters to the Jackson, Michigan Citizen, and to the editor and publisher of that journal, thanks are now extended for the privilege of using his files for the preparation of this work. There has been little change in the entries in the diary before presenting them here. In such cases, the words which suggest themselves at the time are best. They cannot be improved upon by substitution at a later day. This book is essentially different from any other that has been published concerning the late war or any of its incidents. Those who have had any such experience as the author will see its truthfulness at once, and to all other readers it is commended as a statement of actual things by one who experienced them to the fullest. The annexed list of the Andersonville dead is from the rebel official records, is authentic, and will be found valuable in many pension cases and otherwise. Bell Island, Richmond, Virginia, November twenty second, 1863 I was captured near Rogersville, East Tennessee, on the 6th of this month, while acting as Brigade Quartermaster Sergeant. The brigade was divided, two regiments twenty miles away, while Brigade Headquarters, with 7th Ohio and 1st Tennessee Mounted Infantry, were at Rogersville. The Brigade Quartermaster had a large quantity of clothing on hand, which we were about to issue to the brigade as soon as possible. The rebel citizens got up a dance at one of the public houses in the village and invited all the Union officers. This was the evening of November 5th. Nearly all the officers attended and were away from the command nearly all night, and many were away all night. We were encamped in a bend of the Halston River. It was a dark, rainy night, and the river rose rapidly before morning. The dance was a ruse to get our officers away from their command. At break of day the pickets were drove in by rebel cavalry, and orders were immediately received from commanding officer to get wagon train out on the road in ten minutes. The quartermaster had been to the dance and had not returned, consequently it devolved upon me to see to wagon train, which I did, and in probably ten minutes the whole seventy-six mule army wagons were in line out on the main road, while the companies were forming into line and getting ready for a fight. Rebels had us completely surrounded, and soon began to fire volley after volley into our disorganized ranks. Not one officer in five was present. General commanding and staff, as soon as they realized our danger, started for the river, swam across, and got away. We had a small company of artillery with us, commanded by a lieutenant. The lieutenant, in the absence of other officers, assumed command of the two regiments, and right gallantly did he do service, kept forming his men for the better protection of his wagon train, while the rebels were shifting around from one point to another, and all the time sending volley after volley into our ranks. Our men did well, and had there been plenty of officers and ammunition, we might have gained the day. After ten hours' fighting, we were obliged to surrender, after having lost in killed over a hundred, and three or four times that number in wounded. 
After surrendering, we were drawn up into line, counted off, and hurriedly marched away south. By eight o'clock at night, had probably marched ten miles and encamped until morning. We expected that our troops would intercept and release us, but they did not. An hour before daylight we were up and on the march toward Bristol, Virginia, that being the nearest railroad station. We were cavalrymen, and marching on foot made us very lame, and we could hardly hobble along. Were very well fed on cornbread and bacon. Reached Bristol, Virginia, November 8th, and were soon aboard of cattle cars en route for the rebel capital. I must here tell how I came into possession of a very nice and large bedspread which is doing good service even now these cold nights. After we were captured, everything was taken away from us, blankets, overcoats, and in many cases our boots and shoes. I had on a new pair of boots, which by muddying them over had escaped the rebel eyes thus far as being a good pair. As our blankets had been taken away from us, we suffered considerably from cold. I saw that if I was going to remain a prisoner of war, it behooved me to get hold of a blanket. After a few hours' march, I became so lame, walking with my new boots on, that the rebels were compelled to put me on an old horse that was being led along by one of the guard. This guard had the bedspread before spoken of told him I was going into prison at the beginning of a long winter, and should need a blanket, and couldn't he give me his. We had considerable talk, and were very good friends. Said he rather liked me, but wouldn't part with his bedspread. Didn't love me that much, treated me, however, with Apple Jack out of his canteen. I kept getting my wits together to arrange some plan to get the article in question. Finally, I told him I had a large sum of money on my person, which I expected would be taken away from me anyhow, and, as he was a good fellow, would rather he have it than anyone else. He was delighted and all attention, wanted me to be careful and not let any of the other rebels see the transfer. I had a lot of Michigan broken-down wild oat money and pulled it out of an inside pocket and handed him the roll. It was green paper, and of course he supposed it greenbacks, was very glad of the gift, and wanted to know what he could do for me. My first proposition to him was to let me escape, but he couldn't do that. Then I told him to give me the bedspread, as it might save my life. After some further parley, he consented and handed over the spread. He was afraid to look at his money for fear someone would see him, and so did not discover that it was worthless until we had become separated. Guards were changed that night, and never saw him any more. The cars ran very slow, and being crowded for room, the journey to Richmond was very tedious. Arrived on the morning of November 13th, seven days after capture, at the south end of the Long Bridge, ordered out of the cars and into line, counted off, and started for Belle Isle. Said island is in the James River, probably covers ten or twelve acres, and is right across from Richmond. The river between Richmond and the island is probably a third or half a mile. The long bridge is near the lower part of the island. It is a cold, bleak piece of ground, and the winter winds have free sweep from up the river. Before noon we were turned into the pen, which is merely enclosed by a ditch, and the dirt taken from the ditch thrown up on the outside, making a sort of breastwork. The ditch serves as a deadline, and no prisoners must go near the ditch. The prison is in the command of a Lieutenant Boisier, a rather young and gallant-looking sort of fellow, is a born southerner, talking so much like a negro that you would think he was one, if you could hear him talk and not see him. He has two rebel sergeants to act as his assistants, Sergeant Height and Sergeant Marks. These two men are very cruel, as is also the lieutenant, when angered. Outside the prison pen is a bakehouse made of boards, the rebel tents for the accommodation of the officers and guard, and a hospital also of tent cloth. Running from the pen is a lane enclosed by high boards going to the water's edge. At night this is closed up by a gate at the pen and thrown open in the morning. 
About half of the six thousand prisoners here have tents, while the rest sleep and live out of doors. After I had been on this island two or three days, I was standing near the gate eating some rice soup out of an old broken bottle, thoroughly disgusted with the Southern Confederacy and this prison in particular. A young man came up to me whom I immediately recognized as George W. Hendricks, a member of my own Company A, 9th Michigan Cavalry, who had been captured some time before myself was feeling so blue, cross, and cold that I didn't care whether it was him or not. He was on his way to the river to get some water, found I wasn't going to notice him in any way, and so proceeded on his errand. When I say that George Hendricks was one of the most valued friends I had in the regiment, this action on my part will seem strange, as indeed it is. Did not want to see him or anyone else I had ever seen before. Well, George came back a few moments after, looked at me a short time, and says, I believe you are John L. Ransom, Q.M. Sergeant, of the same company with me, although you don't seem to recognize me. Told him, I was that same person, recognized him, and there could be no mistake about it. Wanted to know why in the old Harry I didn't speak to him then. After telling him just how it was, freezing to death, half-starved, and graybacks crawling all over me, and etc., we settled down into being glad to see one another. November 23rd. Having a few dollars of good Yankee money, which I have hoarded since my capture, have purchased a large blank book, and intend, as long as I am a prisoner of war in this confederacy, to note down from day to day, as occasion may occur, events as they happen, treatment, ups and downs generally. It will serve to pass away the time, and may be interesting at some future time to read over. November 24. Very cold weather. Four or five men chilled to death last night. A large portion of the prisoners who have been in confinement any length of time are reduced to almost skeletons from continued hunger, exposure, and filth having some money just indulged in an extra ration of cornbread, for which I paid twenty cents in Yankee script, equal to two dollars Confederate money, and should say by the crowd collected around that such a sight was an unusual occurrence, and put me in mind of gatherings I have seen in the North around some curiosity. We received for today's food half a pint of rice soup and one quarter of a pound loaf of cornbread. The bread is made from the very poorest meal, coarse, sour, and musty, would make poor feed for swine at home. The rice is nothing more than boiled in river water with no seasoning whatever, not even salt, but for all that it tastes nice. The greatest difficulty is the small allowance given us. The prisoners are blue, downcast, and talk continually of home and something good to eat. They nearly all think there will be an exchange of prisoners before long, and the trick of it is to live until the time approaches. We are divided off into hundreds with a sergeant to each squad who draws the food and divides it up among his men, and woe unto him if a man is wronged out of his share. His life is not worth the snap of a finger if caught cheating. No wood tonight, and it is very cold. The nights are long and are made hideous by the moans of suffering wretches. November 25. Hendrix is in a very good tent with some nine or ten others, and is now trying to get me into the already crowded shelter. They say I can have the first vacancy, and as it is impossible for a dozen to remain together long without losing some by sickness, my chance will be good in a few days at farthest. Food again at four o'clock in place of soup, received about four ounces of salt horse, as we call it. November 26. Hendrix sacrificed his own comfort and lay outdoors with me last night, and I got along much better than the night before. Are getting food twice today? Old prisoners say it is fully a third more than they have been eating. Hardly understand how we could live on much less. A Michigan man could not learn his name, while at work a few moments ago on the outside with a squad of detailed Yankees repairing a part of the embankment which recent rains had washed away, 
stepped upon the wall to give orders to his men when one of the guards shot him through the head, killing him instantly. Lieutenant Bozier, commander of the prison, having heard the shot, came to learn the cause. He told the guard he ought to be more careful and not shoot those who were on parole and doing fatigue duty, and ordered the body carried to the dead house. Seems tough to me, but others don't seem to mind it much. I am mad. November 27. Stormy and disagreeable weather. From 15 to 20 and 25 die every day, and are buried just outside the prison with no coffins, nothing but canvas wrapped around them. Eight sticks of four-foot wood given every squad of one hundred men today, and when split up and divided, it amounted to nothing towards warming a person. Two or three can put their wood together and boil a little coffee made from bread crusts. The sick are taken out every morning and either sent over to the city or kept in the hospital just outside the prison and on the island. None admitted, unless carried out in blankets, and so far gone there is not much chance of recovery. Medical attendance is scarce. November 28. Very cold, and men suffer terribly with hardly any clothing on some of them. A man taken outside today, bucked and gagged for talking with a guard, a severe punishment this very cold weather. November 30. Came across E. P. Sanders from Lansing, Michigan, and a jolly old soul is he. Can't get discouraged where he is. Talk a great deal about making our escape, but there is not much prospect. We are very strongly guarded with artillery bearing on every part of the prison. The long bridge I have heard so much about crosses the river just below the island. It is very long and has been condemned for years. Trains move very slow across it. There was a big fire over in Richmond last night about two o'clock. Could hear all the fire bells and see the house tops covered with people looking at it. Great excitement among the Johnny Rebs. December 1 with no news concerning the great subject, exchange of prisoners, very hungry, and am not having a good time of it. Take it all around, I begin to wish I had stayed at home, and was at the Jackson Citizen office pulling the old press. Dream continually nights about something good to eat. Seems rather hard, such plenty at the north, and starving here. Have just seen a big fight among the prisoners, just like so many snarly dogs, cross and peevish. A great deal of fighting going on. Rebels collect around on the outside in crowds to see the Yankees bruise themselves, and it is quite sport for them. Have succeeded in getting into the tent with Hendrix. One of the mess has been sent over to Richmond Hospital, leaving a vacancy which I am to fill. There are nine others, myself making ten. The names are as follows. W. C. Robinson, Orderly Sergeant, 34th Illinois, W. H. Mustard, Hospital Steward, 100th Pennsylvania, Joe Myers, 34th Illinois, H. Freeman, Hospital Steward, 30th Ohio, C. G. Strong, 4th Ohio Cavalry, Corporal John McCartan, 6th Kentucky, U. Kindred, 1st East Tennessee Infantry, E. P. Sanders, 20th Michigan Infantry, George Hendricks and myself of the Ninth Michigan Cavalry. A very good crowd of boys, and all try to make their places as pleasant as possible. General Neil Dow today came over from Libby Prison on parole of honor to help issue some clothing that has arrived for Belle Isle prisoners from the Sanitary Commission at the North. Sergeant Robinson, taken outside to help General Dow in issuing clothing, and thinks through his influence to get more out for the same purpose. A man froze to death last night where I slept. The body lay until nearly dark before it was removed. My blanket comes in good play, and it made the boys laugh when I told how I got it. We tell stories, dance around, keep as clean as we can without soap, and make the best of a very bad situation. December 2. Pleasant weather and favorable for prisoners. At about nine in the morning, the work of hunting for vermin commences, and all over camp sit the poor starved wretches, nearly stripped, engaging in picking off and killing the big graybacks. The ground is fairly alive with them, and it requires continual labor to keep from being eaten up alive by them. I just saw a man shot. 
he was called down to the bank by the guard and as he leaned over to do some trading another guard close by shot him through the side and it is said mortally wounded him it was made up between the guards to shoot the man and when the lieutenant came round to make inquiries concerning the affair one of them remarked that the blank blank passed a counterfeit bill on him the night before and he thought he would put him where he could not do the like again the wounded man was taken to the hospital and has since died his name was gilbert he was from new jersey food twice a day buggy bean soup and a very small allowance of cornbread hungry all the time december three rumors of exchange to be effected soon rebels say we will all be exchanged before many days it cannot be possible our government will allow us to remain here all winter general dow is still issuing clothing but the rebels get more than our men do of it guards nearly all dressed in yankee uniforms in our mess we have established regulations and any one not conforming with the rules is to be turned out of the tent must take plenty of exercise keep clean free as circumstances will permit of vermin drink no water until it has been boiled which process purifies and makes it more healthy are not to allow ourselves to get despondent and must talk laugh and make as light of our affairs as possible sure death for a person to give up and lose all ambition received a spoonful of salt to-day for the first time since i came here december four exchange news below par to-day rather colder than yesterday a great many sick and dying off rapidly rebel guards are more strict than usual and one risks his life by speaking to them at all wrote a letter home to-day also one to a friend in washington doubtful whether i ever hear from them robinson comes inside every night and always brings something good we look forward to the time of his coming with pleasure occasionally he brings a stick of wood which we split up fine and build a cheerful fire in our little sod fireplace sit up close together and talk of home and friends so far away we call our establishment the astor house of belle isle there are so many worse off than we are that we are very well contented and enjoy ourselves after a fashion december five cold and raw weather with no wood men are too weak to walk nights to keep warm sink down and chill to death at least a dozen were carried out this morning feet foremost through robinson's influence hendrix and myself will go out to-morrow to issue clothing and will come back in nights to sleep we are to receive extra rations for our services in good spirits to-night with a good fire and very comfortable for this place december six one month a prisoner to-day longer than any year of my life before hope i am not to see another month in the confederacy a great deal of stealing going on among the men there are organized bands of raiders who do pretty much as they please a ration of bread is often of more consequence than a man's life have received food but once to-day very cold at least one hundred men limping around with frozen feet and some of them crying like little children. Am at work on the outside today, go out at nine in the morning, and return at four in the afternoon, and by right smart figuring carry in much extra food for tent makes, enough to give all hands a good square meal. December 7. No news of importance. The rebels say a flag of truce boat has arrived at City Point, and Commissioner Oles telegraphed for, and undoubtedly will agree upon terms for an exchange of prisoners, men receiving boxes from their friends at the North, and am writing for one myself, without much hope of ever getting it. December 8. The men all turned out of the enclosure and are being squatted over. A very stormy and cold day, called out before breakfast and nearly dark before again sent inside very muddy and the men have suffered terribly stand up all day in the cold drizzling rain with no chance for exercise and many barefooted i counted nine or ten who went out in the morning not able to get back at night three of the number being dead december nine 
rumors that one thousand go off today to our lines and the same number every day until all are removed it was not believed until a few moments ago the lieutenant stepped upon the bank and said that in less than a week we would all be home again and such a cheering among us every man who could yell had his mouth stretched persons who fifteen minutes ago could not rise to their feet are jumping around in excitement shaking hands with one another and crying a general exchange a general exchange all in good spirits and we talk of the good dinners we will get on the road home food twice a day and a little salt december ten instead of prisoners going away five hundred more have come which makes it very crowded some are still confident we will go away soon but i place no reliance on rebel reports rather warmer than usual and the men busying themselves hunting vermin a priest in the camp distributing tracts men told him to bring bread they want no tracts exchange news has died away and more despondent than ever i to-day got hold of a richmond inquirer which spoke of bread riots in the city women running around the streets and yelling peace or bread december eleven was on guard last night over the clothing outside Lieutenant Bourzier asked Corporal McCartan and myself to eat supper with him last night, which we were very glad to do. Henry, the negro servant, said to the lieutenant, after we had got through eating, "'I golly, master, don't never ask them boys to eat with us again. They eat us out clean gone.' And so we did eat everything on the table and looked for more. December 12th at just daylight i got up and was walking around the prison to see if any michigan men had died during the night and was just in time to see a young fellow come out of his tent nearly naked and deliberately walk up the steps that led over the bank just as he got on the top the guard fired sending a ball through his brain and the poor fellow fell dead in the ditch i went and got permission to help pull him out he had been sick for a number of days, and was burning up with fever, and no doubt deranged at the time, else he would have known better than to have risked his life in such a manner. His name was Perry McMichael, and he was from Minnesota. Perhaps he is better off, and a much easier death, than to die of disease, as he undoubtedly would in a few days longer. The work of issuing clothing slowly goes on. In place of General Dow, Colonel Sanderson comes over on parole of honor, and is not liked at all, is of New York, and a perfect tyrant, treats us as bad or worse than the rebels themselves. Colonel Boyd also comes occasionally, and is a perfect gentleman, talked to me today concerning Sanderson's movements, and said if he got through to our lines should complain of him to the authorities at Washington. He took down notes in his diary against him. December 13. Nothing of any importance to note down. The officers come over from Richmond every day or two, and make a showing of issuing clothing. The work goes on slowly, and it would seem that if clothing was ever needed and ought to be issued, it is now. Yet the officers seem to want to nurse the job and make it last as long as possible. Many cruelties are practiced, principally by the rebel sergeants. The lieutenant does not countenance much cruelty, still he is very quick-tempered, and when provoked is apt to do some very severe things. The Yankees are a hard crowd to manage, will steal anything, no matter what, regardless of consequences. Still, I don't know, as it is any wonder, cooped up as they are in such a place, and called upon to endure such privations. The death rate gradually increases from day to day. A little Cincinnati soldier died to-day, was captured same time as myself, and we had messed together a number of times before I became identified with the Astor House mess. Was in very poor health when captured, but could never quite find out what ailed him. I have many talks with the rebels, and am quite a privileged character. By so doing, am able to do much for the boys inside, and there are good boys in there, whom I would do as much for as myself. December 17. I have plenty to eat, go outside every day whether clothing is issued or not. To explain the manner of issuing clothing, 
The men are called outside by squads, that is, one squad of a hundred men at a time. All stand in a row in front of the boxes of clothing. The officer in charge, Colonel Sanderson, begins with the first at the head of the column, looks him over and says to us paroled men, Here, give this man a pair of pants, or coat, or such clothing as he may stand in need of. In this way he gets through with a hundred men in about half an hour. Us boys often manage to give three or four articles where only one has been ordered. There seems to be plenty of clothing here, and we can see no reason why it should not be given away. Have to be very careful, though, for if we are caught at these tricks, are sent inside to stay. Officers stay on the island only two or three hours, and clothe four or five hundred men, when they could just as well do three or four times as much. It is comical, the notes that come in some of the good, warm, woolen stockings. These have evidently been knit by the good mothers, wives, and sisters at the north, and some of the romantic sort have written letters and placed inside, asking the receiver to let them know about himself, his name, etc., etc. Most of them come from the New England states, and they cheer the boys up a great deal. December 18. Today, as a squad was drawn up in front of us, waiting for clothing, I saw an Irishman in the ranks who looked familiar. Looked at him for some time, and finally thought I recognized in him an old neighbor of mine in Jackson, Michigan. One Jimmy Devers, a whole-souled and comical genius as ever it was my fortune to meet. Went up to him and asked what regiment he belonged to, said he belonged to the 23rd Indiana, at which I could not believe it was my old acquaintance. Went back to my work. Pretty soon he said to me, Ain't you Johnny Ransom? And then I knew I was right. He had lived in Jackson, but had enlisted in an Indiana regiment. Well, we were glad to see one another, and you may just bet that Jimmy got as good a suit of clothes as ever he had in our own lines. Jimmy is a case was captured on the first day of July at the Gettysburg battle, and is consequently an old prisoner, is very tough and hardy, says the Johnny Rebs have a big contract on their hands to kill him. But I tell him to take good care of himself anyway, as there is no knowing what he will be called upon to pass through yet. December 20. James River frozen nearly over, and rebels say it has not been so cold for years as at the present time. There are hundreds with frozen feet, ears, hands, etc., and laying all over the prison, and the suffering is terrible. Hendrix and myself are intent on some plan for escape. The lieutenant has spies who are on the watch. The authorities know all about any conspiracy almost as soon as it is known among ourselves. Last night, just after dark, two or three Yankees agreed to give the guard ten dollars if he would let them get over the bank, to which he promised, and as soon as they got nearly over, fired and immediately gave the alarm. One of them received a shot in one of his legs, and the others scrambled back over the bank, the three minus their ten dollar bill and a sound leg. They cannot be trusted at all, and will promise anything for greenbacks. Sergeant Bullock of our regiment is here and very sick with fever. Cannot possibly live many weeks in such a place as this. Colonel Sanderson still issuing clothing, but very unfair, and the men who need it most get none at all. All the outsiders received a suit throughout today, myself among the rest. Got a letter from home, everybody is well. They say keep up good heart and we will be exchanged before many weeks. December 21. Still cold, have enough to eat myself, but am one of a thousand. The scurvy is appearing among some of the men, and is an awful disease, caused by want of vegetable diet, acids, and so forth. Two smallpox cases taken to the hospital today. A sutler has been established on the island, and sells at the following rates. Poor brown sugar, eight dollars per pound, butter, eleven dollars cheese ten dollars, sour milk three per quart, and the only article I buy, eggs ten dollars per dozen, oysters six dollars per quart, and the cheapest food in market. December 22. A large mail came this morning, but nothing for me. 
A man who gets a letter is besieged with questions, and a crowd gathers around to hear the news, if any, regarding our future. Rations smaller than usual, and Lieutenant Boisier says that it is either exchange or starve with us prisoners sure, as they have not the food to give us. Today saw a copy of the Richmond Inquirer, in which was a long article treating on exchange of prisoners, saying our government would not exchange owing to an excess held by us, and unless their terms were agreed to, as they could not afford to keep us, the coming summer would reduce our ranks, so they would not have many to feed another winter. Rather poor prospects ahead for us poor imprisoned Yanks. Lots of sanitary stores sent on to the island for us, but as yet none have been issued, the rebels, officers in particular, getting fat on what rightfully belongs to us. December 23. Almost Christmas, and we are planning for a Christmas dinner. Very cold. The rebels are testing their big guns on the opposite shore of the river and fairly shake the ground we stand on. We can see the shells as they leave the guns until they explode, affording quite a pastime for us watching their war machines. Militia in sight drilling over in Richmond. A woman found among us, a prisoner of war. Someone who knew the secret informed Lieutenant Bozier, and he immediately had her taken outside when she told him the whole story, how she had followed her lovier a soldiering in disguise, and being of a romantic turn enjoyed it hugely, until the funny part was done away with, and Madame Collier, from East Tennessee, found herself in durance vile. Nothing to do but make the best of it and conceal her sex if possible, hoping for a release which, however, did not come in the shape she wished. The lieutenant has sent her over to Richmond to be cared for, and she is to be sent north by the first flag of truce boat. She tells of another female being among us, but as yet she has not been found out. December 24. Must hang up my stocking tonight, for habit's sake, if nothing else. I am enjoying splendid health and prison life agrees with me. Wrote home today. December 25. And Christmas. One year ago today first went into camp at Coldwater, little dreaming what changes a year would bring around, but there are exchange rumors afloat and hope to see white folks again before many months. All ordered out to be squatted over again, which was quite a disappointment to our mess, as we were making preparations for a grand dinner, gotten up by outside hands, Mustard, Myers, Hendricks, and myself. However, we had our good things for supper instead of dinner, and it was a big thing, consisting of cornbread and butter, oysters, coffee, beef, crackers, cheese, etc., all we could possibly eat or do away with, and costing the snug little sum of two hundred dollars Confederate money, or twenty dollars in greenbacks lay awake long before daylight listening to the bells. As they rang out Christmas good morning, I imagined they were in Jackson, Michigan, my old home, and from the spires of the old Presbyterian and Episcopal churches. Little do they think as they are saying their Merry Christmases and enjoying themselves so much of the hunger and starving here, but there are better days coming. December 26th news of exchange, and no officers over from Libby to issue clothing. Extra quantity of wood. Rebels all drunk and very domineering. Punish for the smallest kind of excuse. Some men tunneled out of the pen, but were retaken, and were made to crawl back through the same hole they went out of, and the lieutenant kept hitting them with a board as they went down, and then ran back and forward from one hole to the other, and, as they stuck up their heads, would hit them with a club, keeping them at it for nearly an hour. A large crowd of both rebels and Yankees collected around to see the fun. December 27. Colonel Sanderson and Colonel Boyd came over this morning in a great hurry, and began to issue clothing very fast, saying an exchange had been agreed upon, and they wanted to get rid of it before we all went away. 
Pretty soon the news got inside, and the greatest cheering, yelling, shaking of hands, and congratulating one another took place. Just before dinner, five hundred were taken out, counted, and sent away. Everybody anxious to go away first, which, of course, they cannot do. Sergeants Height and Marks stand at the gate with big clubs, keeping order, letting them out two at a time, occasionally knocking a man down, and it is seldom he gets up again very soon. Some of the outside went, and the rest go tomorrow. It is a sure thing, a general exchange, and all will be sent away immediately. Everybody in good spirits. Guess northern folks will be surprised to see such looking objects come among them. They are the worst looking crowd I ever saw. Extra ration of food and wood tonight, and am anxiously waiting for the morrow. December 28. For some reason or other, no more being taken away, and more despondent than ever. Very cold. December 29. Nearly as cold weather as I ever saw at the north. All the supplies brought by hand over the long bridge, owing to the river being frozen over, and not strong enough to hold up. Rebel officers all drunk during the holidays. Snow an inch deep. December 30. No rations issued yesterday to any of the prisoners, and a third of all here are on the very point of starvation. Lieutenant Bozier sympathizes with us in word, but says it is impossible to help it as they have not the food for us. This is perhaps true as regards edibles, but there is no excuse for our receiving such small supplies of wood. They could give us plenty of shelter, plenty of wood and conveniences we do not now get if they felt so disposed. December 31. Still very cold and no news encouraging. Rebels very strict. One prisoner found a brother among the guards who had been living in the South for a good many years and lately conscripted into the Confederate Army. New Year's Eve. Man wounded by the guard, shooting, and ball broke his leg. Might better have shot him dead, for he will surely die. Raw rice and cornbread issued today in small quantities. Richmond Inquirer spoke of the five hundred who left here day before yesterday, and they have reached Washington. January 1, 1864 A great time this morning, wishing one another a happy new year. Robinson bought on the outside a dozen apples and gave us all a treat. Nothing but cornbread to eat and very poor quality. Dr. F. L. Lewis, veterinary surgeon, Ninth Michigan Cavalry, came in today, was captured at Dandridge, East Tennessee, where our regiment had a severe engagement. Tells me all the news, Colonel Acker wounded, etc., etc., thinks it a queer New Year trip, but also thinks we will be exchanged before many weeks. January 2. Rebel Congress about to meet, and the people of Richmond demand through the papers that the prisoners confined here be removed immediately, as there is hardly enough for themselves to eat, aside from feeding us northern hirelings. Hear of bread riots and lots of trouble across the river, a big fire last night in the vicinity of Libby Prison. January 3. Received a letter from Michigan, not quite so cold, but disagreeable weather. Nine men bucked and gagged at one time on the outside, two of them for stealing sour beans from a swill barrel. They would get permission to pass through the gate to see the lieutenant, and instead would walk around the cookhouse to some barrels containing swill, scoop up their hats full, and then run inside. But they were caught and are suffering a hard punishment for it. January 4. Some ladies visited the island to see us blue coats and laughed very much at our condition, thought it so comical and ludicrous the way the prisoners crowded the bank next the cookhouse, looking over at the piles of bread, and compared us to wild men and hungry dogs. 
a chicken belonging to the lieutenant flew up on the bank and was snatched off in short order and to pay for it we are not to receive a mouthful of food to-day making five or six thousand suffer for one man catching a little chicken january five succeeded in getting dr lewis into our tent is rather under the weather owing to exposure and hardship jimmy devers spends the evenings with us and we have funny times talking over better days and are nearly talked out i have said all i can think and am just beginning to talk it all over again all our stories have been told from two to three or four times and are getting stale we offer a reward for a good new story january six still prisoners of war without the remotest idea as to how long we are to remain so some of the paroled Yankees on the outside curse and treat the inside prisoners more cruel, when they have a chance, than the rebels themselves. Blass, a Spaniard who has been a prisoner over a year and refuses to be exchanged, is the lieutenant's right-hand man. He tied up a man a few days ago for some misdemeanor and whipped him. He is afraid to come inside, knowing he would lose his life in a jiffy. He also raises the rebel flag at the island mornings and lowers it at night. It is a dirty rag, and the appearance of it ought to disgust any sensible person. January 7. Rainy, cold, and disagreeable weather. Henry Stilson, a fellow who was captured with me, was carried out dead this morning. He was diseased when taken, and fell an easy prey to their cruelties. A good deal of raiding is going on among the men. One Captain Mosby commands a band of cutthroats who do nearly as they please, cheating, robbing, and knocking down, operating principally upon new prisoners who are unacquainted with prison life. Mosby is named after the rebel guerrilla, his real name being something else. He is from New York City and is a regular bummer. January 8 all taken outside to-day to be squatted over an all-day job and nothing to eat the men being in hundreds and some dying off every day leave vacancies in the squads of as many as die out of them and in order to keep them filled up have to be squatted over every few days thereby saving rations richmond papers are much alarmed for fear of a break among the prisoners confined within the city it is said that there are six hundred muskets secreted among the bell islanders the citizens are frightened almost to death double guards are placed over us and very strict orders issued to them january nine a signal light suspended over the island all last night for some reason unknown to the men confined there we are cautioned against approaching within eight or ten feet from the bank one of the raiders went through a man who lay near the bank and started to run after robbing him. A guard who saw the whole affair shot the villain dead and was applauded by all who knew of the affair. Fifteen or twenty carried out this morning dead, and thirty or forty nearly so in blankets. January 10. A brass band over today giving us a tune. Looks more like a wandering tribe of vagabonds than musicians discoursed sweet music such as bonnie boo flag the girl i left behind me and for their pains got three groans from their enemies in limbo dying off very fast on the island january eleven a steady rain for twenty-four hours and have not been dry during the time however it is a warm rain and get along very well we are still issuing clothing but very slow about one hundred per day get partly clothed up. No news of exchange. Abe Lincoln reported dead. Papers very bitter on Beast Butler, as they call him, manage by a good deal of skirmishing to get the papers almost every day in which we read their rebel lies. A plan afoot for escape, but am afraid to say anything of the particulars for fear of my diary being taken away from me. As I came inside tonight with some bread in my haversack, some fellows who were on the watch pitched into me and gobbled my saved-up rations. I don't care for myself, for I have been to supper, but the boys in the tent will have to go without anything to eat for this night. 
It don't matter much, they are all hungry, and it did them as much good as it would our mess. January 12. James River very high, a continual roar in our ears caused by the water falling over the cataract just above the island. Rebels fired a large shell over the prison to scare us. January 15. Everything runs along about the same. Little excitements from day to day. The weather is fair, and taken altogether thus far this winter has been very favorable to us as prisoners. Lieutenant Bozier lost his dog. Some Yanks snatched him into a tent and eat him up. Bozier very mad and is anxious to know who the guilty ones are. All he can do is to keep all our rations from us one day, and he does it. Seems pretty rough when a man will eat a dog, but such is the case. January 18. Too much exertion to even write in my diary. Talk of getting away by escaping, but find no feasible plan. Rebs very watchful. Some mail today, but nothing for me. Saw some papers, and a new prisoner brought with him a New York paper, but not a word in it about exchange. Am still outside most every day. George Hendricks at work in the cookhouse cooking rations for the prisoners. Comes down where I am every day and hands me something to take inside for the boys. He tells the lieutenant he has a brother inside that he is feeding. Although it is against orders, Lieutenant Bossier pays no attention to it. January 20. Rebel officers over today inspecting us Yanks. Some of the worst-looking Arabs in shape of officers I ever saw. Jimmy Devers comes to our tent every night and sits with us until bedtime is a jolly chap and keeps us all in good spirits with his sayings. Sergeant Robinson, I learned today, instead of being a sergeant, is a lieutenant. His whole company being captured, he preferred to go with them and share their trials than go with the officers. The men are very much attached to him, and no wonder, as he is a fine fellow. His home is in Sterling, Whiteside County, Illinois. Corporal McCartan is, as his name would indicate, an Irishman, and his home is Louisville, Kentucky. Is a shoemaker by trade. He is also a Mason, and I am going to write down wherein the fact of his being a Mason has brought good into the camp today. The boys, feeling rather more hungry than usual, were rather despondent when the corporal gets up and says, Boys, I'll go and get something to eat went out of the tent and in twenty minutes came back with three or four pounds of bacon and two loaves of cornbread. We were surprised and asked how he had performed the miracle, told us then that he was a mason, as also was the lieutenant in charge, from whom the food came. We decided then and there that the first opportunity that presented itself we would join the masons. Can see the rebels drilling across the river. January 22 cold and clear weather nothing to write today it's a task january twenty four we are all troubled with heartburn sour stomach and all drink weak lye made from ashes for it every day some new ones come inside but they know nothing as to the prospects of our being exchanged all are considerably surprised to find themselves in quite so bad a place and the subject of prison life begins to interest them Good deal of gambling going on among prisoners. Chuck-a-luck is the favorite game. You lay your ration of bread down on a figure on a board, and a fellow with a dice box shakes it up a little, throws out the dice, and your bread is gone. Don't understand the game myself. That's all I ever saw of the game. Lay down the bread, and it's gone. Rather a one-sided affair. Some men are very filthy, which makes it disagreeable for those of more cleanly habits. I believe that many, very many, who now die, would live if they adopted the rules that our mess has and lived up to them. It is the only way to get along. January 25. Being in this place brings out a man for just what he is worth. Those whom we expect the most from in the way of braving hardships and dangers prove to be nobody at all, and very often those whom we expect the least from prove to be heroes every inch of them. 
Notably, one of these is George Hendricks, who is nothing but a good-looking, effeminate boy, fit, you would say, to be going to school with a mother to look after him, and for not much else. But instead, he is brave, cheerful, smart, watching every chance to get the best of the Johnny Rebs. His position in the cookhouse has given him a chance to feed, I presume, hundreds of men. Near the cookhouse is a storehouse, and in it are several hogsheads of hams. These hams were sent from the Sanitary Commission in the north for Union prisoners, but they for whom they were intended do not get them, and they are being eaten up by the rebels. Hendricks has managed to get up a board in the cookhouse floor, where he can crawl fifteen or twenty feet under the storehouse and up through that floor. By this Yankee trick he has stolen, I presume, one hundred hams and gotten them inside where they belong. This is very risky on his part, for should he be discovered it would go very hard with him. He is about as unselfish a fellow as you can well find. This is only one of his plans to outwit the rebels for our benefit. His head is all the time, too, planning some way of escape. Well, we all hope he won't get caught. All shake in our boots for him. Was on guard last night, outside, over the clothing. There is so much clothing stole by the rebels that Bozier put a guard of two over the boxes through the night, and if any of the rebs come around to steal, we are instructed to wake up the lieutenant, who sleeps nearby in a tent. I was on duty last night with Joe Myers, and Hendricks came where we were and unfolded a plan for escape which he has been working up. It is a risky affair, and had best be thought over pretty thorough before put into execution. Robinson has been found out as a lieutenant and taken over to Richmond to be placed with the officers in Libby Prison. We are sorry that we must lose him. January 26. Ninety-two squads of prisoners confined on less than six acres of ground, one hundred in a squad, making nine thousand and two hundred altogether. The lice are getting the upper hand of us. The ground is literally covered with them. Bean soup today and is made from the following recipe. Don't know from what cookbook, some new addition. Beans are very wormy and musty. Hard work finding a bean without from one to three bugs in it. They are put into a large cauldron kettle of river water and boiled for a couple of hours. No seasoning, not even salt, put into them. It is then taken out and brought inside. Six pails full for each squad, about a pint per man and not over a pint of beans in each bucket. The water is hardly colored and I could see clear through to the bottom and count every bean in the pail. The men drink it because it is warm. There is not enough strength or substance in it to do any good. We sometimes have very good bean soup when they have meat to boil with it. January 27. More prisoners came today and say there is to be no general exchange during the war and we are to be sent off into Georgia immediately. Stormy and disagreeable weather and everybody downhearted. Very still among the men, owing to the bad news, hardly a word spoken by anybody. The least bit of anything encouraging would change the stillness into a perfect bedlam. I this morning looked into a tent where there were seventeen men, and started back frightened at the view inside. What a tableau for a New York theater! They were all old prisoners, nearly naked, very dirty and poor, some of them sick, lying on the cold ground with nothing under or over them, and no fire had just been talking over the prospect ahead, and all looked the very picture of despair, with their hollow eyes, sunken cheeks, and haggard expression. I have before imagined such scenes, but never before realized what they were until now. And such is but a fair example of hundreds of men fully as bad. January 28. 
No officers over from Libby for a few days past. Nearly all the clothing issued. A few days more will close up the clothing business, and then probably all the outsiders will be sent inside, and for fear such will be the case, we have decided upon tomorrow night for the escape, which I have not said much about in my diary. The nights are dark and cloudy. Messrs. Mustard and Hendricks both sleep outside now, and I must manage to, both tonight and tomorrow night. I have been two weeks trying to get a map of Virginia, and have at last succeeded. A negro brought it to me from the city. It has cost over thirty dollars Confederate money. At the North would have cost twenty-five cents. I would not take for it unless I could get another one one thousand dollars in gold. We are well rigged, have some food saved up to take along, in good health and determined to get away. Lieutenant Bozier suspects and today took the pains to say in our hearing that he knew an escape among the outsiders was in view, and as sure as there was a God in heaven, if we tried it and got caught, and we surely would be, he would first shoot all he could before catching us, and the balance would be tied up and whipped every day until he got tired as long as we lived. We must expect trouble. It does not change us in the least, if anything makes us the more determined to get away. Tonight we are to start, and I will write down the plans we have, running the risk of the rebels getting hold of it. At a few moments past eleven and before midnight, the guard will let us cross his beat and go to the water's edge. We all have rebel clothing which we are to wear, furnished partly by a negro and partly by the guard who helps us off. We take the quartermaster's boat, which we unlock, and having been furnished the countersign, give it to the picket, who will pretend that he thinks we are rebel guards going over to the city in case we are caught which will screen him in a measure. Having passed him, we get into the boat and row across the river, give the countersign to the guards on the other side of the river, and talk with them a little, being ourselves posted on general information regarding the place. To quiet their suspicions, if they have any, we then start up into the town and, when out of sight of the guards, take a turn to the left and go straight to the Richmond jail taking care to avoid patrols and so on. We will then meet with a negro who will guide us ten miles up the river, and then leave us in charge of friendly blacks, who will keep us through the next day, and at night pilot us farther along toward our lives. If possible, I shall steal the rebel flag, which is kept nights in the lieutenant's tent, and a few other relics to take along with me. The big bell in Richmond strikes six, and we close our diary, hoping never to look upon it again until we return to free our fellow prisoners with the glorious army of the North. Now we leave our diary to finish preparations for the flight for freedom. May God aid us in this land of tyranny where we have met nothing but suffering. Goodbye, Belle Isle and prison. Hail, freedom, home, friends and the grand army of the old flag. What is in store for us in the future? February 5. Have been reading over the last few pages of my diary. It sounds well, but the rebel flag still floats over Belle Isle. Our escapade was a grand fizzle, and all hands have been punished in more ways than one in the last few days. Bossieur suspected something going on among us, and had us secretly watched, and long before we had made a move toward fulfilling our projected plans, we were thrown into a guardhouse on the island, next morning taken out of it, and underwent a severe cross-questioning. He found our rebel clothing, food we had packed, found the lock to the boat broke, and numerous other signs of an abandonment. Well, the result has been that we were bucked and gagged twice a day for an hour each time, and for four hours each of us carried a big stick of wood up and down in front of the gate, a guard to prick us with his bayonet if we walked too slow to suit him. Then Hendrix has been strung up by the thumbs. Nights we have been thrown into a damp, cold guardhouse to shiver all night. 
Every day now for six days we have walked with our sticks of wood so many hours per day, and last night were turned inside with all the prisoners to say, Bossier says, till we rot. He can place no dependence on us. February 6. We have to laugh over our trials and tribulations. Where we had plenty a week ago, plenty of exercise and many favors, we are now right where we were at first, faring just as the rest, with no favors shown us. It's all right. We can stand it just as well as the rest. We have never belittled ourselves in the least in our dealings with the rebels. Bossier told us himself, as we came inside, that he didn't blame us in the least for trying to get away, but he was obliged to punish us for the attempt. Hendrix says he will be out again in three days. February 8. Butler reported as commissioner on exchange, and the rebels declare that they would never recognize him, and would rather that we would all die here than negotiate with the beast. Congress still in session over in the city, and we watch the papers eagerly for something relative to us. The holy Sabbath day, and the church bells ringing for morning service— don't think I shall attend this morning. It is such a long walk, and then I look so bad. Have nothing fit to wear. A man stabbed a few minutes ago by his tent-mate, killing him instantly. They had all along been the best friends until a dispute arose, and one of them drew a knife and killed his comrade. Strong talk of lynching the murderer. Have not heard the particulars. Corporal McCartan is missing from the island, and am confident from what I have seen that he has escaped, and by the help of Lieutenant Bozier. No endeavors are being made to look him up, still he offers a reward for his apprehension. They are both members of the secret craft. February 9. Great news this morning. A raid is being made on Richmond by Kilpatrick. Rebels manning their forts in sight of us— all are at work, women, children, and, in fact, everybody who can shovel. No cars running over the big bridge. Double guards placed over us, and the greatest activity prevails among them. It is really amusing to see them flying around, and many are the jokes at their expense. All business is suspended in Richmond, no papers issued, and everybody with their guns or working utensils. Brass bands are playing their best to encourage the broken-down Confederacy. A portion of the Congress came over this afternoon to take a look at us, among whom were Davis, Benjamin, and Howell Cobb. They are a substantial-looking set of men, and of the regular southern cut. The broad-brim hats, gold-headed canes, and aristocratic toss of the head alone would tell who they were. They are a proud, stern set of men, and look as if they would like to brush us out of existence. Still, we are not going to be brushed out so easy, and they found men among us who were not afraid to stare or hold our heads as high as their lordships. A band accompanied them and played the bonny blue flag, which was hissed and groaned at by the Yankees, and in return a thousand voices sang Yankee Doodle, very much to their discomfiture. February 10. The hospital signal lights suspended over the island all night in order to direct the batteries where to aim their pieces in case of an outbreak, which is greatly feared. Rockets sent up at intervals during the night over Richmond, reported that there are 600 muskets secreted among the prisoners and citizens very much alarmed and afraid of us. I hope there is, but cannot believe it. It is impossible for me to sleep, and I lay awake thinking how we are situated, and wondering how long the play is to last. February 11. Cold and pleasant. A good deal of fighting going on among us. A discontented set of beings, just like so many hungry wolves pinned up together. Rebels still at work fortifying all around Richmond. A number of Yankees have been taken out in parole of honor to work building breastworks, etc., but a very few will go, and it is considered a great crime among us to work for them. Have they forgotten our existence at the North? It seems as if we were neglected by our government, but will not judge them hastily until we know more. There are perhaps sufficient reasons for our remaining here. 
very strongly guarded nevertheless we talk of escape and are all the while building air castles february twelve lieutenant bozier has sent a squad of men from the island composed of runaways over to castle thunder to remain during the war as hostages among whom were our friends myers and mustard i never expect to see them again february thirteen very cold the rebels are again settling down and getting over their scare not much to eat now and the men more disheartened than ever a rebel preacher delivered us a sermon of two hours length from a dry goods box he was listened to attentively and made the remark before closing that he didn't know as he was doing any good talking to us it was like casting pearls before swine and he would close his remarks to which a yankee told him he might have stopped long ago if he'd wanted to no one would have made any objections was told that six hundred are to start for georgia today and subsequently six hundred every day until all are removed from richmond lieutenant bozier says it is so but there is going to be an exchange of sick in a few days and all outside hands shall be sent north with them february fourteen had quite an adventure last night with the raiders one of captain mosby's robbers was trying to steal a blanket from our tent by reaching through the tent opening when dad e p sanders who is always awake threw a brick hitting him on the arm breaking the brick and as he jumped halloed to us come boys let's catch the rascal and out of the door he went a doctor and myself nobly rushed to the rescue and reached the door just in time to see dad turn a short corner way up the street and close on to the heel of mr robber but he slipped and fell and the thief got away were soon snugly ensconced in bed once more congratulating ourselves on losing nothing as we thought but on getting up this morning i found my shoes gone and am barefoot in the middle of winter however i can get more and have no fear on that score six hundred sent away to-day some say to our lines while others think to georgia rebels say to our lines and that a general exchange has been agreed upon great excitement among the men evening lieutenant bozier called me outside just before night and told me he was called upon to furnish some hostages to be sent to charleston to be kept during the war and had decided to send hendrix and myself with some others said it was better to send those who were always trying to get away have succeeded in buying a pair of shoes which although about four sizes too large are much better than none thanks to the sanitary commission i have good woolen stockings underclothing complete and am otherwise well dressed six hundred sent away this afternoon under a very strong guard which does not look like an exchange february seventeen still on the island another squad taken out yesterday it will not be our turn to go for some days even if six hundred are taken out every day have not been sent for as hostages yet hendrix and myself have decided to flank out and go with the next that go no matter where their destination may be if we don't get away with a ghost of a chance then it will be funny february twenty all sorts of rumors afloat but still we stay here strange officers come over and look at us bozier away considerable and something evidently up anything for a change my health is good and tough as a bear february twenty three none have been taken away from the island for a number of days have heard that a box came for me and is over in richmond hope the rebel that eats the contents of that box will get choked to death i wrote to the governor of michigan austin blair who is in washington d c some weeks ago he has known me from boyhood always lived in the neighborhood at jackson michigan asked him to notify my father and brothers of my whereabouts today i received a letter from him saying that he had done as requested also that the sanitary commission had sent me some eatables this is undoubtedly the box which i have heard from and is over in richmond rebels are trying to get recruits from among us for their one-horse confederacy 
believe that one or two have deserted our ranks and gone over. Bad luck to them. Pemberton Building, Richmond, Virginia, February 24th. We are confined on the third floor of the building, which is a large tobacco warehouse. Was removed from the island yesterday. Was a warm day, and it was a long walk. Came across the long bridge, and it is a long bridge. Was not sorry to bid adieu to Bell Island. Were searched last night, but our mess has lost nothing owing to the following process we have of fooling them. One of the four manages to be in the front part of the crowd and is searched first, and is then put on the floor underneath, and we let our traps down through a crack in the floor to him, and when our turn comes we have nothing about us worth taking away. The men, so ravenous when the rations were brought in, that the boxes of bread and tubs of poor meat were raided upon before dividing, and consequently some had nothing to eat at all, while others had plenty. Our mess did not get a mouthful, and have had nothing to eat since yesterday afternoon, and it is now nearly dark. The lice are very thick. You can see them all over the floors, walls, and so on. In fact, everything literally covered with them. They seem much larger than the stock on Belle Isle and a different species. We talk of escape night and day, and are nearly crazy on the subject. No more news about exchange. Papers state that Richmond is threatened, and that Kilpatrick's cavalry is making a raid on the place for the purpose of releasing us and burning the town. Unusual bustle among them. February 25. We divide the night up into four watches and take turns standing guard while the other three sleep to protect ourselves from Captain Mosby's gang of robbers. We are all armed with iron slats pulled off the window casings. They are afraid to pitch in to us as we are a stout crowd and would fight well for our worldly goods. We expect to take it before long. They are eyeing us rather sharp, and I guess we'll make an attack tonight. Very long days and more lonesome than when on the island. Got rations today, and the allowance did not half satisfy our hunger. February 26. Rather cold, almost spring. Guards unusually strict. Hendrix was standing near the window, and I close by him, looking at the high ten-story tobacco building when the guard fired at us. The ball just grazed Hendrix's head and lodged in the ceiling above. All we could do to prevent Hendrix throwing a brick at the guard. February 27. Organizing the militia hauling artillery past the prison. Have a good view of all that is going on. Bought a compass from one of the guards for seven dollars greenbacks, worth half a dollar at home. It is already rumored among the men that we have a compass, a map of Virginia, a preparation to put on our feet to prevent dogs from tracking us, and we are looked up to as if we were sons of Irish lords in disguise and are quite noted personages cold last night, and we suffer much in not having blankets enough to keep us warm. The walls are cold and damp, making it disagreeable, and the stench nearly makes us sick. It is impossible for a person to imagine prison life until he has seen and realized it. No news of importance. Time passes much more drearily than when on Belle Isle. We're all searched again today, but still keep my diary, although expecting to lose it every day. Would be quite a loss, as the longer I write and remain a prisoner, the more attached am I to my record of passing events. A man shot for putting his head out of the window. Men all say it served him right, for he had no business to thus expose himself against strict orders to the contrary. We are nearly opposite, and not more than twenty rods from Libby Prison, which is a large tobacco warehouse. Can see plenty of Union officers, which it is a treat to look at. Hendrix had a fight with the raiders. Got licked. He ain't so pretty as he was before, but knows more. I am very wise about such matters, consequently retain my beauty. February 28. Had the honor, question mark, of seeing Jefferson Davis again, and part of his Congress today. 
They visited Libby, and we were allowed to look out of the windows to see them as they passed in and out of the building. Strut around like chickens with frozen feet. David Benjamin walked with the President and is a much better-looking man. Prisoners were notified that if they made any insulting remarks, they would be fired at. Have no more exalted opinion of them than before. February 29. Excitement among the Johnnies, flying around as if the Yankee army were threatening Richmond. Cannot learn what the commotion is, but hope it is something that will benefit us. Later. The occasion of the excitement among the rebels is that Dahlgren is making a raid on Richmond, acting in conjunction with Kilpatrick for the purpose of liberating prisoners. We are heavily guarded and not allowed to look out of the windows. Nevertheless, we manage to see about all there is going on. February 30. Rebels in hot water all night and considerably agitated. Imagined we could hear firing during the night. This morning small squads of tired-out Union soldiers marched by our prison under guard, evidently captured during the night. Look as if they was completely played out. Go straggling by, sometimes not more than half a dozen at a time. Would give something to hear the news. We are all excitement here. Negroes also go by in squads, sometimes of hundreds, in charge of overseers, and singing their quaint Negro melodies. It is supposed by us that the Negroes work on the fortifications and are moved from one part of the city to another for that purpose. Our troops have evidently been repulsed with considerable loss. We hear that Dahlgren has been shot and killed. At the very first intimation that our troops were anywhere near, the prisoners would have made a break. March 1. Working along toward spring slowly a dead calm after the raid scare. We much prefer the open-air imprisonment to confinement. Have considerable trouble with the thieves which disgrace the name of Union soldier. Are the most contemptible rascals in existence. Often walk up to a man and coolly take his food and proceed to eat it before the owner. If the victim resists, then a fight is the consequence, and the poor man not only loses his food, but gets licked as well. March 2. The food we get here is poor, water very good, weather outside admirable, vermin still under control, and the Astra House mess flourishing. We are all in good health, with the exception of Dr. Lewis, who is ailing. I was never tougher. Seems as if your humble servant was proof against the hardest rebel treatment. No exchange news. Trade and dicker with the guards and work ourselves into many luxuries, or rather work the luxuries into ourselves. Have become quite interested in a young soldier boy from Ohio named Bill Havens. Is sick with some kind of fever and is thoroughly bad off. Was tenderly brought up and well educated, I should judge says he ran away from home to become a drummer, has been wounded twice in numerous engagements, now a prisoner of war, and sick. We'll try and keep track of him. Every nationality is here represented, and from every branch of the service, and from all parts of the world. There are smart men here, and those that are not so smart. In fact, a conglomeration of humanity. Hash, as it were. March 3. The ham given us today was rotten, with those nameless little white things crawling around through it. Promptly threw it out of the window and was scolded for it by a fellow prisoner who wanted it himself. Shall never become hungry enough to eat poor meat. Guards careless with their guns. An old man shot in the arm. Hendrix tried to pull a brick out of the casing to throw at the shooter. Barbarians, these rebels. March 4. And now we are getting ready to move somewhere, the Lord only knows where. One good thing about their old prisons, we are always ready for a change. Have made many new acquaintances while here in Pemberton, and some agreeable ones. My boy Havens has fever and chills. Is rather better today. It is said we move tonight. Minnesota Indians confined here, and a number of sailors and marines. 
I am quite a hand to look at men, sometimes for hours, and study them over, then get to talking with them, and see how near I was right in my conjectures. It's almost as good as reading books. The Astor House mess is now composed of but four members, E. P. Sanders, F. L. Harris, George W. Hendricks, and myself. We still adhere to our sanitary regulations, and as a consequence are in better health than a majority of those here. Sanders may be said to be at the head of the mess, we call him Dad, while Lewis is a sort of moderator and adviser, with Hendricks and myself as the rank and file are quite attached to one another, and don't believe that either one would steal from the other. I certainly wouldn't take anything short of pumpkin pie or something of that sort. Of course, a man would steal pie, at least we all say so, and Lewis even declares he would steal dough cakes and pancakes such as his wife used to make. We are all well dressed, thanks to the Sanitary Commission, and our own ingenuity in getting what was intended for us to have. False Alarm of Fire Routed at Midnight On the Cars, March 7, 1864 We were roused from our gentle slumbers during the night, counted off, and marched to the cars, loaded into them, which had evidently just had some cattle as occupants. Started southward to some portion of Georgia, as a guard told us. Passed through Petersburg, and other towns which I could not learn the names of. Cars run very slow, and being crowded we are very uncomfortable and hungry. Before leaving Richmond, hardtack was issued to us in good quantity for the Confederacy. Have not much chance to write. Bought some boiled sweet potatoes of the guard, which are boss. The country we pass through is a miserable one. Guards watch us close to see that none escape, and occasionally a yank is shot, but not in our car. Seems as if we did not run over thirty or forty miles per day. Stop for hours on side tracks, waiting for other trains to pass us. March 8. Were unloaded last night and given a chance to straighten our limbs. Stayed all night in the woods, side of the track, under a heavy guard. Don't know where we are, as guards are very reticent. March 10. Still traveling and unloaded at nights to sleep by the track. Rebel citizens and women improve every opportunity to see live Yankees are fed passably well, Lewis feeling poorly, watch a chance to escape, but find none. March 13. Ran very slow through the night and are in the vicinity of Macon, Georgia. Will reach our prison tonight. Received a pone of cornbread apiece, weighing about two pounds, which is liberal on their part. Two more days such writing as this would kill me. The lice are fairly eating us up alive, having had no chance to rid ourselves of them since leaving Richmond. One of the guards struck Hendricks during the night. We were talking on the all-important subject, and the guard, hearing us chatting away to ourselves, struck over into the crowd where the noise came from, and hit George in the back part of the head. He didn't speak for a minute or two, and I was afraid it had killed him, which happily proved to the contrary. As soon as it came daylight, he showed the brute where he had struck him, and took the occasion to dress him down a little, whereupon the rebel threatened that if he said another word to him, he would blow his head off. A drizzling rain has set in. Camp Sumter, Andersonville, Georgia, March 14. Arrived at our destination at last, and a dismal hole it is, too. We got off the cars at two o'clock this morning in a cold rain, and were marched into our pen between a strong guard carrying lighted pitch-pine knots to prevent our crawling off in the dark. I could hardly walk, having been cramped up so long, and feel as if I was a hundred years old. Have stood up ever since we came from the cars, and shivering with the cold. The rain has wet us to the skin, and we are worn out and miserable. Nothing to eat today, and another dismal night just setting in. March 15. At about midnight I could stand up no longer and lay down in the mud and water. Could hardly get up. 
Shall get food this morning, and after eating shall feel better. There is a good deal to write about here, but I must postpone it until some future time, for I can hardly hold a pencil now. Later. Have drawn some rations, which consisted of nearly a quart of cornmeal, half a pound of beef, and some salt. This is splendid. I have just partaken of a delicious repast, and feel like a different person. Dr. Lewis is discouraged and thinks he cannot live long in such a place as this. March 16. The prison is not yet entirely completed. One side is yet open, and through the opening two pieces of artillery are pointed. About 1,800 Yankees are here now. Colonel Pearsons commands the prison, and rides in and talks with the men. Is quite sociable, and says we are all to be exchanged in a few weeks. He was informed that such talk would not go down any longer. We have been fooled enough, and paid no attention to what they told us. Our mess is gradually settling down, have picked out our ground and rolled some big logs together, and are trying to make ourselves comfortable. I am in the best of spirits, and will live with them for some time to come if they will only give me one quarter enough to eat, and they are doing it now, and am in my glory. Weather cleared up, and very cold nights. We put on all our clothes nights, and take them off daytimes. The men do most of their sleeping through the day, and shiver through the long nights. March 17 get almost enough to eat such as it is but don't get it regularly sometimes in the morning and sometimes in the afternoon six hundred more prisoners came last night and from belle isle virginia our old home andersonville is situated on two hillsides with a little stream of swampy water running through the center and on both sides of the stream is a piece of swamp with two or three acres in it we have plenty of wood now, but it will not last long. They will undoubtedly furnish us with wood from the outside when it is burned up on the inside. A very unhealthy climate. A good many are being poisoned by poisonous roots, and there is a thick green scum on the water. All who drink freely are made sick, and their faces swell up so they cannot see. March 18 there are about fifteen acres of ground enclosed in the stockade, and we have the freedom of the whole ground. Plenty of room, but they are filling it up. Six hundred new men coming each day from Richmond. Guards are perched upon top of the stockade, are very strict, and today one man was shot for approaching too near the wall. A little warm today. Found W. B. Rowe from Jackson, Michigan. He is well and talks encouraging. We have no shelter of any kind whatever. Eighteen or twenty die per day. Cold and damp nights, the dews wet things through completely, and by morning all nearly chilled. Wood getting scarce. On the outside it is a regular wilderness of pines. Railroad a mile off and can just see the cars as they go by, which is the only sign of civilization in sight. Rebels all the while at work making the prison stronger. Very poor meal, and not so much today as formerly. My young friend, Billy Havens, was sent to the hospital about the time we left Richmond. Shall be glad to hear of his recovery. Prevailing conversation is food and exchange. March 19. A good deal of fighting going on among us. A large number of sailors and marines are confined with us, and they are a quarrelsome set. I have a very sore hand caused by cutting a hole through the car trying to get out. I have to write with my left hand. It is going to be an awful place during the summer months here, and thousands will die, no doubt. March 21. Prison gradually filling up with forlorn-looking creatures. Wood is being burned up gradually. Have taken in my old acquaintance and a member of my own company, A, 9th Michigan Cavalry, William B. Rowe. Sergeant Rowe is a tall, straight, dark-complexioned man, about thirty-five years old. He was captured while carrying dispatches from Knoxville to General Burnside, has been a prisoner two or three months, and was in Pemberton building until sent here. He is a tough, able-bodied man. 
Every day I find new Michigan men, some of them old acquaintances. March 23. Stockade all up, and we are pinned in. Our mess is out of filthy lucre, otherwise busted. Sold my overcoat to a guard, and for luxuries we are eating that up. My blanket keeps us all warm. There are two more in our mess. Daytimes the large spread is stretched three or four feet high, on four sticks, and keeps off the sun, and at night taken down for a cover. March 24. Digging a tunnel to get out of this place. Prison getting filthy. Prisoners somewhat to blame for it. Good many dying, and they are those who take no care of themselves, drink poor water, etc. March 25. Lieutenant Pearsons is no longer in command of the prison, but instead a Captain Wirtz. Came inside today and looked us over. Is not a very prepossessing-looking chap. Is about thirty-five or forty years old, rather tall, and a little stoop-shouldered. Skin has a pale white-livered look, with thin lips. Has a sneering sort of cast of countenance. Makes a fellow feel as if he would like to go up and boot him. Should judge he was a Swede or some such countryman. Hendrix thinks he would make it warm for him in short order if he only had a chance. Wirtz wears considerable jewelry on his person. Long watch chain, something that looks like a diamond for a pin in his shirt, and wears patent leather boots or shoes. I asked him if he didn't think we would be exchanged soon. He said, oh yes, we would be exchanged soon. Somehow or other, this assurance don't elate us much. Perhaps it was his manner when saying it. Andersonville is getting to be a rather bad place as it grows warmer. Several sick with fevers and sores. March 26. Well, well, my birthday came six days ago, and how old do you think I am? Let me see. Appearances would seem to indicate that I am thirty or thereabouts, but as I was born on the twentieth day of March, 1843, I must now be just twenty-one years of age, this being the year 1864. Of age and six days over. I thought that when a man became of age, he generally became free and his own master as well. If this ain't a burlesque on that old time-honored custom, then carry me out, but not feet foremost. March 27. We have issued to us once each day about a pint of beans, or more properly peas, full of bugs, and three-quarters of a pint of meal and nearly every day a piece of bacon the size of your two fingers, probably about three or four ounces. This is very good rations, taken in comparison to what I have received before. The pine which we use in cooking is pitch pine, and a black smoke arises from it. Consequently, we are black as negroes. Prison gradually filling from day to day, and situation rather more unhealthy. Occasionally a squad comes in who have been lately captured, and they tell of our battles, sometimes victorious and sometimes otherwise. Sometimes we are hopeful and sometimes the reverse. Take all the exercise we can, drink no water, and try to get along. It is a sad sight to see the men die so fast. New prisoners die the quickest and are buried in the near vicinity, we are told, in trenches without coffins. Sometimes we have visitors of citizens and women who come to look at us. There is sympathy in some of their faces, and in some a lack of it. A dead line composed of slats of boards runs around on the inside of the wall, about twelve or fourteen feet from the wall, and we are not allowed to go near it on pain of being shot by the guard. March 28. We are squatted over today, and rations about to come in. It's a sickly, dirty place, seems as if the sun was not over a mile high, and has a particular grudge against us. Wirtz comes inside and has began to be very insolent, is constantly watching for tunnels. He is a brute. We call him the Flying Dutchman. Came across Sergeant Bullock of my regiment, whom I saw last on Belle Isle. From a fat, chubby young fellow, he is a perfect wreck lost his voice and can hardly speak aloud. 
nothing but skin and bone, and black and ragged. Never saw such a change in a human being. Cannot possibly live, I don't think. Still, he is plucky and hates to die. Goes all around inquiring for news, and the least thing encouraging cheers him up. Captain Mosby, of the Raiders, is in the same squad with me. He is quite an intelligent fellow, and often talks with us. We lend him our boiling cup, which he returns with thanks. Better to keep on the right side of him, if we can, without countenancing his murderous operations. March 29. Raiders getting more bold as the situation grows worse, often rob a man now of all he has in public, making no attempt at concealment. In sticking up for the weaker party, our mess gets into trouble nearly every day, and particularly Hendrix, who will fight any time. March 30. The gate opens every little while, letting some poor victims into this terrible place, which is already much worse than Belle Isle. Seems as if our government is at fault in not providing some way to get us out of here. The hot weather months must kill us all outright. Feel myself at times sick and feverish, with no strength seemingly. Dr. Lewis worries, worries all the day long, and it's all we can do to keep him from giving up entirely. Sergeant Rowe takes things as they come in dogged silence. Looks like a caged lion. Hendrix sputters round, scolding away, and so forth. April 1. This is an April fool, sure. Saw a fellow today from our regiment named Casey. Says I was reported dead at the regiment, which is cheerful. Perhaps it is just as well, though, for them to anticipate the event a few months. It is said that Wirtz shot someone this morning. Often hear the guards shoot and hear of men being killed. Am not ambitious to go near them. Have completely lost my desire to be on the outside working for extra rations. Prefer to stick it out where I am than to have anything to do with them. They are an ungodly crew, and should have the warmest corner in that place we sometimes hear mentioned. April 2. James Robbins, an Indiana soldier, is in our close proximity. Was wounded and taken prisoner not long since. Wound, which is in the thigh, is in a terrible condition, and gangrene setting in. Although he was carried to the gate today, was refused admission to the hospital or medical attendance. Rebels say they have no medicine for us. Robbins has been telling me about himself and family at home, and his case is only one of a great many good substantial men of families who must die in southern prisons as victims to mismanagement. The poorer the Confederacy and the meaner they are, the more need that our government should get us away from here and not put objectionable men at the head of exchange to prevent our being sent home or back to our commands. April 3. We have stopped wondering at suffering or being surprised at anything. Can't do the subject justice and so don't try. Walk around camp every morning, looking for acquaintances, the sick, and so forth. Can see a dozen, most any morning, laying around dead. A good many are terribly afflicted with diarrhea, and scurvy begins to take hold of some. Scurvy is a bad disease, and taken in connection with the former is sure death. Some have dropsy as well as scurvy, and the swollen limbs and body are sad to see. To think that these victims have people at home, mothers, wives, and sisters, who are thinking of them and would do much for them if they had the chance, little dreaming of their condition. April 4. Same old story, coming in and being carried out, all have a feeling of lassitude which prevents much exertion, have been digging in a tunnel for a day or two with a dozen others who are in the secret. It's hard work. A number of tunnels have been discovered. The water now is very warm and sickening. April 5. Dr. Lewis talks about nothing except his family. Is the bluest mortal here and worries himself sick, let alone causes sufficient for that purpose. Is poorly adapted for hardships. 
For reading we have the Pilgrim's Progress, donated to me by someone when on Belle Isle. Guess I can repeat nearly all the book by heart. Make new acquaintances every day. Scotty, a marine, just now is edifying our mess with his saltwater yarns, and they are tough ones. I tell him he may die here. Still, he declares they are true. April 6. John Smith is here, and numerous of his family. So many go by nicknames that seldom any go by their real names. It's Minnesota, Big Charlie, Little Jim, Marine Jack, Indiana Feller, Mopey, Skinny, Smarty, and so on. Hendrix is known by the latter name. Sanders is called Dad. Rowe is called the Michigan Sergeant. Lewis is called Plain Doc while I am called, for some unknown reason, bugler. I have heard it said that I looked just like a Dutch bugler, and perhaps that is the reason of my cognomen. Probably thirty die per day. The slightest news about exchanges is told from one to the other, and gains every time repeated, until finally it's grand good news and sure exchange immediately. The weak ones feed upon these reports and struggle along from day to day. One hour they are all hope and expectation, and the next hour as bad the other way. The worst-looking scalawags perched upon the stockade as guards, from boys just large enough to handle a gun, to old men who ought to have been dead years ago for the good of their country. Some prisoners nearly naked, the majority in rags, and daily becoming more destitute. My clothes are good and kept clean, health fair, although very poor in flesh. Man killed at the deadline. April 7. Captain Wirtz prowls around the stockade with a rebel escort of guards looking for tunnels. Is very suspicious of amateur wells which some have dug for water. It is useless to speak to him about our condition, as he will give us no satisfaction whatever. Says it is good enough for us blank Yankees. I am deputized by half a dozen or so to speak to him as to the probabilities of a change, and whether we may not reasonably expect to be exchanged without passing the summer here. In his position he must know something in relation to our future." at the first favorable moment shall approach his highness. Prison is all the time being made stronger, more guards coming, and artillery looking at us rather unpleasantly from many directions. Think it impossible for any to get away here, so far from our lines. The men, too, are not able to withstand the hardships attendant upon an escape. Still, fully one half of all are constantly on the alert for chances to get away. Foremost in all schemes for freedom is Hendrix, and we are engaging in a new tunnel enterprise. The Yankee is a curious animal, never quiet until dead. There are some here who pray and try to preach. Very many, too, who have heretofore been religiously inclined, throw off all restraint, and are about the worst. Tried and found wanting, it seems to me. Those who find the least fault make the best of things as they come, and grin and bear it, get along the best. Weather getting warmer, water warmer and nastier, food worse and less in quantities, and more prisoners coming nearly every day. April 8. We are digging with an old fire shovel at our tunnel. The shovel is a prize. We also use half of canteens, pieces of boards, etc. It's laborious work. A dozen are engaged in it. Like going into a grave to go into a tunnel. Soil light and liable to cave in. Take turns in digging. Waste dirt carried to the stream in small quantities and thrown in. Not much faith in the enterprise, but work with the rest as a sort of duty. Raiders acting fearful was boiling my cup of meal today, and one of the raiders ran against it, and over it went. Give him a whack side of the head that made him see stars, I should judge, and in return he made me see the whole heavens. Batese, a big Indian, rather helped me out of the scrape. All of our mess came to my rescue, came near being a big fight with dozens engaged. 
Patese is a large, full-blooded, six-foot Minnesota Indian, has quarters near us, and is a noble fellow. He and other Indians have been in our hundred for some weeks. They are quiet, attend to their own business, and won't stand much nonsense. Great deal of fighting. One Duffy, a New York rough, claims the lightweight championship of Andersonville. Regular battles quite often. Remarkable how men will stand up and be pummeled. Dr. Lewis daily getting worse off. Is troubled with scurvy and dropsy if he was at home, would be considered dangerously ill and in bed, but he walks around slowly, inquiring for news in a pitiful way. I have probably fifty acquaintances here that visit us each day to talk the situation over. Jimmy Devers, my Michigan friend, whom I found on Belle Isle, Sergeant Bullock of my regiment, Tom McGill, also of Michigan, Michael Hoare, a schoolmate of mine from earliest recollection, Dor Blakeman, also a resident of Jackson, Michigan, a little fellow named Swan, who lived in Ypsilanti, Michigan, Burkhardt from near Lansing, Hub Dakin from Dansville, Michigan, and many others meet often to compare notes, and we have many a hearty laugh in the midst of misery. I dicker and trade and often make an extra ration. We sometimes draw small cow-peas for rations, and being a printer by trade, I spread the peas out on a blanket and quickly pick them up one at a time, after the manner of picking up type. One drawback is the practice of unconsciously putting the peas into my mouth. In this way I often eat up the whole printing office. I have trials of skill with a fellow named Land, who is also a printer. There are no other typos here that I know of. April 9. See here, Mr. Confederacy, this is going a little too far. You have no business to kill us off at this rate. About thirty or forty die daily. They have rigged up an excuse for a hospital on the outside where the sick are taken. Admit none, though, who can walk or help themselves in any way. Some of our men are detailed to help as nurses, but in a majority of cases those who go out on parole of honor are cutthroats and robbers who abuse a sick prisoner. Still, there are exceptions to this rule. We hear stories of Captain Wirtz's cruelty in punishing the men, but I hardly credit all the stories. More prisoners today. Some captured near Petersburg. Don't know anything about exchange scurvy and dropsy taking hold of the men. Many are blind as soon as it becomes night, and it is called moon-blind. Caused, I suppose, by sleeping with the moon shining in the face. Talked with Michael Hoare, an old schoolfellow of mine. Mike was captured while we were in Pemberton building, and was one of Dahlgren's men. Was taken right in the suburbs of Richmond has told me all the news of their failures on account of Kilpatrick failing to make a junction at some point. Mike is a great, tall, slim fellow, and a good one, said he heard my name called out in Richmond as having a box of eatables from the north. He also saw a man named Shaw claim the box with a written order from me. Shaw was one of our mess on Belle Isle. He was sent to Richmond while sick from the island, knew of my expecting the box, and forged an order to get it. Well, that was rough. Still, I probably wouldn't have got it anyway. Better him than some rebel. Mike gave me a lot of black pepper which we put into our soup, which is a luxury. He has no end of talk at his tongue's end, and it is good to hear recounts how once, when I was about eight or ten years old, and he some older, I threw a baseball club and hit him on the shins, then ran and he couldn't catch me. It was when we were both going to school to A. A. Henderson in Jackson, Michigan. Think I remember the incident, and am strongly under the impression that he caught me. It is thus that old friends meet after many years." John McGuire is also here, another Jackson man. He has a family at home and is worried. Says he used to frequently see my brother George at Hilton Head before being captured. April 10. Getting warmer and warmer. 
can see the tree swaying back and forth on the outside, but inside not a breath of fresh air. Our wood is all gone, and we are now digging up stumps and roots for fuel to cook with. Some of the first prisoners here have passable huts made of logs, sticks, pieces of blankets, and so forth. Room about all taken up in here now. Rations not so large. Talk that they intend to make the meal into bread before sending it inside, which will be an improvement. Rations have settled to less than a pint of meal per day, with occasionally a few peas or an apology for a piece of bacon for each man. Should judge that they have hounds on the outside to catch runaways from the noise. Wirtz don't come in as much as formerly. The men make it uncomfortable for him. As Jimmy Deaver says, he is a terror. I have omitted to mention Jimmy's name of late, although he is with us all the time, not in our mess, but close by. He has an old pack of cards with which we play to pass away the time. Many of the men have testaments and housewives which they have brought with them from home, and it is pitiful to see them look at these things while thinking of their loved ones at home. April 11. Dr. Lewis is very bad off with the scurvy and diarrhea. We don't think he can stand it much longer, but make out to him that he will stick it through. Our government must hear of our condition here and get us away before long. If they don't, it's a poor government to tie to. Hendricks and myself are poor, as also are all the mess, still in good health compared with the generality of the prisoners. Jimmy Deavers has evidently sort of dried up, and it don't seem to make any difference whether he gets anything to eat or not. He has now been a prisoner of war nearly a year, and is in good health and very hopeful of getting away in time. Sticks up for our government and says there is some good reason for our continued imprisonment. I can see none. As many as twelve thousand men here now, and crowded for room. Death rate is in the neighborhood of eighty per day. Hendrix prowls around all over the prison, bringing us what good news he can, which is not much. A very heavy dew nights, which is almost a rain. Rebels very domineering. Many are tunneling to get out. Our tunnel has been abandoned as the location was not practicable. Yank shot today near our quarters, approached too near the deadline. Many of the men have dug down through the sand and reached water, but it is poor, no better than out of the creek. April 12. Another beautiful but warm day with no news. Insects of all descriptions making their appearance, such as lizards, a worm four or five inches long, fleas, maggots, and so forth. There is so much filth about the camp that it is terrible trying to live here. New prisoners are made sick the first hours of their arrival by the stench which pervades the prison. Old prisoners do not mind it so much, having become used to it. No visitors come near us any more. Everybody sick, almost, with scurvy, an awful disease. New cases every day. I am afraid some contagious disease will get among us, and if so, every man will die. My blanket, a perfect godsend, is large and furnishes shelter from the burning sun. Hendrix has a very sore arm which troubles him much. Even he begins to look and feel bad. James Gordon, or Gordinian, I don't know which, was killed today by the guard. In crossing the creek on a small board crossway, men are often shot. It runs very near the deadline, and guards take the occasion to shoot parties who put their hands on the deadline in going across. Some also reach up under the deadline to get purer water and are shot. Men seemingly reckless of their lives. New prisoners coming in and are shocked at the sights. April 13. Jack Shannon from Ann Arbor died this morning. The raiders are the stronger party now, and do as they please, and we are in nearly as much danger now from our own men as from the rebels. Captain Mosby, of my own hundred, figures conspicuously among the robberies, and is a terrible villain. During the night someone stole my jacket. 
have traded off all superfluous clothes and with the loss of jacket have only pants shirt shoes no stockings and hat yet i am well dressed in comparison with some others many have nothing but an old pair of pants which reach perhaps to the knees and perhaps not hendrix has two shirts and should be mobbed i do quite a business trading rations making soup for the sick ones taking in payment their raw food which they cannot eat get many a little snack by so doing april fourteen at least twenty fights among our own men this forenoon it beats all what a snarling crowd we are getting to be the men are perfectly reckless and had just as soon have their necks broken by fighting as anything else new onions in camp very small and sell for two dollars a bunch of four or five van tassel a pennsylvanian is about to die many give me parting injunctions relative to their families in case i should live through have half a dozen photographs of dead men's wives with addresses on the back of them seems to be pretty generally conceded that if any get through i will not a man here now is in good health an utter impossibility to remain well signs of scurvy about my person still adhere to our sanitary rules lewis anxious to get to the hospital will die anyway shortly whether there or here jimmy devers the old prisoner coming down those who have stood it bravely begin to weaken april fifteen the hospital is a tough place to be in, from all accounts. The detailed Yankees, as soon as they get a little authority, are certain to use it for all it is worth. In some cases, before a man is fairly dead, he is stripped of everything, coat, pants, shirt, finger rings, if he has any, and everything of value taken away. These the nurses trade to the guards. Does not seem possible, but such is the case, sad to relate not very pleasant for a man just breathing his last and perhaps thinking of loved ones at home who are all so unconscious of the condition of their soldier father or brother to be suddenly jerked about and fought over with the cursing and blaspheming he is apt to hear the sick now or a portion of them are huddled up in one corner of the prison to get as bad as they can before being admitted to the outside hospital every day i visit it and come away sick at heart that human beings should be thus treated april twenty six ten days since i wrote in my diary and in those ten days was too much occupied in trying to dig a tunnel to escape out of to write any on the twenty first the tunnel was opened and two fellows belonging to a massachusetts regiment escaped to the outside hendrix and myself next went out the night was very dark, came up out of the ground away on the outside of the guard. We crawled along to gain the woods and got by some pickets, and when forty or fifty rods from the stockade a shot was fired at someone coming out of the hole. We immediately jumped up and ran for dear life, seemingly making more noise than a troop of cavalry. It was almost daylight, and away we went found i could not run far and we slowed up knowing we would be caught but hoping to get to some house and get something to eat first found i was all broke up for any exertion in an hour we had traveled perhaps three miles were all covered with mud and scratched up i had fell too in getting over some logs and it seemed to me broken all the ribs in my body just as it was coming light in the east we heard dogs after us we expected it and so armed ourselves with clubs and sat down on a log in a few moments the hounds came up with us and began smelling of us pretty soon five mounted rebels arrived on the scene of action they laughed to think we expected to get away started us back towards our charnel pen dogs did not offer to bite us but guards told us that if we had offered resistance or started to run they would have torn us arrived at the prison and after waiting an hour captain words interviewed us after cussing us a few minutes we were put in the chain gang where we remained two days this was not very fine but contrary to expectation not so bad after all 
we had more to eat than when inside and we had shade to lay in and although my ankles were made very sore do not regret my escapade am not permanently hurt any we had quite an allowance of bacon while out and some spring water to drink also from the surgeon i got some elderberries to steep into a tea to drink for scurvy which is beginning to take hold of me lewis is sick and can hardly walk around his days are few have taken another into our mess named swan from ypsilanti michigan is a fresh-looking boy for this place and looks like a girl april twenty seven well i was out from under rebel guard for an hour or so anyway hurt my side though and caught a little cold am sore somewhat have given up the idea of escaping think if hendrix had been alone he would have gotten away is tougher than i am a man caught stealing from one of his comrades and stabbed with a knife and killed to show how little such things are noticed here i will give the particulars as near as i could get them there were five or six men stopping together in a sort of shanty two of them were speculators and had some money cornbread and so on and would not divide with their comrades who belonged to their own company and regiment some time in the night one of them got up and was stealing bread from a haversack belonging to his more prosperous neighbor and during the operation woke up the owner who seized a knife and stabbed the poor fellow dead the one who did the murder spoke out and said harry i believe bill is dead he was just stealing from me and i run my knife into him good enough for him says harry the two men then got up and straightened out bill and then both lay down and went to sleep an occupant of the hut told me these particulars and they are true this morning poor bill lay in the hut until eight or nine o'clock and was then carried outside the man who did the killing made no secret of it but told it to all who wanted to know the particulars who were only a few as the occurrence was not an unusual one april twenty eighth dr lewis is still getting worse with scurvy and dropsy combined limbs swollen to double their usual size just like puffballs raiders do about as they please and their crimes would fill more paper than i have at my disposal april thirty very small rations given to us now not more than one quarter what we want to eat and that of the poorest quality splendid weather but too warm occasional rains the flying dutchman words offers to give any two at a time twelve hours the start and if caught to take the punishment he has for runaways the offer is made to intimidate those thinking to escape half the men would take the consequences with two hours start may one warm samuel hutton of the ninth michigan cavalry died last night also peter christiancy and joseph sargent of company d ninth michigan have died within a few weeks last evening seven hundred of the eighty fifth new york arrived here they were taken at plymouth north carolina with fourteen hundred others making twenty one hundred in all the balance are on the road to this place wrote a letter home to-day have not heard from the north for over six months dying off very fast may two a crazy man was shot dead by the guard an hour ago the guard dropped a piece of bread on the inside of the stockade and the fellow went inside the deadline to get it and was killed the bread wagon was raided upon as soon as it drove inside to-day and all the bread stolen for which offence no more will be issued to-day as I write, Wirtz is walking about the prison, revolver in hand, cursing and swearing. The men yell out, Hang him up! Kill the Dutch louse! Buck and gag him! Stone him to death! And so on. And he all the time trying to find out who it is insulting him so. I wish I find out who calls me such insulting words. I killed the damn Yankees as soon as I eat my supper and every few minutes a handful of dirt is thrown by someone, wreaks his vengeance by keeping back rations from the whole camp. May 3. A rebel battery came today on the cars and is being posted around the stockade. 
Ever since my introduction to Andersonville, they have been constantly at work, making their prison stronger, until now I believe it is impossible for a person to get away. Notwithstanding, there are men all the time at work in diverse ways. Rebel officers now say that we are not going to be exchanged during the war, and as they can hold us now and no fear of escape, they had just as soon tell us the truth as not and we must take things just as they see fit to give them to us. Tom McGill is well and hearty, and as black as any negro. Over 19,000 confined here now, and the death rate 90 or 100. May 4. Good weather. General Howell Cobb and staff came among us today and inspected the prison. Words accompanied them, pointing out and explaining matters. General Winder, who has charge of all the prisoners of war in the South, is here, but has not been inside. General Cobb is a very large and pompous-looking man. None of the men dare address His Highness. Three men out of every hundred allowed to go out after wood under a strong guard. May 5. Cold nights and warm days. Very unhealthy, such extremes. Smallpox cases carried out and much alarm felt lest it should spread. May 6. Six months a prisoner today, longer than any six years of my previous life. It is wonderful how well I stand the hardships here. At home I was not very robust, in fact had a tendency to poor health, but there are not many in prison that stand it as well as I do. There are about eighty-five or ninety dying now per day, as near as I can find out. Of course, there are stories to the effect that a hundred and fifty and two hundred die each day, but such is not the case. Have a code of reasoning that is pretty correct. Often wonder if I shall get home again and come to the conclusion that I shall. My hopeful disposition does more for me than anything else. Sanders trades and dickers around and makes extra eatables for our mess. There is not a hog in the mess. Nearly every day someone is killed for some trifling offense by the guards. Rather better food today than usual. May 7. A squad of Yankees taken outside today on parole of honor for the purpose of baking meal into bread. George Hendricks is one of the number, and he will have enough to eat after this, which I am glad of. I could have gotten outside if I so chose, but curious to write down, I don't want to go. George says he will try and send in something for us to eat, and I know he will, for a truer-hearted fellow never lived. May 8. Awful warm and more sickly. About 3,500 have died since I came here, which is a good many, come to think of it. Cooked rations of bread today. We get a quarter of a loaf of bread, weighing about six ounces, and four or five ounces of pork. These are small allowances, but being cooked it is better for us. Rebels are making promises of feeding us better, which we hope they will keep. There is nothing the matter with me now but lack of food. The scurvy symptoms, which appeared a few weeks ago, have all gone. May 9. Many rebels riding about camp on horseback. I listened to an animated conversation between an officer and two of our men. Mr. Rebel got talked all to pieces and hushed up entirely. He took it good-naturedly, however, and for a wonder did not swear and curse us. It is a great treat to see a decent rebel. Am lonesome since Hendricks went outside. Men are continually going up to the deadline and getting shot. They do not get much sympathy, as they should know better. May 10. Captain Wirtz very domineering and abusive, is afraid to come into camp any more. There are a thousand men in here who would willingly die if they could kill him first. Certainly the worst man I ever saw. New prisoners coming in every day with good clothes, blankets, and so on, and occasionally with considerable money. These are victims for the raiders who pitch into them for plunder. Very serious fights occur. Occasionally a party of newcomers sticks together and whip the raiders, who afterward rally their forces and the affair ends with the robbers victorious. 
Stones, clubs, knives, slingshots, and so on are used on these occasions, and sometimes the camp gets so stirred up that the rebels, thinking a break is intended, fire into the crowds gathered, and many are killed before quiet is again restored. Then Wirtz writes out an order and sends inside, telling us he is prepared for any break, etc., etc. No less than five have died within a radius of thirty feet in the last twenty-four hours. Hendrix has a sore arm, and in turning over last night I heard it. He pitched into me while I was in a sound sleep to pay me for it. Woke up in short order, and we had it, rough and tumble. Tore down the tent poles, rolled around, scaring Lewis and all the rest. I am the stoutest, and soon get on top and hold him down, and keep him there until he quiets down, which is always in about five minutes. We have squabbles of this sort often, which don't do any particular harm. Always laugh, shake, and make up afterwards. The Astor House mess, or the heads, rather, have gently requested that we do our fighting by daylight and Sanders very forcibly remarked that should another scene occur as happened last night, he will take a hand in the business and lick us both. Battese laughed, for about the first time this summer. He has taken quite a shine to both Hendrix and myself. In the forepart of today's entry, I should have stated that Hendrix has been sent inside, they not being quite ready for him at the cookhouse. He is a baker by trade. May 11 rainy weather and cold nights, men shiver and cry all night, groan and holler. I lay awake sometimes for hours, listening to the guards yell out, Post number one, ten o'clock and all's well. And then post number two takes up the refrain, and it goes all around the camp, every one with a different sounding voice, squeaky, coarse, and all sorts. Some of them draw out, Here's your mule! and such like changes instead of all's well. Rumors of hard fighting about Richmond, and the rebels getting whipped, which of course they deny. May 12. Received a few lines from George Hendricks, who again went out to work on the outside last night. Wirtz with a squad of guards is about the camp looking for tunnels. Patrols also looking among the prisoners for deserters. A lame man, for telling of a tunnel, was pounded almost to death last night, and this morning they are chasing him to administer more punishment when he ran inside the deadline claiming protection of the guard. The guard didn't protect worth a cent, but shot him through the head. A general hurrahing took place, as the rebel had only saved our men the trouble of killing him. More rumors of hard fighting about Richmond. Grant getting the best of it, I reckon. Richmond surrounded and rebels evacuating the place. These are the rumors. Guards deny it. May 13. Rainy morning. We are guarded by an Alabama regiment who are about to leave for the front. Georgia militia to take their places. Making preparations for a grand picnic outside given by the citizens of the vicinity to the troops about to leave. I must here tell a funny affair that has happened to me, which, although funny, is very annoying. Two or three days before I was captured, I bought a pair of cavalry boots of a teamster named Carpenter. The boots were too small for him, and just fitted me. Promised to pay him on payday, we not having been paid off in some time. We were both taken prisoners, and have been in the same hundred ever since has dunned me now about eighteen hundred and fifty times, and has always been mad at not getting his pay. Sold the boots shortly after being captured and gave him half the receipts, and since that have paid him in rations and money as I could get it, until about sixty cents remain unpaid, and that sum is a sticker. He is my evil genius, and fairly haunts the life out of me. Whatever I may get trusted for in after life, it shall never be for a pair of boots. Carpenter is now sick with scurvy, and I am beginning to get the same disease hold of me again. Battese cut my hair, which was about a foot long. Gay old cut. Many have long hair, which, being never combed, is matted together and full of vermin. 
with sunken eyes blackened countenances from pitch-pine smoke rags and disease the men look sickening the air reeks with nastiness and it is wonder that we live at all when will relief come to us may fourteen a band of music came from macon yesterday to attend the picnic a large crowd of women were present to grace the occasion the grounds on which the festivities were held lay a mile off and in sight of all in the evening a bowery dance was one of the pleasures enjoyed the girl i left behind me was about all they could play and that very poorly may fifteenth sabbath day and hot would give anything for some shade to lay in even this luxury is denied us and we are obliged to crawl around more dead than alive rumors that sherman is marching towards atlanta and that place threatened kilpatrick said to be moving toward us for the purpose of effecting our release hope he will be more successful than in his attack on richmond rebels have dug a deep ditch all around on the outside of the wall to prevent tunneling and a guard walks in the bottom of the ditch bangert of my regiment died to-day may sixteen two men got away during the night and were brought back before noon was going to say before dinner the men are torn by the dogs and one of them full of buckshot a funny way of escape has just been discovered by wirtz a man pretends to be dead and is carried out on a stretcher and left with a row of dead as soon as it gets dark mr dead man jumps up and runs wirtz suspecting the trick took to watching and discovered a dead man running away an examination now takes place by the surgeon before being permitted out from under guard i hear a number of men have gotten away by this method and it seems very probable as dead men are so plenty that not much attention is paid to them may seventeen had a funny dream last night thought the rebels were so hard up for mules that they hitched up a couple of gray back lice to draw in the bread wirtz is watching out for yankee tricks Someone told him the other day that the Yankees were making a large balloon inside and some day would all rise up in the air and escape. He flew around as if mad, but could find no signs of a balloon. Says there is no telling what the damn Yankees will do. Some prisoners came today who were captured at Dalton and report the place in our possession and the rebels driven six miles this side. Kilpatrick and Stoneman are both with Sherman, and there are expectations of starting out on some mission soon, supposed to be for this place. Nineteen thousand confined here, now, and dying at the rate of ninety per day. Philo Lewis of the 5th Michigan Cav can live but a day or two, talks continually of his wife and family at Ypsilanti, Michigan has pictures of the whole family which he has given me to take home to them also a long letter addressed to his wife and children mr lewis used to be a teacher of singing in ypsilanti he is a fine-looking man naturally and a smart man but he must go the way of thousands of others and perhaps myself one of his pupils is here confined philo lewis must not be confounded with f l lewis the member of our mess the latter, however, cannot live but a short time unless relief comes. Fine weather, but very warm. The sandy soil fairly alive with vermin. If this place is so bad at this time of the year, what must it be in July, August, and September? Every man will die, in my estimation, but perhaps we may be relieved before then. We'll try and think so, anyway. New prisoners die off the fastest. May 18. We have some good singers in camp, and, strange as it may seem, a good deal of singing is indulged in. There are some men that are happy as long as they can breathe, and such men smooth over many rough edges here. God bless a man who can sing in this place. A priest comes inside praying and chanting. A good man to come to such a place. Performs his duty the same to smallpox patients as to any other shall try and find out his name. Some of the wells dug by the Yanks furnish passable water, an improvement anyway on swamp water. Well water in great demand and sells readily for such trinkets as the men have to dispose of. 
Rebels building forts on the outside. Rebel officers inside trying to induce shoemakers, foundrymen, carpenters, and woodchoppers to go out and work for the Confederacy. A very few accepted the offer. Well, life is sweet and can hardly blame men for accepting the offer. Still, I don't want to go, neither do ninety-nine out of every hundred. The soldiers here are loyal to the cause. May 19. Nearly twenty thousand men confined here now, new ones coming every day, rations very small and very poor. The meal that the bread is made out of is ground seemingly, cob and all, and it scourges the men fearfully. Things getting continually worse, hundreds of cases of dropsy, men puff out of human shape and are perfectly horrible to look at. Philo Lewis died today could not have weighed at the time of his death more than ninety pounds, and was originally a large man, weighing not less than one hundred and seventy. Jack Walker, of the Ninth Michigan Cavalry, has received the appointment to assist in carrying out the dead, for which service he receives an extra ration of cornbread. May 20. Hendricks sent me in today, from the outside, a dozen small onions and some green tea. No person, on suddenly being lifted from the lowest depths of misery to peace and plenty, and all that money could buy, could feel more joyous or grateful than myself for these things. As the articles were handed in through the gate, a crowd saw the transaction, and it was soon known that I had a friend on the outside who sent me in extras. I learned that a conspiracy is being gotten up on the outside, in which Hendricks is at the head, and they will try and overpower the guard and release the prisoners. If Captain Wirtz only knew it, he has a very dangerous man in George Hendricks. Cram full of adventure, he will be heard from wherever he is. May 21. Still good weather and hot, with damp nights. Dr. Lewis lingers along in a miserable state of existence, and scurvy and dropsy doing their worst. His old messmates in the Ninth Michigan Regimental Headquarters little think of their favorite storytelling good fellow's condition now. We take as good care of him as possible under the circumstances. Two men shot today by the barbarians, and one of them has lain all the afternoon where he fell. May 22. No news of importance, same old story. Am now a gallant washerman. Batese, the Minnesota Indian, learnt me in the way of his occupation, made me a washboard by cutting creases in a piece of board, and I am fully installed. We have a sign out made by myself on a piece of shingle, Washing. We get small pieces of bread for our labors. Some of the sick cannot eat their bread, and not being able to keep clean, give us a job. Make probably a pound of bread two or three days in the week. Batese says, I work, do me good, you do same. Have many applications for admission to the firm, and may enlarge the business. May 23. Rains very hard. Seems as if the windows of heaven had opened up, in fact the windows out altogether. It's a grand good thing for the camp, as it washes away the filth and purifies the air. May 24. Sherman coming this way, so said, towards Atlanta, it is thought the cavalry will make a break for us, but even if they do, they cannot get us north. We are equal to no exertion. Men busy today killing swallows that fly low, partly for amusement, but more particularly for food they furnish, are eaten raw before hardly dead. No thank you, I will take no swallow. May 25. One thousand new prisoners came today from near Petersburg, Virginia. They gave us encouraging news as to the termination of the spring campaign. General Burnside said in a speech to his men that Petersburg would be taken in less than a month, or Mrs. Burnside would be a widow. Everyone hopeful. Getting warmer after the rain. Our squad has a very good well and about one quarter water enough of something a trifle better than swamp water. Man killed by the raiders near where we slept. Head all pounded to pieces with a club. Murders an everyday occurrence. May 26. 
For the last three days I have had nearly enough to eat, such as it is. My washing business gives me extra food. Have taken in a partner, and the firm now is Battese, Ransom & Company. Think of taking in more partners, making Battese president, appointing vice presidents, secretaries, etc. We charge a ration of bread for admittance. Sand makes a very good soap. If we could get hold of a razor and open a barber shop in connection, our fortunes would be made. We are prolonging Lewis's life by trading for luxuries to give him. Occasionally a little real meat soup with a piece of onion in it, etc. Am saving up capital to buy a pair of shears I know of. Molasses given us today from two to four spoonfuls apiece, which is indeed a treat. Anything sweet or sour or in the vegetable line is the making of us. We have taken to mixing a little meal with water, putting in a little molasses, and setting it in the sun to sour. Great trouble in the lack of vessels in which to keep it, and then, too, after getting a dish partly well soured, some poor prisoner will deliberately walk up, and before we can see him, drink it all up. Men are fairly crazy for such things. May 27. We twist up pieces of tin, stovepipe, etc., for dishes. A favorite and common dish is half of a canteen. Our spoons are made of wood. Hardly one man in ten has a dish of any kind to put his rations of soup or molasses in, and often old shoes, dirty caps, and the like are brought into requisition. Notwithstanding my prosperity in business, the scurvy is taking right hold of me. All my old acquaintances visit us daily, and we condole with one another. Fresh beef given us today, but in very small quantities, with no wood or salt to put it into proper shape. No one can very well object to raw beef, however. Great trouble is in getting it to us before being tainted. I persistently let alone meet with even a suspicion of rottenness. Makes no difference with nearly all here. We occasionally hear of the conspiracy of outside paroled Yankees. Time will tell if it amounts to anything. May 28. No more news. It really seems as if we're all to die here. My mouth getting sore from scurvy and teeth loose. New prisoners coming in every day and death rate increasing. I don't seem to get hardened to the situation and am shuddering all the time at the sights. Rainy weather. May 29. Sabbath day, but not a pleasant one. Nearly a thousand just came in. Would seem to me that the rebels are victorious in their battles. New men are perfectly thunderstruck at the hole they have got into. A great many give right up and die in a few weeks, and some in a week. My limbs are badly swollen with scurvy and dropsy combined. Mouth also very sore. Battese digs for roots which he steeps up and I drink. Could give up and die in a short time, but won't. Have got living reduced to a science. May 30. Another thousand came today and from the Eastern Army. Prison crowded. Men who came are from Siegel's Corps in the Shenandoah Valley. The poor deluded mortals never heard of Andersonville before. Well, they hear of it now. Charlie Hudson, from some sort of Ohio, took his canteen an hour ago and went to the swamp for water. He has not returned for the very good reason that he was shot while reaching up under the deadline to get the freshest water. Someone has pulled the body out of the water onto dry land, where it will stay until tomorrow, when it will be piled with perhaps forty others on the dead wagon, carted off and buried like a dog. And this is the last of poor Charlie, who has enlivened us many an evening with his songs and stories. The Astor House mess is very sad tonight. May 31. A rebel came inside today and inquired for me in the Tenth Squad first mess. I responded, wondering and fearful as to what they should want with me. Was happily surprised on going to the gate to see Hendricks with something in his hand for me seemed thunderstruck at my appearance, and said I was looking bad. He was looking better than when he went out, had brought me luxuries in the shape of gingerbread, onions, and tea, and am happy. George is a brick. 
says it is against orders to send anything inside, but he talked them over. Was afraid the raiders would waylay me before reaching the mess, but they did not. June 1. Reported that the 51st Virginia Regiment is here for the purpose of conducting us north for exchange. Believe nothing of the kind. Prisoners come daily. E. P. Sanders, Rowe, and myself carried our old friend Dr. Lewis to the hospital. He was immediately admitted, and we came away feeling very sad, knowing he would live but a short time. The sick are not admitted until they are near death, and then there is no hope for them. Rainy Day June 2. Another dark, stormy day. Raiders playing the very devil. Muddy and sticky. June 3. New prisoners say that an armistice has been agreed upon for the purpose of effecting an exchange and negotiating for peace. It may be so, and the authorities had good reasons for allowing us to stay here, but how can they pay for all the suffering? And now some Negro prisoners brought inside. They belong to the 54th Massachusetts, came with white prisoners, many of the Negroes wounded, as indeed there are wounded among all who come here now. No news from Hendrix or Lewis. Quite a number going out after wood to cook with. Hot and wet. June 4. Have not been dry for many days. Raining continually. Some men took occasion while out after wood to overpower the guard and take to the pines. Not yet been brought back. Very small rations of poor molasses, cornbread, and bug soup. June 5. Exchange rumors to the effect that transports are en route for Savannah for the purpose of taking us home. Stick right to my washing, however. A number of men taken out to be kept as hostages, so said. Raiders rule the prison, and myself cross and feel like licking somebody, but Hendrix is gone and don't want to try to lick anybody else, fearing I might get licked myself. Some fun fighting him as it didn't make any difference, which licked. June 6. Eight months a prisoner today. A lifetime has been crowded into these eight months. No rations at all. Am now a hair cutter. Have hired the shears. Enough to eat, but not the right kind. Scurvy putting in its work and symptoms of dropsy. Saw Hendrix at the bakehouse upstairs window looking over the camp probably looking to see if he can locate his old comrades among the sea of human beings. Wirtz comes inside no more, in fact does very few rebels. The place is too bad for them. June 7. Heard today that Hendrix had been arrested and in irons for inciting a conspiracy. Not much alarmed for him, he will come out all right. Still rainy. Have hard work keeping my diary dry. Nearly all the old prisoners who were captured with me are dead. Don't know of over fifty or sixty alive out of eight hundred. June 8. More new prisoners. There are now over twenty-three thousand confined here, and the death rate one hundred to a hundred and thirty per day, and I believe more than that. Rations worse. June 9. It is said that a grand break will occur soon, and nearly the whole prison engaged in the plot. Spies inform the rebels of our intentions. Rains yet. June 10. The whole camp in a blaze of excitement. Plans for the outbreak known to Captain Wirtz. Some traitor unfolded the plans to him. Thirty or forty pieces of artillery pointed at us from the outside, and stockade covered with guards who shoot right and left. Thirty or forty outsiders sent inside, and they tell us how the affair was found out. A number of the ringleaders are undergoing punishment. Hendrix has made his escape and not been heard of since yesterday. It is said he went away in full Confederate dress, armed and furnished with a guide to conduct him. Dr. Lewis died today. Jack Walker told us about his death. Captain Wirtz has posted up on the inside a notice for us to read. The following is the notice. Notice. 
not wishing to shed the blood of hundreds not connected with those who concocted a plan to force the stockade and make in this way their escape i hereby warn the leaders and those who formed themselves into a band to carry out this that i am in possession of all the facts and have made my arrangements accordingly so to frustrate it no choice would be left me but to open with grape and canister on the stockade and what effect this would have in this densely crowded place need not be told signed h wirtz june tenth eighteen sixty four june eleven and so has ended a really colossal attempt at escape george hendrix was one of the originators of the plan he took advantage of the excitement consequent upon its discovery and made good his escape and i hope will succeed in getting to our lines it is the same old situation here only worse and getting worse all the time i am not very good at description and find myself at fault in writing down the horrible condition we are in june twelve rained every day so far this month a portion of the camp is a mud hole and the men are obliged to lay down in it fort pillow prisoners tell some hard stories against the confederacy at the treatment they received after their capture they came here nearly starved to death and a good many were wounded after their surrender they are mostly tennesseans and a right smart sorry set Batese has taken quite a fatherly interest in me, keeps right on at the head of the washing and hair-cutting business, paying no attention to anything outside of his work, says, We get out all right. June 13. It is now as hot and sultry as it was ever my lot to witness. The cloudy weather and recent rains make everything damp and sticky. We don't any of us sweat, though, particularly as we are pretty well dried up. Laying on the ground so much has made sores on nearly every one here, and in many cases gangrene sets in, and they are very bad off. Have many sores on my body, but am careful to keep away the poison. Today saw a man with a bullet hole in his head over an inch deep, and you could look down in it and see maggots squirming around at the bottom. Such things are terrible, but of common occurrence." Andersonville seems to be headquarters for all the little pests that ever originated, flies by the thousand millions. I have got into one bad scrape, and the one thing now is to get out of it, can do nothing but take as good care of myself as possible, which I do. Patese works all the time at something, has scrubbed his hands sore using sand for soap. June 14 my corps stalks around cheerful black and hungry we have long talks about our school days when little boys together mike is a mason by trade and was solicited to go out and work for the rebels told them he would work on nothing but vaults to bury them in is a loyal soldier and had rather die here than help them as indeed would a majority of the prisoners to tell the truth, we are so near death and see so much of it, that it is not dreaded as much as a person would suppose. We stay here day after day, week after week, and month after month, seemingly forgotten by all our friends at the North, and then our sufferings are such that death is a relief in the view of a great many, and not dreaded to any extent. By four o'clock each day the row of dead at the gate would scare the life out of me before coming here, while now it is nothing at all, but the same thing over and over. June 15. I am sick, just able to drag around. My teeth are loose, mouth sore, with gums grown down in some places lower than the teeth and bloody, legs swollen up with a dropsy and on the road to the trenches. Where there is so much to write about, I can hardly write anything. It's the same old story, and must necessarily be repetition. Raiders now do just as they please, kill, plunder, and steal in broad daylight, with no one to molest them. Have been trying to organize a police force, but cannot do it. Raiders are the stronger party, ground covered with maggots. Lice by the fourteen hundred thousand million infest Andersonville. A favorite game among the boys is to play at odd or even by putting their hand inside some part of their clothing, pull out what they can conveniently get hold of and say, odd or even, and then count up to see who beats. 
Think this is an original game here. Never saw it at the north. Some of the men claim to have pet lice, which they have trained. Am gradually growing worse. Nothing but the good care I have taken of myself has saved me thus far. I hope to last some time yet, and in the meantime relief may come. My diary about written through. It may end about the same time I do, which would be a fit ending. June 16. Old prisoners, some of them, will not credit the fact that there is plenty to eat at the North. They think because we are starved here that it is so all over. They are crazy, as you may say, on the subject of food, and no wonder. In our dreams we see and eat bountiful repasts and awake to the other extreme. Never could get a chance to talk with Captain Wirtz as he comes inside no more. Probably just as well. Is a thoroughly bad man without an atom of humanity about him. He will get killed, should we ever be released, as there are a great many here who would consider it a Christian duty to rid the earth of his presence. Disease is taking right hold of me now. Batese is an angel, takes better care of me than of himself. Although not in our mess or tent, he is nearly all the time with us. It is wonderful the powers of endurance he has. I have always been blessed with friends, and friends too of the right sort. Had quite a talk with Dor Blakeman, a Jackson, Michigan boy, was not much acquainted with him at home, but knew his people. Is a thoroughly good fellow, and a sensible one. It is a relief to see anyone who does not lose his head. June 17. Must nurse my writing material. A New York Herald and Camp, which says an exchange will commence the 7th of July. General Winder is on a visit to Andersonville, is quite an aged man and white-haired, very warm and almost suffocating, seems as if the sun was right after us and belonged to the Confederacy. Charles Humphrey of Massachusetts, who has been in our hundred for months, has gone crazy, wanders about entirely naked and not even a cap on his head. Many of the prisoners are crazy, and I only speak of those in our immediate proximity. Am in good spirits, notwithstanding my afflictions. Have never really thought yet that I was going to die in this place, or in the Confederacy. Saw a newcomer pounded to a jelly by the raiders. His cries for relief were awful, but none came. Must a few villains live at the expense of so many? God help us from these worse than rebels. June 18. Have now written two large books full. Have another at hand. New prisoners who come here have diaries which they will sell for a piece of bread. No news today. Dying off as usual, more in numbers each day as the summer advances. Rebels say that they don't begin to have hot weather down here until about August. Well, it is plain to me that all will die. Old prisoners have stood it as long as they can, and are dropping off fast, while the new ones go anyhow. Someone stole my cap during the night. A dead neighbor furnished me with another, however. Fast as the men die, they are stripped of their clothing, so that those alive can be covered. Pretty hard, but the best we can do. Rebels are anxious to get hold of Yankee buttons. Buttons with hands on, they inquire for. An insult to the American eagle, but they don't know any better. June 19. A young fellow named Conley tramps about the prison with ball and chain on. His crime was trying to get away. I say he tramps around. He tramps away from the gate with it, on, at nine in the morning, and as soon as out of sight of the rebels he takes it off, and only puts it on at nine o'clock the next morning to report at the gate duly ironed off. They think, of course, that he wears it all the time. Jimmy Deavers looks and is in a very bad way. Too bad if the poor fellow should die now after being a prisoner almost a year. Talks a great deal about his younger brother in Jackson named Willie. Says if he should die to be sure and tell Willie not to drink, which has been one of Jimmy's failings, and he sees now what a foolish habit it is. Michael Hoare stands it well. When a man is shot now it is called being paroled. June 20. 
all the mess slowly but none the less surely succumbing to the diseases incident here. We are not what you may call hungry. I have actually felt the pangs of hunger more when I was a boy going home from school to dinner. But we are sick and faint and all broken down, feverish and so forth. It is starvation and disease and exposure that is doing it. Our stomachs have been so abused by the stuff called bread and soups that they are diseased. The bread is coarse and musty. Believe that half in camp would die now if given rich food to eat. June 21. I am a fair writer and am besieged by men to write letters to the rebel officers praying for release, and I do it, knowing it will do no good, but to please the sufferers. Some of these letters are directed to Captain Wirtz, some to General Winder, Jeff Davis, and other officers. As dictated by them, some would bring tears from a stone. One goes on to say he has been a prisoner of war over a year, has a wife and three children destitute, how much he thinks of them, is dying with disease, etc., etc. All kinds of stories are narrated and handed to the first rebel who comes within reach. Of course, they are never heard from. It's pitiful to see the poor wretches who think their letters will get them out, watch the gate from day to day, and always disappointed. Someone has much to answer for. June 22. The washing business progresses and is prosperous. One great trouble is, it is run too loose and we often get no pay. Patese, while a good worker, is no business man, and will do anybody's washing on promises which don't amount to much. Am not able to do much myself, principally hanging out the clothes, that is, laying the shirt on one of the tent poles and then watching it till dry. All day yesterday I lay under the cover lid in the shade, hanging on to a string which was tied to the washing. If I saw a suspicious-looking chap hanging around with his eyes on the washed goods, then gave a quick jerk, and in she comes out of harm's way. Batese has paid for three or four shirts lost in this way, and one pair of pants. Pays in bread. A great many Irish here, and as a class they stand hardships well. Jimmy Deaver's losing heart and thinks he will die. Captain Wirtz has issued another order, but don't know what it is, to the effect that raiding and killing must be stopped, I believe. Being unable to get around as I used to, do not hear the particulars of what is going on, only in a general way. New men coming in, and bodies carried out. Is there no end but dying? June 23. My cover lid nobly does duty protecting us from the sun's hot rays by day and the heavy dews at night. Have no doubt but it has saved my life many times. Never have heard anything from Hendrix since his escape, either got away to our lines or shot. Rebels recruiting among us for men to put in their ranks. None will go. Yes, I believe one, Duffy, has gone with them. Much fighting. Men will fight as long as they can stand up. A father fights his own son not ten rods from us. Hardly any are strong enough to do much damage except the raiders, who get enough to eat and are in better condition than the rest. Four or five letters were delivered to their owners, were from their homes. Remarkable, as I believe this is the first mail since our first coming here. Something wrong. Just shake in my boots, shoes, I mean, plenty of room, when I think what July and August will do for us. Does not seem to me as if any can stand it. After all, it's hard killing a man. Can stand most anything. June 24. Almost July 1st, when Jimmy Devers will have been a prisoner of war one year. Unless relief comes very soon, he will die. I have read in my earlier years about prisoners in the Revolutionary War and other wars. It sounded noble and heroic to be a prisoner of war, and accounts of their adventures were quite romantic. But the romance has been knocked out of the prisoner of war business higher than a kite. It's a fraud, all of the Astor House mess now afflicted with scurvy and dropsy more or less, with the exception of Batese and myself worst of any. Am fighting the disease, however, all the time, and the growth is but slight. 
take exercise every morning and evening when it is almost impossible for me to walk walk all over before the sun comes up drink of batese's medicine made of roots keep clear of vermin talk and even laugh and if i do die it will not be through neglect carpenter the teamster who sold me the boots is about gone and thank the lord he has received his sixty cents from me in rations sorry for the poor fellow many who have all along stood it nobly now begin to go under william b rowe our tall messmate is quite bad off still he has an iron constitution and will last some time yet june twenty five another lead pencil wore down to less than an inch in length and must skirmish around for another one new men bring in writing material and pencils today saw a new york herald of date june eleventh nothing in it about exchange however that is all the news that particularly interests us although accounts of recent battles are favorable to the union side our guards are composed of the lowest element of the south poor white trash very ignorant much more so than the negro some of them act as if they never saw a gun before the rebel adjutant does quite a business selling vegetables to those of the prisoners who have money and has established a sutler stand not very far from our mess hub dinkin and old acquaintance is a sort of clerk and gets enough to eat thereby hot hot raiders kill some one now every day no restraint in the least men who were no doubt respectable at home are now the worst villains in the world one of them was sneaking about our quarters during the night and sanders knocked him about ten feet with a board some one of us must keep awake all the time and on the watch fearing to lose what little we have june twenty six the same old story only worse worse it seems all the time it was as bad as could be but is not they die now like sheep fully a hundred each day new prisoners come inside in squads of hundreds and in a few weeks are all dead the change is too great and sudden for them old prisoners stand at the best found a jackson michigan man who says i am reported dead there am not however and may appear to them yet jimmy devers is very bad with the scurvy and dropsy and will probably die if relief does not come sergeant rowe also is afflicted in fact all the mess except battese he does all the cooking now he has made me a cane to walk with brings water from the well and performs nearly all the manual labor for us he is a jewel but a rough one june twenty seven raiders going on worse than ever before a perfect pandemonium something must be done and that quickly there is danger enough from disease without being killed by raiders any moment fifty or a hundred of them are liable to pounce upon our mess knock right and left and take the very clothing off our backs no one is safe from them it is hoped that the more peaceable sort will rise in their might and put them down our misery is certainly complete without this trouble added to it we should die in peace anyway batese has called his indian friends all together and probably a hundred of us are banded together for self-protection the animal predominates all restraint is thrown off and the very old harry is to pay the farther advance the summer the death rate increases until they die off by scores i walk around to see friends of a few days ago and am told dead men stand it nobly and are apparently ordinarily well when all at once they go like a horse that will stand up until he drops dead some of the most horrible sights that can possibly be are common everyday occurrences see men laying all around in the last struggles june twenty eight it seems to me as if three times as many as ever before are now going off still i am told that about one hundred and thirty die per day the reason it seems worse is because no sick are being taken out now and they all die here instead of at the hospital can see the dead wagon loaded up with twenty or thirty bodies at a time two lengths 
just like four-foot wood is loaded on to a wagon at the north and away they go to the graveyard on a trot perhaps one or two will fall off and get run over no attention paid to that they are picked up on the road back after more was ever before this in the world anything so terrible happening many entirely naked june twenty nine captain wirtz sent inside a guard of fifteen or twenty to arrest and take out quite a number of prisoners they had the names and would go right to their quarters and take them some tell-tale traitor has been informing on them for attempting to escape or something wirtz punishes very hard now so much worse than a few months ago has numerous instruments of torture just outside the gate sores afflict us now and the lord only knows what next scurvy and scurvy sores dropsy not the least thing to eat that can be called fit for any one much less a sick man water that to drink is poison no shelter and surrounded by raiders liable to cut our throats any time surely this is a go have been reading over the diary and find nothing but grumbling and growlings had best enumerate some of the better things of this life i am able to walk around the prison although quite lame have black pepper to put in our soups am as clean perhaps as any here with good friends to talk cheerful to then too the raiders will let us alone until about the last for some of them will get killed when they attack the astor house mess am probably as well off as any here who are not raiders and i should be thankful and am thankful will live probably two or three months yet if twarn't for hope the heart would break and i am hopeful yet a pennsylvanian of german descent named van tassel and who has sorter identified himself with us for two or three months died a few moments ago the worst cases of the sick are again taken to the hospital that is a few of the worst cases many prefer to die among their friends inside henry clayton also died today was at one time in charge of our division and an old prisoner mike hoare still hangs on nobly as also do many other of my friends and acquaintances dor blakeman stands it unusually well have had no meat now for ten days nothing but one-third of a loaf of cornbread and half a pint of cowpeas for each man each day wood is entirely gone and occasionally squads allowed to go and get some under guard roe went out to-day was not able to carry much and that had to be divided between a hundred men one of the most annoying things is being squatted over every few days sick and all it's an all-day job and have to stand out until we are all tired out never getting any food on these days june thirty a new prisoner fainted away on his entrance to andersonville and is now crazy a raving maniac that is how our condition affected him my pants are the worst for wear from repeated washings my shirt sleeveless and feet stockingless have a red cap without any front piece shoes by some hocus-pocus are not mates one considerable larger than the other wonder what they would think if i should suddenly appear on the streets in jackson in this garb would be a circus sideshow and all but nights i have a grand old coverlid to keep off the wet raiders steal blankets and sell to the guards which leaves all nearly destitute of that very necessary article often tell how i got my cover lid to visitors have been peddling pea soup on the streets ten cents in money or a dollar confed for this rich soup who takes it and some wretch buys it anything in the way of food will sell or water if different from swamp water rebs making a pretense of fixing up sanitary privileges at the swamp which amount to nothing strong talk of forming a police force to put down raiders and to enforce order if successful it will prove of great benefit sanders rowe blakeman dakin and myself are among those who will take an active part although the part i take cannot be very active half a dozen letters sent inside to prisoners but no news in them that i can hear of more hot and sultry with occasional rains the crazy man says nothing but prayer will save us he has been sucking a bone now for about two weeks 
and pays more attention to that than to prayer. July 1. Matters must approach a crisis pretty soon with the raiders. It is said that even the rebels are scared and think they will have no prisoners should an exchange ever occur. John Bowen, a Corporal Christensy, Hemingway, Byron, Goodsell, and Pete Smith, all old acquaintances, have all died within a few days. Jimmy Deaver still lives with wonderful tenacity to life. Tomorrow he will have been a prisoner of war a year. Mike Hoare still keeps very well, but the most comical-looking genius in the whole prison. Could make a fortune out of him on exhibition at the North. He says I look worse, however. That may be, but not so comical. It's tragedy with the most of us. New guards are taking the place of the old ones, and it is said that Wirtz is going away. Hope so. Never have heard one word from Hendrix since his getting away. Sanders is trying to get outside as a butcher. He understands the business. Dad has been to Australia and has told us all about that country. Have also heard all about Ireland and Scotland. Should judge they were fine countries. Rowe has been telling me of the advantage of silk underclothing, and in addition to visiting all the foreign countries, we shall have silk underwear. Rowe once lived in Boston, and I shall likewise go there. July 2. Almost the glorious 4th of July. How shall we celebrate? Know of no way except to pound on the bake tin, which I shall do. Have taken to rubbing my limbs, which are gradually becoming more dropsical, badly swollen. One of my teeth came out a few days ago, and all are loose. Mouth very sore. Batese says, we get away yet. Works around and always busy. If any news, he merely listens and won't say a word. Even he is in poor health, but never mentions it. An acquaintance of his says he owns a good farm in Minnesota. Asked him if he was married. Says, oh yes. Any children? Oh yes. This is as far as we have got his history. Is very different from Indians in general. Some of them here are despisable cowards, worse than the Negro. Probably one hundred Negroes are here, not so tough as the whites, deadline being fixed up by the rebels, got down in some places, bought a piece of soap, first I have seen in many months, swamp now in frightful condition from the filth of camp. Vermin and raiders have the best of it. Captain Mosby still leads the villains. July 3. Three hundred and fifty new men from West Virginia were turned into this summer resort this morning. They brought good news as to successful termination of the war, and they also caused war after coming among us. As usual, the raiders proceeded to rob them of their valuables, and a fight occurred in which hundreds were engaged. The cutthroats came out ahead. Complaints were made to Captain Wirtz that this thing would be tolerated no longer, that these raiders must be put down, or the men would rise in their might and break away, if assistance was not given with which to preserve order. Wirtz flew around as if he had never thought of it before, issued an order to the effect that no more food would be given us until the leaders were arrested and taken outside for trial. The greatest possible excitement. Hundreds that have before been neutral and non-committal are now joining a police force. Captains are appointed to take charge of the squads, which have been furnished with clubs by Wirtz. As I write, this middle of the afternoon, the battle rages. The police go right to raider headquarters, knock right and left, and make their arrests. Sometimes the police are whipped and have to retreat, but they rally their forces and again make a charge in which they are successful. Can lay in our shade and see the trouble go on. Must be killing some by the shouting. The raiders fought for their very life and are only taken after being thoroughly whipped. The stockade is loaded with guards who are fearful of a break. I wish I could describe the scene today. A number killed. After each arrest a great cheering takes place. Night. Thirty or forty have been taken outside of the worst characters in camp, and still the good work goes on. No food today and don't want any. 
A big strapping fellow called Limber Jim heads the police. Grand old Michael Hoare is at the front and goes for a raider as quick as he would a rebel. Patrol the camp all the time and gradually quieting down. The orderly prisoners are feeling jolly. July 4. The men taken outside yesterday are under rebel guard and will be punished. The men are thoroughly aroused, and now that the matter has been taken in hand, it will be followed up to the letter. Other arrests are being made today, and occasionally a big fight. Little Terry, whom they could not find yesterday, was taken today, had been hiding in an old well or hole in the ground, fought like a little tiger, but had to go. Limber Jim is a brick, and should be made a major general if he ever reaches our lines. My corps is right up in rank and true blue. William B. Rowe also makes a good policeman, as does Dad Sanders. Battese says he no time to fight must wash. Jimmy Devers regrets that he cannot take a hand in, as he likes to fight, and especially with a club. The writer hereof does no fighting, being on the sick list. The excitement of looking on is most too much for me, can hardly arrest the big graybacks crawling around. Captain Mosby is one of the arrested ones. His right name is Collins, and he has been in our hundred all the time since leaving Richmond. Has got a good long neck to stretch. Another man whom I have seen a good deal of, one Curtis, is also arrested. I haven't mentioned poor little Bullock for months, seems to me. He was most dead when we first came to Andersonville, and is still alive and tottering around. Has lost his voice entirely, and is nothing but a skeleton. Hardly enough of him for disease to get a hold of. Would be one of the surprising things on record if he lives through it, and he seems no worse than months ago. It is said that a court will be formed of our own men to try the raiders. Anyway, so they are punished. All have killed men, and they themselves should be killed. When arrested, the police had hard work to prevent their being lynched. Police more thoroughly organizing all the time. An extra amount of food this p.m., and police get extra rations, and three out of our mess is doing pretty well, as they are all willing to divide. They tell us all the encounters they have, and much interesting talk. Mike has some queer experiences. Rebel flags at half-mast for some of their great men. Just heard that the trial of raiders will begin tomorrow. July 5. Court is in session outside and raiders being tried by our own men. Wirtz has done one good thing, but it's a question whether he is entitled to any credit, as he had to be threatened with a break before he would assist us. Rations again today. I am quite bad off with my diseases, but still there are so many thousands so much worse off that I do not complain much or try not to, however. July 6. Boiling hot, camp reeking with filth and no sanitary privileges, men dying off over a hundred and forty per day, stockade enlarged, taking in eight or ten more acres, giving us more room, and stumps to dig up for wood to cook with. My core is in good health, but not so Jimmy Deavers. Jimmy has now been a prisoner over a year, and poor boy will probably die soon. Have more mementos than I can carry from those who have died to be given to their friends at home. At least a dozen have given me letters, pictures, and so forth to take north. Hope I shan't have to turn them over to someone else. July 7. The court was gotten up by our own men and from our own men, judge, jury, counsel, and so forth, had a fair trial and were even defended, but to no purpose. It is reported that six have been sentenced to be hung, while a good many others are condemned to lighter punishment, such as setting in the stocks, strung up by the thumbs, thumb screws, head hanging, etc. The court has been severe, but just. Mike goes out tomorrow to take some part in the court proceedings. The prison seems a different place altogether. Still, dread disease is here and mowing down good and true men. 
would seem to me that three or four hundred died each day, though officially but one hundred and forty-odd is told. About twenty-seven thousand, I believe, are here now, in all. No new ones for a few days. Rebel visitors who look at us from a distance. It is said the stench keeps all away who have no business here and can keep away. Washing business good. Am negotiating for a pair of pants. Dislike fearfully to wear dead men's clothes and haven't to any great extent. July 8. Oh, how hot and oh, how miserable. The news that six have been sentenced to be hanged is true, and one of them is Mosby. The camp is thoroughly under control of the police now, and it is a heavenly boon. Of course, there is some stealing and robbery, but not as before. Swan of our mess is sick with scurvy. I am gradually swelling up and growing weaker. But a few more pages in my diary. Over a hundred and fifty dying per day now, and twenty-six thousand in camp. Guards shoot now very often. Boys, as guards, are the most cruel. It is said that if they kill a Yankee, they are given a thirty days furlough. Guess they need them as soldiers too much to allow of this. The swamp now is fearful, water perfectly reeking with prison awful and poison. Still men drink it and die. Rumors that the six will be hung inside. Bread today, and it is so coarse as to do more hurt than good to a majority of the prisoners. The place still gets worse. Tunneling is over with. No one engages in it now that I know of. The prison is a success as regards safety. No escape except by death, and very many take advantage of that way. A man who has preached to us, or tried to, is dead. Was a good man, I verily believe, and from Pennsylvania. It's almost impossible for me to get correct names to note down. The last named man was called the preacher, and I can find no other name for him. Our quartet of singers a few rods away is disbanded. One died, one nearly dead, one a policeman, and the other cannot sing alone. And so where we used to hear and enjoy good music evenings, there is nothing to attract us from the groans of the dying. Having formed a habit of going to sleep as soon as the air got cooled off and before fairly dark, I wake up at two or three o'clock and stay awake. I then take in all the horrors of the situation. Thousands are groaning, moaning, and crying, with no bustle of the daytime to drown it. Guards now every half hour call out the time and post, and there is often a shot to make one shiver, as if with the ague, must arrange my sleeping hours to miss getting owly in the morning, have taken to building air castles of late on being exchanged getting loony, I guess, same as all the rest. July 9. Batese brought me some onions, and if they ain't good, then no matter, also a sweet potato. One half the men here would get well if they only had something in the vegetable line to eat, or acids. Scurvy is about the most loathsome disease, and when dropsy takes hold with the scurvy, it is terrible. I have both diseases, but keep them in check, and it only grows worse slowly. My legs are swollen, but the cords are not contracted much, and I can still walk very well. Our mess all keep clean, in fact are obliged to or else turned adrift. We want none of the dirty sort in our mess. Sanders and Rowe enforce the rules, which is not much work as all hands are composed of men who prefer to keep clean. I still do a little washing, but more particularly hair-cutting, which is easier work. You should see one of my hair-cuts. Nobby! Old prisoners have hair a foot long or more, and my business is to cut it off, which I do without regards to anything except to get it off. I should judge that there are one thousand rebel soldiers guarding us, and perhaps a few more, with the usual number of officers. A guard told me today that the Yanks are getting licked, and they didn't want us exchanged. Just as soon we should die here as not. A Yank asked him if he knew what exchange meant. 
said he knew what shootin' meant, and as he began to swing around his old shootin' iron, we retreated in among the crowd. Heard that there were some new men belonging to my regiment in another part of the prison, have just returned from looking after them, and am all tired out. Instead of belonging to the Ninth Michigan Cavalry, they belong to the Ninth Michigan Infantry. Had a good visit and quite cheered with their accounts of the war news. Someone stole Batese's washboard and he is mad, is looking for it, may bust up the business. Think Hub Dakin will give me a board to make another one. Sanders owns the jackknife of this mess and he don't like to lend it either. Borrow it to carve on roots for pipes. Actually, take solid comfort building castles in the air, a thing I have never been addicted to before. Better than getting blue and worrying myself to death. After all, we may get out of this dod-rotted hole. Always an end of some sort to such things. July 10. Have bought of a new prisoner quite a large, thick, I mean, blank book, so as to continue my diary although it's a tedious and tiresome task, am determined to keep it up. Don't know of another man in prison who is doing likewise. Wish I had the gift of description that I might describe this place. Know that I am not good at such things, and have more particularly kept track of the mess, which was the Astor House mess on Belle Isle, and is still called so here thought that Belle Isle was a very bad place, and used about the worst language I knew how to use in describing it, and so find myself at fault in depicting matters here as they are. At Belle Isle we had good water and plenty of it, and I believe it depends more upon water than food as regards health. We also had good pure air from up the James River. Here we have the very worst kind of water. Nothing can be worse or nastier than the stream drizzling its way through this camp. And for air to breathe, it is what arises from this foul place. On all four sides of us are high walls and tall trees, and there is apparently no wind or breeze to blow away the stench, and we are obliged to breathe and live in it. Dead bodies lay around all day in the broiling sun, by the dozen, and even hundreds, and we must suffer and live in this atmosphere. It's too horrible for me to describe in fitting language. There was once a very profane man driving a team of horses attached to a wagon in which there were forty or fifty bushels of potatoes. It was a big load, and there was a long hill to go up. The very profane man got off the load of potatoes to lighten the weight and started the team up the hill. It was hard work, but they finally reached the top and stopped to rest. The profane man looked behind him and saw that the end board of the wagon had slipped out just as he had started, and there the potatoes were scattered all the way along up the hill. Did the man make the very air blue with profanity? No, he sat down on a log, feeling that he couldn't do the subject justice, and so he remarked, No, it's no use, I can't do it justice. While I have no reason or desire to swear, I certainly cannot do this prison justice. It's too stupendous an undertaking. Only those who are here will ever know what Andersonville is. An Account of the Hanging July 11. This morning lumber was brought into the prison by the rebels, and near the gate a gallows erected for the purpose of executing the six condemned Yankees. At about ten o'clock they were brought inside by Captain Wirtz and some guards, and delivered over to the police force. Captain Wirtz then said a few words about their having been tried by our own men, and for us to do as we choose with them that he washed his hands of the whole matter, or words to that effect. I could not catch the exact language, being some little distance away. I have learned by inquiry their names, which are as follows. John Sarsfield, 144th New York, William Collins, alias Mosby, Company D, 88th Pennsylvania, Charles Curtis, Battery A, 5th Rhode Island Artillery, Pat Delaney, Company E, 83rd Pennsylvania, 
A. Moon, U.S. Navy, and W. R. Rickson of the U.S. Navy. After Wirtz made his speech, he withdrew his guards, leaving the condemned at the mercy of twenty-eight thousand enraged prisoners, who had all been more or less wronged by these men. Their hands were tied behind them, and one by one they mounted the scaffold. Curtis, who was last, a big stout fellow, managed to get his hands loose, and broke away and ran through the crowd and down toward the swamp. It was yelled out that he had a knife in his hand, and so a path was made for him. He reached the swamp and plunged in, trying to get over on the other side, presumably among his friends. It being very warm, he overexerted himself, and when in the middle or thereabouts, collapsed and could go no farther. The police started after him, waded in and helped him out. He pleaded for water, and it was given him then led back to the scaffold and helped to mount up. All were given a chance to talk. Munn, a good-looking fellow in marine dress, said he came into the prison four months before, perfectly honest and as innocent of crime as any fellow in it. Starvation with evil companions had made him what he was. He spoke of his mother and sisters in New York, that he cared nothing as far as he himself was concerned, but the news that would be carried home to his people made him want to curse God he had ever been born. Delaney said he would rather be hung than live here as the most of them lived, on their allowance of rations. If allowed to steal, could get enough to eat, but as that was stopped, had rather hang. Bid all good-bye said his name was not Delaney, and that no one knew who he really was, therefore his friends would never know his fate, his Andersonville history dying with him. Curtis said he didn't care a blank, only hurry up and not be talking about it all day, making too much fuss over a very small matter. William Collins, alias Mosby, said he was innocent of murder and ought not to be hung, he had stolen blankets and rations to preserve his own life, and begged the crowd not to see him hung as he had a wife and child at home, and for their sake to let him live. The excited crowd began to be impatient for the show to commence, as they termed it. Sarsfield made quite a speech. He had studied for a lawyer. At the outbreak of the rebellion, he had enlisted and served three years in the army, been wounded in battle, furloughed home, wound healed up, promoted to first sergeant, and also commissioned. His commission as a lieutenant had arrived, but had not been mustered in when he was taken prisoner, began by stealing parts of rations, gradually becoming hardened as he became familiar with the crimes practiced. Evil associates had helped him to go downhill, and here he was. The other did not care to say anything. While the men were talking, they were interrupted by all kinds of questions and charges made by the crowd, such as, Don't lay it on too thick, you villain. Get ready to jump off. Cut it short. You was the cause of so-and-so's death. Less talk and more hanging, and so on and so on. At about eleven o'clock, they were all blindfolded, hands and feet tied, told to get ready, nooses adjusted, and the plank knocked from under. Mosby's rope broke, and he fell to the ground, with blood spurting from his ears, mouth, and nose. As they lifted him back to the swinging-off place, he revived and begged for his life, but no use, was soon dangling with the rest, and died very hard. Munn died easily, as also did Delaney. All the rest died hard, and particularly Sarsfield, who drew his knees nearly to his chin and then straightened them out with a jerk, the veins on his neck swelling out as if they would burst. It was an awful sight to see, still a necessity. Mosby, although he said he had never killed anyone, and I don't believe he ever did deliberately kill a man, such as stabbing or pounding a victim to death, yet he has walked up to a poor sick prisoner on a cold night and robbed him of blanket, or perhaps his rations, and, if necessary, using all the force necessary to do it. These things were the same as life to the sick man, for he would invariably die." 
The result has been that many have died from his robbing propensities. It was right that he should hang, and he did hang most beautifully, and Andersonville is the better off for it. None of the rest denied that they had killed men, and probably some had murdered dozens. It has been a good lesson. There are still bad ones in camp, but we have the strong arm of the law to keep them in check. All during the hanging scene the stockade was covered with rebels who were fearful a break would be made if the raiders should try and rescue them. Many citizens, too, were congregated on the outside in favorable positions for seeing. Artillery was pointed at us from all directions, ready to blow us all into eternity in short order. Wirtz stood on a high platform in plain sight of the execution and says we are a hard crowd to kill our own men. After hanging for half an hour or so, the six bodies were taken down and carried outside. In noting down the speeches made by the condemned men, have used my own language. In substance, it is the same as told by them. I occupied a near position to the hanging and saw it all from first to last, and stood there until they were taken down and carried away. Was a strange sight to see, and the first hanging I ever witnessed. The raiders had many friends who crowded around and denounced the whole affair, and but for the police there would have been a riot. Many, both for and against the execution, were knocked down. Some will talk, and get into trouble thereby, as long as it does no good, there is no use in loud talk and exciting arguments. It is dangerous to advance any argument. Men are so ready to quarrel. Have got back to my quarters thoroughly prostrated and worn out with fatigue and excitement, and only hope that today's lesson will right matters as regards raiding. Battese suspended washing long enough to look on and see them hang and grunted his approval. Have omitted to say that the good Catholic priest attended the condemned. Rebel Negroes came inside and began to take down the scaffold. Prisoners took hold to help them and resulted in its all being carried off to different parts of the prison to be used for kindling wood, and the rebels get none of it back and are mad. The ropes even have been gobbled up, and I suppose some time may be exhibited at the North as mementos of today's proceedings. My corps assisted at the hanging. Some fears are entertained that those who officiated will get killed by the friends of those hanged. The person who manipulated the drop has been taken outside on parole of honor, as his life would be in danger in here. Jimmy thanks God that he has lived to see justice done the raiders. He is about gone, nothing but skin and bone, and can hardly move hand or foot. Rest of the mess moderately well. The extra rations derived from our three messmates as policemen helps wonderfully to prolong life. Once in a while, some of them gets a chance to go outside on some duty and buy onions or sweet potatoes, which is a great luxury. July 12. Good order has prevailed since the hanging. The men have settled right down to the business of living with no interruption. I keep thinking our situation can get no worse, but it does get worse every day, and not less than 160 die each 24 hours. Probably one-fourth or one-third of these die inside the stockade, the balance in the hospital outside. All day and up to 4 o'clock p.m., the dead are being gathered up and carried to the south gate and placed in a row inside the deadline. As the bodies are stripped of their clothing, in most cases as soon as the breath leaves and in some cases before, the row of dead presents a sickening appearance. Legs drawn up and in all shapes, they are black from pitch pine smoke and laying in the sun. Some of them lay there for twenty hours or more and by that time are in a horrible condition. At four o'clock, a four- or six-mule wagon comes up to the gate, and twenty or thirty bodies are loaded onto the wagon, and they are carted off to be put in trenches, one hundred in each trench in the cemetery, which is eighty or a hundred rods away. There must necessarily be a great many whose names are not taken. 
it is the orders to attach the name company and regiment to each body but it is not always done i was invited today to dig in a tunnel but had to decline my digging days are over must dig now to keep out of the ground i guess it is with difficulty now that i can walk and only with the help of two canes july thirteen can see in the distance the cars go poking along by this station with wheezing old engines snorting along as soon as night comes a great many are blind caused by sleeping in the open air with moon shining in the face many holes are dug and excavations made in camp near our quarters is a well about five or six feet deep and the poor blind fellows fall into this pit hole none seriously hurt but must be quite shaken up half of the prisoners have no settled place for sleeping wander and lay down wherever they can find room have two small gold rings on my finger worn ever since i left home have also a small photograph album with eight photographs in relics of civilization should i get these things through to our lines they will have quite a history when i am among the rebels i wind a rag round my finger to cover up the rings or else take them and put in my pocket bad off as i have been have never seen the time yet that i would part with them were presents to me and the photographs have looked at about one-fourth of the time since imprisonment one prisoner made some buttons here for his little boy at home and gave them to me to deliver as he was about to die have them sewed on to my pants for safe keeping july fourteen we have been too busy with the raiders of late to manufacture any exchange news and now all hands are at work trying to see who can tell the biggest yarns the weak are feeling well tonight over the story that we are all to be sent north this month before the twentieth have not learned that the news came from any reliable source rumors of midsummer battles with union troops victorious it's bite dog bite bear with most of us prisoners we don't care which licks what we want is to get out of this pen of course we all care and want our side to win but it's tough on patriotism a court is now held every day and offenders punished principally by buck and gagging for misdemeanors the hanging has done worlds of good still there is much stealing going on yet but in a sly way not openly hold my own as regards health the dreaded month of july is half gone almost and a good many over one hundred and fifty die each day but i do not know how many hardly any one cares enough about it to help me in my inquiries it is all self with the most of them a guard by accident shot himself have often said they didn't know enough to hold a gun. Bury a rebel guard every few days within sight of the prison. Saw some women in the distance. Quite a sight. Are feeling quite jolly tonight since the sun went down. Was visited by my new acquaintances of the Ninth Michigan Infantry, who are comparatively new prisoners. Am learning them the way to live here. They are very hopeful fellows and declare the war will be over this coming fall and tell their reasons very well for thinking so. We gird up our loins and decide that we will try to live it through. Roe, although often given to despondency, is feeling good and cheerful. There are some noble fellows here. A man shows exactly what he is in Andersonville. No occasion to be any different from what you really are very often see a great big fellow in size in reality a baby in action actually sniveling and crying and then again you will see some little runt not bigger than a pint of cider tell the big fellow to brace up and be a man statue has nothing to do as regards nerve still there are noble big fellows as well as noble little ones a sergeant hill is judge and jury now and dispenses justice to evil-doers with impartiality a farce is made of defending some of the arrested ones hill inquires all of the particulars of each case and sometimes lets the offenders go as more sinned against than sinning for receiving punishment july fifteen blank cartridges were this morning fired over the camp by the artillery and immediately the greatest commotion outside 
It seems that the signal in case a break is made is cannon firing, and this was to show us how quick they could rally and get into shape. In less time than it takes for me to write it, all were at their posts and in condition to open up and kill nine-tenths of all here. Sweltering hot. Dying off one hundred and fifty-five each day. There are twenty-eight thousand confined here now. July 16. Well, who ever supposed that it could be any hotter, but today is more so than yesterday, and yesterday more than the day before. My coverlid has been rained on so much and burned in the sun, first one and then the other, that it is getting the worse for wear. It was originally a very nice one and homemade. Sun goes right through it now and reaches down for us, just like a bake oven. The rabbit mules that draw in the rations look as if they didn't get much more to eat than we do. Driven with one rope line and harness patched up with ropes, strings, and so forth, fit representation of the Confederacy, not much like U.S. Army teams. A joke on the rebel adjutant has happened. Someone broke into the shanty and tied the two or three sleeping there and carried off all the goods. Tennessee Bill, a fellow captured with me, had charge of the affair and is in disgrace with the adjutant on account of it. Everyone is glad of the robbery. Probably there was not ten dollars worth of things in there, but they asked outrageous prices for everything. Adjutant very mad, but no good. Is a small sputtering sort of fellow. July 17. Cords contracting in my legs and very difficult for me to walk. After going a little ways, have to stop and rest and am faint. Am urged by some to go to the hospital, but don't like to do it. Mess say had better stay where I am, and Batese says shall not go, and that settles it. Jimmy Deavers anxious to be taken to the hospital, but is persuaded to give it up. Tom McGill, another Irish friend, is past all recovery, is in another part of the prison. Many old prisoners are dropping off now this fearful hot weather, knew that July and August would thin us out. Cannot keep track of them in my disabled condition. A fellow named Hubbard, with whom I have conversed a great deal, is dead. A few days ago was in very good health, and is only a question of a few days now with any of us. Succeeded in getting four small onions about as large as hickory nuts, tops and all, for two dollars, Confederate money. Batese furnished the money, but won't eat an onion. Ask him if he is afraid it will make his breath smell. It is said that two or three onions or a sweet potato eaten raw daily will cure the scurvy. What a shame that such things are denied us, being so plenty the world over. Never appreciated such things before, but shall hereafter. Am talking as if I expected to get home again. I do. July 18. Time is slowly dragging itself along. Cut some wretch's hair most every day. Have a sign out, hair cutting, as well as washing. And by the way, Batese has a new washboard made from a piece of the scaffold lumber. About half the time do the work for nothing. In fact, not more than one in three or four pays anything. Expenses, not much, though, don't have to pay any rent. All the mess keeps their hair cut short, which is very good advertisement. My eyes getting weak with other troubles can just hobble around. Death rate more than ever, reported 165 per day, said by some to be more than that but a hundred and sixty-five is about the figure. Bad enough without making any worse than it really is. Jimmy Deavers most dead and begs us to take him to the hospital, and guess we'll have to. Every morning the sick are carried to the gate in blankets and on stretchers, and the worst cases admitted to the hospital. Probably out of five or six hundred, half are admitted. Do not think any lives after being taken there, are past all human aid. Four out of every five prefer to stay inside and die with their friends rather than go to the hospital. Hard stories reach us of the treatment of the sick out there, and I am sorry to say the cruelty emanates from our own men who act as nurses. 
these dead beats and bummer nurses are the same bounty jumpers the u s authorities have had so much trouble with do not mean to say that all the nurses are of that class but a great many of them are july nineteen there is no such thing as delicacy here nine out of ten would as soon eat with a corpse for a table as any other way in the middle of last night i was awakened by being kicked by a dying man he was soon dead in his struggles he had floundered clear into our bed got up and moved the body off a few feet and again went to sleep to dream of the hideous sights i can never get used to it as some do often wake most scared to death and shuddering from head to foot almost dread to go to sleep on this account i am getting worse and worse and prison ditto july twenty am troubled with poor sight together with scurvy and dropsy my teeth are all loose and it is with difficulty i can eat jimmy devers was taken out to die to-day i hear that mcgill is also dead john mcguire died last night both were jackson men and old acquaintances my corps is still policeman and is sorry for me does what he can and so we have seen the last of jimmy a prisoner of war one year and eighteen days struggled hard to live through it if ever any one did ever since i can remember have known him john mcguire also i have always known everybody in jackson michigan will remember him as living on the east side of the river near the wintergreen patch and his father before him they were one of the first families who settled that country his people are well to do with much property leaves a wife and one boy tom mcgill is also a jackson boy and a member of my own company thus you will see that three of my acquaintances died the same day for jimmy cannot live until night i don't think not a person in the world but would have thought either of them would kill me a dozen times enduring hardships pretty hard to tell about such things small squad of poor deluded yanks turned inside with us captured at petersburg it is said they talk of winning recent battles battese has traded for an old watch and mike will try to procure vegetables for it from the guard that is what will save us if anything july twenty one and rebels are still fortifying battese has his hands full takes care of me like a father hear that kilpatrick is making a raid for this place troops uh, rebel are arriving here by every train to defend it nothing but cornbread issued now and i cannot eat it any more july twenty two a petition is gotten up signed by all the sergeants in the prison to be sent to washington d c begging to be released captain wirtz has consented to let three representatives go for that purpose rough that it should be necessary for us to beg to be protected by our government july twenty three reports of an exchange in august can't stand it till that time will soon go up the spout july twenty fourth have been trying to get into the hospital but battese won't let me go george w hutchins brother of charlie hutchins of jackson michigan died today from our mess jimmy devers is dead july twenty five roe getting very bad sanders ditto am myself much worse and cannot walk and with difficulty stand up legs drawn up like a triangle mouth in terrible shape and dropsy worse than all a few more days at my earnest solicitation was carried to the gate this morning to be admitted to the hospital lay in the sun for some hours to be examined and finally my turn came and i tried to stand up but was so excited i fainted away when i came to myself i lay along with the row of dead on the outside raised up and asked a rebel for a drink of water and he said here you yank if you ain't dead get inside there and with his help was put inside again told a man to go to our mess and tell them to come to the gate and pretty soon battese and sanders came and carried me back to our quarters and here i am completely played out battese flying around to buy me something good to eat can't write much more exchange rumors july twenty six ain't dead yet 
actually laugh when I think of the rebel who thought if I wasn't dead I'd better get inside. Can't walk a step now. Shall try for the hospital no more. Had an onion. July 27. Sweltering hot. No worse than yesterday. Said that two hundred die now each day. Row very bad, and Sanders getting so. Swan dead. Gordon dead. Jack Withers dead. Scotty dead. A large Irishman who has been near us a long time is dead. These and scores of others died yesterday and day before. Hub Dakin came to see me and brought an onion. He is just able to crawl around himself. July 28. Taken a step forward toward the trenches since yesterday and am worse. Had a wash all over this morning. Batese took me to the creek. Carries me without any trouble. July 29. Alive and kicking. Drank some soured water made from meal and water. July 30. Hang on well and no worse. August 1. Just about the same. My Indian friend says we all get away. August 2. Two hundred and twenty die each day. No more news of exchange. August 3. Had some good soup and feel better. All is done for me that can be done by my friends. Rowe and Sanders in almost as bad a condition as myself. Just about where I was two or three weeks ago. Seem to have come down all at once. August goes for them. August 4. Storm threatened. Will cool the atmosphere. Hard work to write. August 5. Severe storm. Could die in two hours if I wanted to, but don't. August 12. Warm, warm, warm. If I only had some shade to lay in and a glass of lemonade. August 13. A nice spring of cold water has broken out in camp, enough to furnish nearly all here with drinking water. God has not forgotten us. Batese brings it to me to drink. August 14. Batese very hopeful as exchange rumors are afloat, talks more about it than ever before. August 15. The water is a godsend, Sanders better and Roe worse. August 16. Still in the land of the living, Captain Wirtz is sick and a Lieutenant Davis acting in his stead. August 17. Hanging on yet. A good many more than two hundred and twenty-five die now in twenty-four hours. Messes that have stopped near us are all dead. August 18. Exchange rumors. August 19. Am still hoping for relief. Water is bracing some up. Myself with others. Does not hurt us. August 20. Some say three hundred now die each day. No more new men coming. Reported that Wirtz is dead. August 21. Sleep nearly all the time except when too hot to do so. August 22. Exchange rumors. August 23. Terribly hot. August 24. Had some soup. Not particularly worse, but Roe is and Sanders also. August 25. In my exuberance of joy must write a few lines. Received a letter from my brother, George W. Ransom, from Hilton Head. Contained only a few words. Footnote. My brother supposed me dead, as I had been so reported. Still, thinking it might not be so, every week or so he would write a letter and direct it to me as a prisoner of war. This letter, very strangely, reached its destination. August 26. Still am writing. The letter from my brother has done good and cheered me up. I sight very poor and writing tires me. But Tazy sticks by. Such disinterested friendship is rare. Prison at its worst. August 27. Have now written nearly through three large books and still at it. The diary I'm confident will reach my people if I don't. There are many here who are interested and will see that it goes north. August 28. No news and no worse. Set up part of the time. Dying off a third faster than ever before. August 29. Exchange rumors afloat. Any kind of a change would help me. 
August 30. Am in no pain whatever and no worse. August 31. Still waiting for something to turn up. My Indian friend says, good news yet. Night. The camp is full of exchange rumors. September 1. Sanders taken outside to butcher cattle. Is sick but goes all the same. Mike's sick and no longer a policeman. Still rumors of exchange. September 2. Just about the same. Rumors afloat does me good. Am the most hopeful chap on record. September 3. Trade off my rations for some little luxury and manage to get up quite a soup. Later. Sanders sent in to us a quite large piece of fresh beef and a little salt. Another godsend. September 4. Anything good to eat lifts me right up, and the beef soup has done it. September 4. The beef critter is a noble animal. Very decided exchange rumors. September 5. The nice spring of cold water still flows and furnishes drinking water for all. Police guard it night and day, so to be taken away only in small quantities. Three hundred said to be dying off each day. September 6. Hurrah! 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 Can't holler except on paper. Good news. Seven detachments ordered to be ready to go at a moment's notice. Later. All who cannot walk must stay behind. If left behind, shall die in twenty-four hours. Batese says, I shall go. Later, seven detachments are going out of the gate. All the sick are left behind. Ours is the tenth detachment and will go tomorrow, so said. The greatest excitement, men wild with joy, am worried fearful that I cannot go, but Batese says I shall. September 7. Anxiously waiting the expected summons, rebels say as soon as transportation comes, and so a car whistle is music to our ears. Hope is a good medicine, and am sitting up and have been trying to stand up, but can't do it. Legs too crooked, and with every attempt get faint. Men laugh at the idea of my going, as the rebels are very particular not to let any sick go. Still, Batese says I am going. Most dark. Rebels say we go during the night, when transportation comes. Batese grinned when this news come, and can't get his face straightened out again. Marine Hospital, Savannah, Georgia, September 15, 1864 A great change has taken place since I last wrote in my diary. Am in heaven now, compared with the past. At about midnight, September 7th, our detachment was ordered outside at Andersonville, and Batese picked me up and carried me to the gate. The men were being let outside in ranks of four and counted as they went out. They were very strict about letting none go but the well ones or those who could walk. The rebel adjutant stood upon a box by the gate, watching very close. Pitch pine knots were burning in the near vicinity to give light. As it came our turn to go, Batese got me in the middle of the rank, stood me up as well as I could stand, and with himself on one side and Sergeant Rowe on the other, began pushing our way through the gate. Could not help myself a particle, and was so faint that I hardly knew what was going on. As we were going through the gate, the adjutant yells out, Here, here, hold on there, that man can't go, hold on there, and Batese crowding right along outside. The adjutant struck over the heads of the men and tried to stop us, but my noble Indian friend kept straight ahead, hallooing, He all right, he well, he go. And so I got outside, and adjutant having too much to look after to follow me. After we were outside, I was carried to the railroad in the same cover lid which I fooled the rebel out of when captured, and which I presume has saved my life a dozen times. We were crowded very thick into box cars. I was nearly dead and hardly knew where we were or what was going on. We were two days in getting to Savannah, arrived early in the morning. The railroads here run in the middle of very wide, handsome streets. We were unloaded, I should judge, near the middle of the city. The men, as they were unloaded, fell into line and were marched away. Batese got me out of the car and laid me on the pavement. They then obliged him to go with the rest, leaving me, would not let him take me. 
I lay there until noon with four or five others without any guard. Three or four times Negro servants came to us from houses nearby and gave us water, milk, and food. With much difficulty I could set up, but was completely helpless. A little after noon a wagon came and toted us to a temporary hospital in the outskirts of the city and near a prison pen they had just built for the well ones. Where I was taken it was merely an open piece of ground, having wall tents erected and a line of guards around it. I was put into a tent and lay on the coverlid. That night some gruel was given to me, and a nurse whom I had seen in Andersonville looked in, and my name was taken. The next morning, September 10th, I woke up and went to move my hands, and could not do it, could not move either limb so much as an inch, could move my head with difficulty, seemed to be paralyzed, but in no pain whatever. After a few hours a physician came to my tent, examined and gave me medicine, also left medicine, and one of the nurses fed me some soup or gruel. By night I could move my hands, lay awake considerable through the night thinking, was happy as a clam at high tide, seemed so nice to be under a nice clean tent, and there was such cool, pure air. The surroundings were so much better that I thought now would be a good time to die, and I didn't care one way or the other. Next morning the doctor came, and with him Sergeant Wynn. Sergeant Wynn I had had a little acquaintance with at Andersonville. Doctor said I was terribly reduced, but he thought I would improve. Told them to wash me. A nurse came and washed me, and Wynn brought me a white cotton shirt and an old but clean pair of pants. My old clothing, which was in rags, was taken away. Two or three times during the day I had gruel of some kind. I don't know what. Medicine was given me by the nurses. By night I could move my feet and legs a little. The cords in my feet and legs were contracted so, of course, that I couldn't straighten myself out. Kept thinking to myself, am I really away from that place, Andersonville? It seemed too good to be true. On the morning of the twelfth, ambulances moved all to the Marine Hospital, or rather an orchard in same yard with Marine Hospital, where thirty or forty nice new tents have been put up, with bunks about two feet from the ground inside, was put into a tent. By this time could move my arms considerable. We were given vinegar weakened with water and also salt in it. Had medicine. My legs began to get movable more each day, also my arms, and today I am laying on my stomach and writing in my diary. My corps is also in this hospital. One of my tent mates is a man named Land, who is a printer, same as myself. I hear that William B. Rowe is here also, but haven't seen him. September 16. How I do sleep! am tired out, and seems to me I can just sleep till doomsday. September 17. Four in each tent. A nurse raises me up, sitting posture, and there I stay for hours, dozing and talking away. Whiskey given us in very small quantities, probably half a teaspoonful in half a glass of something, I don't know what, actually makes me drunk. I am in no pain whatever. September 18. Surgeon examined me very thoroughly today. Have some bad sores caused by laying down so much. Put something on them that makes them ache. Sergeant Wynn gave me a pair of socks. September 19. A priest gave me some alum for my sore mouth. Had a piece of sweet potato but couldn't eat it. Fearfully weak. Soup is all I can eat and don't always stay down. September 20. Too cool for me. The priest said he would come and see me often. Good man! My left hand got bruised in some way, and Rebel done it up. He is afraid gangrene will get in sore. My core is quite sick. September 21. Don't feel as well as I did some days ago. Can't eat. Still can use my limbs and arms more. September 22. Good many sick brought here. Everybody is kind, Rebels and all am now differently sick than at any other time. Take lots of medicine, eat nothing but gruel. 
Surgeons are very attentive. Man died in my tent. Oh, if I was away by myself, I would get well. Don't want to see a sick man. That makes me sick. September 23. Shall write anyway. Have to watch nurses and rebels or will lose my diary. Vinegar reduced I drink, and it is good. Crave after acids and salt. Mouth appears to be actually sorer than ever before, but whether it is worse or not can't say. Sergeant Wynne says the doctor says that I must be very careful if I want to get well. How in the old Harry can I be careful? They are the ones that had better be careful and give me the right medicine and food. Gruel made out of a dishcloth to eat. September 24. Arrowroot soup, or whatever you may call it, don't like it, makes me sick. Priest spoke to me, cross and peevish, and they say that is a sure sign we'll get well. Ain't sure, but shall be a Catholic yet. Every little while get out the old diary from under the blanket and write a sentence. Never was made to be sick, too uneasy. This will do for today. September 25. Can eat better, or drink rather, some rebel general dead and buried with honors outside, had another wash and general clean-up, ocean breezes severe for invalids, and visited twice a day by the rebel surgeon who instructs nurses about treatment. Food, principally arrowroot, have a little whiskey, sleep great deal of the time, Land, my acquaintance and messmate, is lame from scurvy, but is not weak and sick as I am. When I think of anything, say, Land, put her down, and he writes what I tell him. Everything clean here, but then any place is clean after summering in Andersonville. Don't improve much, and sometimes not at all. Get blue sometimes. Nature of the beast, I suppose. Other sick in the tent worry and make me nervous. September 26. Am really getting better and hopeful. Battese has the first two books of my diary. Would like to see him. Was mistaken about Roe being in the hospital. He is not, but I hear he is in the big stockade with bulk of prisoners. Say we were removed from Andersonville for the reason that our troops were moving that way. Well, thank heaven they moved that way. Mike Hoare, the irrepressible Irishman, is hobbling around and in our tent about half the time, is also getting well. Quite a number die here, not having the constitution to rally. This is the first hospital I was ever in. My old cover lid was washed and fumigated the first day in hospital, am given very little to eat five or six times a day, washed with real soap, an improvement on sand, Half a dozen rebel doctors prowling round, occasionally one that needs dressing down, but as a general thing are very kind, can see from my bunk a large live oak tree which is a curiosity to me, although it is hot weather, the evenings are cool, in fact cold, ocean breezes. A discussion on the subject has set me down as weighing about ninety-five. I think about one hundred and five or ten pounds, Weighed when captured 178. Boarding with the Confederacy does not agree with me. The swelling about my body has all left me. Sergeant Wynn belongs to the 100th Ohio. He has charge of a ward in this hospital. September 27. Getting so I can eat a little and like the gruel. Have prided myself all during the imprisonment on keeping a stiff upper lip while I saw big strong men crying like children. Cruelty and privations would never make me cry, always so mad, but now it is different and weaken a little, sometimes all to myself. Land, my sick comrade, writes at my dictation. September 28. Sent word to Battese by a convalescent who is being sent to the large prison that I am getting well. Would like to see him. Am feeling better. Good many Union men in Savannah. Three hundred sick here, with all kinds of diseases, gangrene, dropsy, scurvy, typhoid, and other fevers, diarrhea, and so forth. Good care taken of me, have medicine often, and gruel. Land does the writing. September 29. Yes, I am better, but poor and weak. 
feeling hungry more now and can take nourishment quite often my corps calls to see me he is thinking of escape should think a person might escape from here when able i shall get well now sweet potatoes for sale like to see such things but cannot eat them rebel officer put his hand on my head a few minutes ago and said something don't know what it is said the yankees can throw shell into savannah from their gunboats down the river sergeant wynn comes to see me and cheers me up wynn is a sutler as well as nurse that is he buys eatables from the guards and other rebels and sells to our men number of marines and sailors in the building adjoining our hospital also some yankee officers sick wynn makes quite a little money they have soap here to wash with the encouraging talk of ending the war soon helps me to get well september thirty am decidedly better and getting quite an appetite but can get nothing but broth gruel and so on mouth very bad two or three teeth have come out and can't eat any hard food anyway they give me quinine at least i think it is quinine good many visitors come here to see the sick and they look like union people savannah is a fine place from all accounts of it mike is getting entirely over his troubles and talks continually of getting away there are a great many irish here about and they are principally union men mike wishes i was able to go with him nurses are mostly marines who have been sick and are convalescent as a class they are good fellows but some are rough ones are very profane the cords in my legs loosening up a little whiskey and water given me today also weakened vinegar and salt am all the time getting better later my faithful friend came to see me today was awful glad to see him he is well a guard came with him Batese is quite a curiosity among the savannah rebels is a very large broad-shouldered indian rather ignorant but full of common sense and very kind-hearted is allowed many favors october one a prisoner of war nearly a year have stood and went through the very worst kind of treatment am getting ravenously hungry but they won't give me much to eat even mike won't give me anything says the doctors forbid it well i suppose it is so one trouble with the men here who are sick they are too indolent and discouraged which counteracts the effect of medicines a dozen or twenty die in the twenty-four hours have probably half tablespoon of whiskey daily and it is enough land is a good fellow i write this last sentence myself and land says he will scratch it out ransom a high garden wall surrounds us wall is made of stone mike dug around the corners of the walls and in out-of-the-way places and got together a mess of greens out of pusley offered me some and then wouldn't let me have it meaner than pusley have threatened to lick the whole crowd in a week october two coming cool weather and it braces me right up sailors are going away to be exchanged ate some sweet potato today and it beats everything how i am gaining drink lots of gruel and the more i drink the more i want have vinegar and salt and water mixed together given me also whiskey and every little while i am taking something either food or medicine and the more i take the more i want am just crazy for anything no matter what could eat a mule's ear eat rice and vegetable soup all the talk that i hear is to the effect that the war is most over don't want to be disturbed at all until i am well which will not be very long now all say if i don't eat too much will soon be well mike lives high is an ingenious fellow and contrives to get many good things to eat gives me anything that he thinks won't hurt me setting up in my bunk have washed all over and feel fifty per cent better just a jumping toward convalescence october three the hospital is crowded now with sick about thirty die now each day men who walked away from andersonville and come to get treatment are too far gone to rally and die heard jeff davis speech read today he spoke of an exchange soon i am better where i am for a few weeks yet number of sailors went today gnaw onion raw sweet potato batese here will stay all day and go back tonight says he is going with marines to be exchanged 
give him food which he loathed to eat although hungry says he will come to see me after i get home to michigan october four am now living splendid vegetable diet is driving off the scurvy and dropsy in fact the dropsy has dropped out but the effect remains set up now part of the time and talk like a runaway horse until tired out and then collapse heard that all the prisoners are going to be sent to millen georgia wrote a few lines directed to my father in michigan am now given more food but not much at a time two poor fellows in our tent do not get along as well as i do although land is doing well and is going to be a nurse the hospital is not guarded very close, and my corps cannot resist the temptation to escape. Well, joy go with him. Dosed with quinine and beastly to take. Batese, on his last visit to me, left the two first books of my diary which he had in his possession. There is no doubt that he has saved my life, although he will take no credit for it. It is said all were moved from Andersonville to different points. Ten thousand went to Florence, ten thousand to Charleston, and ten thousand to Savannah. But the dead stay there, and will for all time to come. What a terrible place, and what a narrow escape I had of it. Seems to me that fifteen thousand died while I was there, an army almost, and as many men as inhabit a city of fifty thousand population. October 5 all in andersonville will remember daly who used to drive the bread wagon into that place he came to savannah with us and was in this hospital a few days ago he went away with some sailors to be exchanged soon after leaving savannah he fell off the cars and was killed and a few hours after leaving here was brought back and buried it is said he had been drinking getting better every day eat right smart Mike waiting for a favorable chance to escape, and in the meantime is getting well. Heard that Batese has gone away with sailors to our lines. It's wonderful the noticeable change of air here from that in Andersonville. Wonder that any lived a month inhaling the poison. If some of those good fellows that died there, Jimmy Devers, Dr. Lewis, Swain McGuire, and scores of others, had lived through it to go home with me, should feel better have a disagreeable task to perform, that of going to see the relatives of fifteen or twenty who died and deliver messages. Rebel surgeons act as if the war was most over, and not like very bad enemies. Fresh beef issued to those able to eat it, which is not me, can chew nothing hard, and, in fact, cannot chew at all, am all tired out and will stop for today. October 7. Haven't time to write much. Busy eating. Mouth getting better. Cords in my legs loosening up. Patese has not gone. Was here today and got a square meal. Don't much think that I have heretofore mentioned the fact that I have two small gold rings, which has been treasured carefully all during my imprisonment. They were presents to me before leaving home. It is needless to say they were from lady friends have worn them part of the time, and part of the time they have been secreted about my clothes. Yankee rings are in great demand by the guards, crave delicacies and vegetables so much that think I may be pardoned for letting them go now, and, as Mike says he can get a bushel of sweet potatoes for them, have told him to make the trade, and he says we'll do it. Sweet potatoes sliced up and put in a dish and cooked with a piece of beef and seasoned make a delicious soup. There are grayback lice in the hospital, just enough for company's sake, should feel lonesome without them. Great many visitors come to look at us and from my bunk can see them come through the gate. Yankees are a curiosity in this southern port, as none were ever kept here before. I hear that the citizens donate bread and food to the prisoners. October 8. Talk of Millen, about ninety miles from here. Mike will trade off the rings tonight. Owe Sergeant Wynn twelve dollars for onions and sweet potatoes, Confederate money, however. A dollar confed is only ten cents in money. Hub Dakin from Dansville, Michigan, in this hospital. It is said Savannah will be in our hands in less than two months. Some Irish citizens told Mike so. Union Army victorious everywhere. Going on twelve months a prisoner of war. Don't want to be exchanged now. Could not stand the journey home. 
Just want to be let alone one month and then home and friends. Saw myself in a looking-glass for the first time in ten months and am the worst-looking specimen. Don't want to go home in twelve years unless I look different from this. Almost inclined to disown myself. Pitch pine smoke is getting peeled off. Need skinning. Eyesight improving with other troubles. Can't begin to read a newspaper and with difficulty write a little at a time. Can hear big guns every morning from down the river. It is said to be Yankee gunboats bidding the city of Savannah good morning. October 9. The reason we have not been exchanged is because if the exchange is made, it will put all the men held by the Union forces right into the rebel army, while the Union prisoners of war held by the rebels are in no condition to do service. That would seem to me to be a very poor reason. Rowe and Bullock are in the main prison, I hear, and well. It is one of the miracles that Bullock lived as he was ailing all through Andersonville. Brass buttons with hens on, eagles, are eagerly sought after by the guards. Mike still harping on escape, but I attend right to the business of getting enough to eat. Although can't eat much, have the appetite all the same. The rebel M.D., by name Pendleton, or some such name, says if I am not careful will have a relapse, and is rather inclined to scold. Says I get along altogether too fast, and tells the nurse and Mike and Land that I must not eat but little at a time, and then only such food as he may direct. And if I don't do as he says, will put me in the main building away from my friends. Says it is suicide the way some act after a long imprisonment. Well, suppose he is right, and I must go slow. Names of Yankee officers marked on the tents that have occupied them as prisoner of war before us. October 10. Mike traded off the gold rings for three pecks of sweet potatoes and half a dozen onions. Am in clover. Make nice soup out of beef, potatoes, bread, onion, and salt. Can trade a sweet potato for most anything. Mike does the cooking and I do the eating. He won't eat my potatoes. Some others do, though, and without my permission. Tis ever thus, wealth brings care and trouble. Batese came today to see me and gave him some sweet potatoes. He is going away soon, the rebels having promised to send him with next batch of sailors. Is a favorite with rebels. Mike baking bread to take with him in his flight. Set now at the door of the tent on a soapbox. Beautiful shade trees all over the place. Am in the fifth ward, tent number twelve. Overlid still does me good service. Many die here, but not from lack of attention or medicine. They haven't the vitality to rally after their suffering at Andersonville. Sisters of Charity go from tent to tent looking after men of their own religion. Also, citizens come among us. Wheat bread we have quite often and is donated by citizens. Guards walk on the outside of the wall and only half a dozen or so on the inside, two being at the gate not necessary to guard the sick very close. Should judge the place was some fine private residence before being transformed into the marine hospital. Have good water. What little hair I have is coming off. Probably go home bald-headed. October 12. Still getting better fast, and doctor says too fast. Now do nearly all the diary writing. Hardly seems possible that our own Yankee gunboats are so near us, so near that we can hear them fire off their guns, but such is the case. Reports have it that the Johnny Rebels are about worsted. Has been a hard war and cruel one. Mike does all my cooking now, although an invalid. He trades sweet potato for vinegar, which tastes the best of anything, and also have other things suitable for the sick, and this morning had an egg. My gold rings will put me in good health again. All the time medicine, that is, three or four times a day, and sores on my body are healing up now for the first time. Mouth, which was one mass of black bloody swelling on the inside, is now white and inflammation gone, teeth, however, loose, and have lost four through scurvy, having come out themselves. My eyes, which had been trying to get in out of sight, are now coming out again and look more respectable. Batese was taken prisoner with eighteen other Indians. They all died but one beside himself. 
october fourteen did not write any yesterday a man named hinton died in our tent at about two o'clock this morning and his bunk is already filled by another sick man none die through neglect here all is done that could reasonably be expected the pants with those buttons on to be taken north for a little boy whose father died in andersonville were taken away from me when first taken to the hospital have also lost nearly all the relics pictures and letters given me to take north for a week or ten days could take care of nothing Wynn took charge of the book that i am writing in now and battese had the other two books and now they are altogether safe in my charge wonder if any one will ever have the patience or time to read it all not less than a thousand pages of finely written crow tracks and some places blurred and unintelligible from being wet and damp as i set up in my bunk my legs are just fitted for hanging down over the side and have not been straightened for three or four months rub the cords with an ointment furnished me by physician and can see a change for the better legs are blue red and shiny and in some places the skin seems calloused to the bone october fifteen richard is getting to be himself again a very little satisfies me as regards the upward tendency to health and liberty some would think to look at me almost helpless and a prisoner of war that i hadn't much to feel glad about well let them go through what i have and then see citizens look on me with pity when i should be congratulated and probably the happiest mortal anywhere hereabouts shall appreciate life health and enough to eat hereafter am anxious for only one thing and that is to get news home to michigan of my safety have no doubt but i am given up for dead as i heard i was so reported drizzling rain has set in birds chipper from among the trees hear bells ring about the city of savannah very different from the city of richmond there it was all noise and bustle and clatter every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost while here it is quiet and pleasant and nice every one talks and treats you with courtesy and kindness don't seem as if they could both be cities of the confederacy savannah has probably seen as little of real war or the consequence of war as any city in the south october eighteen every day since last writing i have continued to improve and no end to my appetite now walk a trifle with the aid of crutches coming cool and agrees with me have fresh beef issued to us mike not yet gone battese went home days ago with others to our lines at least it was supposed to our lines hope to see him some time many have gangrene millen still talked of see city papers every day and they have a discouraged tone as if their cause were on its last legs mike goes to-night for sure he says think if i was in his place would not try to get away we are so comfortable here still liberty is everything and none know what it is except those deprived of it it's a duty we think to escape if possible and it seems possible to get away from here rebel guards that i sometimes come in contact with are marines who belong to rebel gunboats stationed in the mouth of savannah river and are on duty here for a change from boat life they seem a kindly set and i don't believe they would shoot a prisoner if they saw him trying to get away october nineteen last night i talked with a guard while my corps went out of his tunnel and got away safely from the hospital the guard was on the inside and i hobbled to where he was and engaged him in conversation and mike crawled away it seems that mike learned of some union irish citizens in the city and his idea is to reach them which he may do as there are scarcely any troops about the city all being to the front now i am alone best friends all gone one way or the other the only acquaintances here now are land and sergeant wynn with whom i became acquainted in andersonville not like my other friends though it is said there are half a dozen hospitals similar to this in savannah which are filled with andersonville wrecks they have need to do something to redeem themselves from past conduct don't believe that it is the confederacy that is taking such good care of us but it is the city of savannah that is about the way it is as near as i can find out october twenty two 
Lieutenant Davis commands the prison in Savannah, is the same individual who officiated at Andersonville during Wirtz's sickness last summer. He is a rough, but not a bad man, probably does as well as he can. Papers state that they will commence to move the prisoners soon to Millen, to a stockade similar to the one at Andersonville. I am hobbling about the hospital with the help of two crutches. Have not heard a word from old Mike, or Batese, or any one that ever heard of before, for some days. Sweet potatoes, building me up with the luxuries they are traded for. Had some rice in my soup. Terrible appetite, but for all that don't eat a great deal. Have three sticks propped up at the mouth of our tent, with a little fire under it, cooking food. Men in tent swear because smoke goes inside. Make it all straight by giving them some soup. Rebel surgeons all smoke, at least do while among us. Have seen prisoners who craved tobacco more than food, and said of the two would prefer tobacco. I never have used tobacco in any form. October 24. Did not write yesterday, jumping right along toward health if not wealth. Discarded crutches and have now two canes. Get around considerable, a little at a time. It is said that they want Yankee printers who are prisoners of war to go and work in the printing offices in the city on parole of honor. Will not do it. Am all right where I am for a month yet, and by that time expect to go to our lines. Hub Dakin in hospital now. Priests still come and go. Convalescent shot and wounded by the guards. The first I have heard of being hurt since I came to this place. A smallpox case discovered in hospital and created great excitement. Was removed. Was loitering near the gate when an Irish woman came through it with her arms full of wheat bread. All those able to rushed up to get some of it, and forty hands were pleading for her favors. After picking her men and giving away half a dozen loaves, her eyes lighted on me, and I secured a large loaf. She was a jolly, good-natured woman, and it is said that she keeps a bake shop. My bad looks stood me in well this time, as beautiful bread as I ever saw. October 25. Am feeling splendid, and legs doing nobly, and even taking on fat. Am to be a gallant nurse as soon as able, so Sergeant Wynn says. Most of the men, as soon as convalescent, are sent to big prison, but Wynn has spoken a good word for me. Papers say the prison at Millen, Georgia, is about ready for occupancy, and soon all will be sent there, sick and all. Night's cool, and need more covering than we have. I am congratulated occasionally by prisoners who saw me in Andersonville. They wonder at my being alive. Rains. October 26. Time passes now fast, most a year since captured. When the Rebs once get hold of a fellow, they hang on for dear life. Talk that all are to be vaccinated anyway, whether they want to or not. Don't suppose it will do any harm if good matter is used. Vaccinate me if they want to. Walk better every day. Sometimes I overdo a little and feel bad in consequence. Land is right smart, in fact, so smart that he will have to go to the big stockade pretty soon. October 27. A rebel physician, not a regular one, told me that it looked very dark for the Confederacy just now, that we need have no fears, but we would get home very soon now, which is grand good news. I have no fears now, but all will turn out well. Everything points to a not far away ending of the war, and all will rejoice, rebels and all. October 28. Am feeling splendid and legs most straight. Getting fat fast. Am to be a nurse soon. Reported that they are moving prisoners to Millen. Over a thousand went yesterday. About ten thousand of the Andersonville prisoners came to Savannah. Ten thousand went to Florence, and ten to Charleston, South Carolina. Only the sick were left behind there, and it is said they died like sheep after the well ones went away. Great excitement among the gray coats. Some bad army news for them, I reckon. Negroes at work fortifying about the city. October 29. I suppose we must be moved again from all reports. Savannah is threatened by Union troops, and we are to be sent to Millen, Georgia. 
am sorry for while i remain a prisoner would like to stay here am getting along so nicely and recovering my health it is said however that millen is a good place to go to and we will have to take the consequences whatever they may be can eat now anything i can get hold of provided it can be cooked up and made into the shape of soup mouth will not admit of hard food this hospital is not far from the savannah jail and when the gate is open we can see it it is said that some one was hung there not long ago papers referred to it and i asked a guard and he nodded yes have seen one hanging bee and never want to see another one last of my three pecks of sweet potatoes almost gone for a dollar confed bought two quarts of goober peas peanuts and now i have got them can't eat them sell them for a dollar per quart two dollars for the lot it is thus that the yankee getteth wealth have loaned one cane to another convalescent and go around with the aid of one only every day a marked improvement ain't so tall as i used to be some ladies visited the hospital today to see live yankees who crowded around they were as much of a curiosity to us as we were to them october thirty it is said prisoners from main prison are being removed every day and the sick will go last quite a batch of the nearest well ones were sent from here today to go with the others am to be a nurse pretty soon don't think i could nurse a sick cat still it's policy to be one Wynn tells me that he has made money dickering at trade with the rebels and prisoners he has trusted me to twelve dollars worth of things and says he don't expect or want pay the twelve dollars amounts to only one dollar and twenty cents in our money the surgeon who has had charge of us has been sent away to the front it seems he had been wounded in battle and was doing home duty until able to again go to his command shall always remember him for his kind and skilful treatment came round and bid us good-bye and sick sorry to lose him are now in charge of a hospital steward who does very well the atmosphere here makes a gentleman of everybody papers say that the city must be fortified and it is being done considerable activity about the place trains run through at all hours of the night evidently shifting their troops to other localities later since the surgeon went away the rebels are drinking up our whiskey and to-night are having a sort of carnival with some of the favorite nurses joining in singing songs telling stories and a good time generally they are welcome to my share october thirty one reported that the well prisoners have all left this city for millen and we go to-night or to-morrow i am duly installed as nurse and walk with only one cane legs still slightly drawn up hub dakin land and myself now mess together and feeling very well will describe my appearance will interest me to read in after years if no one else am writing this diary to please myself now i weigh one hundred and seventeen pounds am dressed in rebel jacket blue pants with one leg torn off and fringed about halfway between my knee and good-sized foot the same old pair of mismatched shoes i wore in andersonville very good pair of stockings a biled white shirt and a hat which is a compromise between a clown's and the rebel white partially stiff hat am poor as a tadpole in fact look just about like an east tennessean of the poor white trash order you might say that i am an ornery looking cuss and not be far out of the way my cheeks are sunken my eyes sunken sores and blotches both outside and inside my mouth and my right leg the full length of it red black and blue and tender of touch my eyes too are very weak and in a bright sun i have to draw the slouch hat away down over them bad as this picture is i am a beauty and picture of health in comparison to my appearance two months ago when taken prisoner was fleshy weighing about one hundred and seventy or seventy-five round-faced in fact an overgrown ordinary green-looking chap of twenty had never endured any hardships at all and was a spring chicken as has been proven however i had an iron constitution that has carried me through and above all a disposition to make the best of everything no matter how bad and considerable will-power with the rest 
when i think of the thousands and thousands of thoroughbred soldiers tough and hardy and capable of marching thirty forty and even fifty miles in twenty-four hours and think nothing of it i wonder and keep wondering that it can be so that i am alive and gaining rapidly in health and strength believe now that no matter where we are moved to i shall continue to improve and get well succumbed only at the last in andersonville when no one could possibly keep well with this general inventory of myself and the remark that i haven't a red cent or even a confederate shin plaster will put up my diary and get ready to go wherever they see fit to send us as orders have come to get ready later we are on the georgia central railroad en route for millen georgia which is ninety miles from savannah and i believe north are in box cars and very crowded with sick prisoners two nurses myself being one of them have charge of about a hundred sick there are however over six hundred on the train camp lawton millen georgia november one arrived at our destination not far from midnight and it was a tedious journey two died in the car i was in were taken from the cars to this prison in what they call ambulances but what I call lumber wagons, are now congregated in the southeast corner of the stockade under hastily put up tents. This morning we have drawn rations, both the sick and the well, which are good and enough. The stockade is similar to that at Andersonville, but in a more settled country, the ground high and grassy, and through the prison runs a stream of good pure water, with no swamp at all. It is apparently a pleasant and healthy location. A portion of the prison is timberland, and the timber has been cut down and lays where it fell, and the men who arrived before us have been busily at work making shanties and places to sleep in. There are about six thousand prisoners here, and I should judge there was room for twelve or fifteen thousand. Men say they are given food twice each day, which consists of meal and fresh beef in rather small quantities, but good and wholesome. The rebel officer in command is a sociable and kindly disposed man, and the guards are not strict, that is, not cruelly so. We are told that our stay here will be short. A number of our men have been detailed to cook the food for the sick, and their well-being is looked to by the rebel surgeon as well as our own men. The same surgeon who for the last ten days had charge of us in Savannah has charge of us now. He does not know over and above much, but on the whole does very well. Barrels of molasses, nigger toe, have been rolled inside, and it is being issued to the men about one-fourth of a pint to each man, possibly a little more, some of the men luxuriantly put their allowances together and make molasses candy of it. One serious drawback is the scarcity of dishes, and one man I saw draw his portion in his two hands, which held it until his comrade could find a receptacle for it. November 2. Have seen many of my old comrades of Andersonville, among whom is my tried friend Sergeant William B. Rowe, were heartily glad to see one another. Also, little Bullock, who has improved wonderfully in appearance. Everyone is pleased with this place and are cheerful, hoping and expecting to be released before many weeks. They all report as having been well treated in Savannah and have pleasant recollections of that place. From what could be seen of the city by us prisoners, it seems the handsomest one in America. Should judge it was a very wealthy place. My duties as nurse are hard, often too much so for my strength, yet the enforced exercise does me good and continue to improve all the time. A cane will be necessary to my locomotion for a long time, as am afraid myself permanently injured. My cane is not a gold-headed one, it is a round picket which has been pulled off some fence. Very cheering accounts of the war doings. All who want to can take the oath of allegiance to the Confederacy and be released. I'm happy to say, though, that out of all here, but two or three has done so, and they are men who are a detriment to any army. The weather now is beautiful, air refreshing, water ditto. All happy and contented and await coming events with interest. 
Part of the brook, the lower part, is planked and sides boarded up for sanitary privileges. Water has also been dammed up and a fall made which carries off the filth with force. Plenty of wood to do cooking with, and the men putter around with their cooking utensils such as they have. Sort of prize fight going on now. November 3. About a hundred convalescents were taken outside today to be sent away to our lines, the officials told us. At a later hour, the commander came inside and said he wanted twelve men to fall into line, and they did so, myself being one of the twelve. He proceeded to glance us over, and on looking at me said, Step back out of the ranks, I want only able-bodied men. I stepped down and out, considerably chagrined, as the general impression was that they were to go to our lines with the convalescents who had been taken outside before. He marched off the twelve men, and it then leaked out that they were to be sent to some prison to be held as hostages until the end of the war. Then I felt better. It is said all the sick will be taken outside as soon as they get quarters fixed up to accommodate them. Think that I shall resign my position as nurse. Would rather stay with the boys. Land is no longer with the sick, but has been turned into the rank and file, also Dakin. Dakin, Roe, and Land are all together, and if the sick are taken outside, I shall join my old comrades and mess with them. But few die now. Quite a number died from the removal, but now all seem to be on the mend. I am called, contrary to my expectations, a good nurse. Certainly have pity for the poor unfortunate, but lack the strength to take care of them. It needs good strong men to act as nurses. November 4. The fine weather still continues, just warm enough and favorable for prisoners. Food now we get but once a day, and not all we want, but three times as much as issued at Andersonville, and of good quality. The officer in command, as I have said before, is a kind-hearted man, and on his appearance inside he was besieged by hundreds of applications for favors and for the privilege of going outside on parole of honor. He began granting such favors as he could, but has been besieged too much and now stays outside. Has, however, put up a letter box on the inside so that letters will reach him, and every day it is filled half full. Occasionally he takes to a letter and sends inside for the writer of it, and that one answered is the occasion of a fresh batch, until it is said that the poor man is harassed about as much as the President of the United States is for fat offices. As I have before remarked in my diary, the Yankee is a queer animal. November 5. Hostages taken out. Everything is bright and pleasant, and I see no cause to complain, therefore won't. Tomorrow is election day at the North. Wish I was there to vote, which I ain't. Will here say that I am a war Democrat to the backbone. Not a very stiff one, as my backbone is weak. November 6. One year ago today captured. Presidential election at the North between Lincoln and McClellan. Someone fastened up a box and all requested to vote for the fun of the thing. Old prisoners haven't life enough to go and vote. New prisoners vote for present administration. I voted for McClellan with a hurrah, and another hurrah, and still another. Had this election occurred while we were at Andersonville, four-fifths would have voted for McClellan. We think ourselves shamefully treated in being left so long as prisoners of war. Abe Lincoln is a good man and a good president, but he is controlled by others who rule the exchange business as well as most other things. Of course, our likes and dislikes make no difference to him or anyone else. Yes, one year ago today captured. A year is a good while even when pleasantly situated, but how much longer being imprisoned as we have been. It seems a lifetime, and I am twenty years older than a year ago. Little thought that I was to remain all this time in durance vile. Improving in health, disposition, and everything else. If both breeches' legs were of the same length, would be supremely happy. Should make a bonfire tonight if I wasn't afraid of celebrating a defeat. Had lots of fun hurrahing for little Mac.
November 7. A rather cold rain wets all who have not shelter. Many ladies come to see us. Don't come through the gate, but look at us through that loophole. Anyone with money can buy extras in the way of food, but alas, we have no money. Am now quite a trader, that is, I make up a very thin dish of soup and sell it for ten cents, or trade it for something. Am ravenously hungry now and can't get enough to eat. The disease has left my system, the body demands food, and I have to exert my speculative genius to get it. Am quite a hand at such things and well calculated to take care of myself. A man belonging to the Masonic order need not stay here an hour. It seems as if every rebel officer was of that craft, and a prisoner has but to make himself known to be taken care of. Pretty strong secret association that will stand the fortunes of war. That is another thing I must do when I get home, join the Masons. No end of things for me to do. Visit all the foreign countries that prisoners told me about, and not forgetting to take in Boston, by the way, wear silk underclothing, join the Masons, and above all educate myself to keep out of rebel prisons. A person has plenty of time to think here, more so than in Andersonville. There it was business to keep alive. Small alligator killed at lower part of the stream. November 8. All eager for news. Seems as if we were on the eve of something. So quiet here that it must predict a storm. Once in a while some pesky rebel takes it upon himself to tell us a lot of lies to the effect that our armies are getting beaten, that England joins the Confederacy to wipe out the North, that there is no prospect of ending the war, that we are not going to be exchanged at all, but remain prisoners, etc., etc. If he is a good talker and tells his story well, it makes us all blue and downhearted. Then pretty soon we are told more joyful news, which we are ready to believe, and again take heart and think of the good times coming. Would like to hear the election news. Wonder who is elected. Feel stronger every day and have a little flesh on my bones. As the weather gets cool, we are made painfully aware of the fact that we are sadly deficient in clothing. Will freeze if compelled to stay through the winter. Coverlid still does duty, although disabled by past experience, same as all of us. We talk over the many good traits of Battese and others who are separated from us by death and otherwise. The exploits of Hendrix we will never tire of narrating. What a meeting when we can get together in future years and talk over the days we have lived and suffered together. Exchange rumors fill the air. One good sign, the rebels are making no more improvements about this prison. They say we are not to stay here long. We hear that our troops are marching all through the South. Guess that is the reason why they think of moving us all the time. All right, Johnny Rebels, hope we are an elephant on your hands. Jeff Davis denounced by the papers, which is a good sign. Occasionally get one in camp and read it all up. No library here, not a scrap of anything to read. Principal occupation, looking for stray news. November 9. This diary would seem to treat of two things principally, that of food and exchange. Try to write of something else, but my thoughts invariably turn to these two subjects. Prisoners of war will know how to excuse me for thus writing. A deadline has also been fixed up in Camp Lawton, but thus far no one has been shot. Rebel doctors inside examining men who may be troubled with disease prison life might aggravate. Those selected are taken outside and either put in hospitals or sent to our lines. Yankee ingenuity is brought into play to magnify diseases, and very often a thoroughly well man will make believe that he is going to die in less than a week unless taken away. Have laughed for an hour at the way a fellow by the name of Sawyer fooled them. The modus operandi will hardly bear writing in these pages, but will do to tell have made a raise of another pair of pants with both legs of the same length, and I discard the old ones to a poor prisoner. An advantage in the new pair is that there is plenty of room, too, for being three or four sizes too large, and the legs as long as the others were short. 
My one suspender has a partner now, and all runs smoothly. Although Bullock is fleshing out and getting better in health, he is a wreck and always will be. Seems to be a complete change in both body and mind. He was a favorite in our regiment, well-known and well-liked. Rowe is the same stiff, stern patrician as of old, calmly awaiting the next turn in the Wheel of Fortune. November 10. Pleasant and rather cool. My hair is playing me pranks. It grows straight up in the air and only on the topmost part of my head. Where a man is generally bald, it's right the other way with me. If there is anything else that can happen to make me any more ridiculous, now is the time for it to appear. About all I lack now is to have an eye gouged out. A friend says that the reason my hair grows the way it does is because I have been scared so much, and it has stuck up straight so much, that it naturally has a tendency that way. Perhaps that is it. If I thought we were to stay here for any length of time, would open up a hair-cutting shop, but should hate to get nicely started in business and a trade worked up, then have an exchange come along and knock the whole thing in the head. We are not far from the railroad track and can listen to the cars going by. Very often Confederate troops occupy them, and they give the old familiar rebel yell. Once in a while the Yanks get up steam enough to give a good hurrah back to them. Seems to be a good deal of transferring troops now in the South. I watch all the movements of the rebels and can draw conclusions and am of the opinion that Mr. Confederacy is about whipped and will soon surrender. It certainly looks that way to me. Rumors that we are to be moved. November 11. Very well fed. There it goes again. Had determined not to say anything more about how we were fed, and now I have done it. However, I was not grumbling about it anyway. We'll merely say that I have an appetite larger than an elephant. We'll also say that there are rumors of exchange. For a change, a subject that has been spoken of before. Cannot possibly refrain from saying that I am feeling splendidly and worth a hundred dead men yet. Have two dollars in Confederate money, and if I can sell this half canteen of dishwater soup, we'll have another dollar before dark. Who takes it? Ah, here you are. Sold again. Business closed for tonight, gentlemen. Early in the morning shall have a fresh supply of this delicious soup with real grease floating on top. Shutters put up and we settle down for the night without depositing in the bank. Shan't go to sleep until ten or eleven o'clock, but lay and think, and build those air castles that always fall with a crash and bury us in the debris. Often hear the baying of hounds from a distance through the night, and such strange sounds to the northern ear. Good night. In rather a sentimental mood, wonder if she is married. November 12. Everything quiet and running smoothly. Waiting for something. Have just heard the election news. Mr. Lincoln again elected and little Mac nowhere. Just about as I expected. Returns were rather slow in coming in, evidently waiting for the Camp Lawton vote. Well, did what I could for George. Hurrahed until my throat was sore and stayed so for a week know that I influenced twenty or thirty votes, and now can get no office because the political opponent was elected. Tis ever thus. Believe I would make a good postmaster for this place. There is none here, and should have applied immediately if my candidate had been elected. More sick taken away on the cars, rebels say to be exchanged. Appears to be a sort of mystery of late, and can't make head nor tail of their movements. Would not be surprised at any hour to receive news to get ready for our lines. Don't know that I have felt so before since my imprisonment. Have lived rather high today on capital made yesterday and early this morning. Just my way, make a fortune, and then spend it. November 13. Today had an incident happen to me. Hardly an incident, but a sort of an adventure. When I was nurse on one or two occasions, helped the hospital steward make out his report to his superiors, and in that way got a sort of reputation for knowing how to do these things a little better than the ordinary run of people, and rebels in particular. 
A rebel sergeant came inside at just about nine o'clock this morning and looked me up and said I was wanted outside and so went. Was taken to a house not far from the stockade, which proved to be the officer's headquarters. There introduced two, three or four officers, whose names do not occur to me, and informed that they were in need of someone to do writing and assist in making out their army papers, and if I would undertake the job they would see that I had plenty to eat, and I should be sent north at the first opportunity. I respectfully, gently, and firmly declined the honor, and after partaking of quite a substantial meal which they gave me thinking I would reconsider my decision, was escorted back inside. Many thought me very foolish for not taking up with the offer. My reasons for not doing so are these. I would be clearly working for the Confederacy, can see no real difference in it from actually entering their army. If I occupied that position, it would relieve some rebel of that duty, and he could stay in the ranks and fight our men. That is one reason. Another is the fact that, instead of their letting me go to our lines with the first that went, I would be the very last to go, as they would need me to do duty for them until the last moment. Was always willing to do extra duty for our own men, such as issuing clothing on Belle Isle, also my nursing the sick or in any way doing for them, but when it comes to working in any way for any rebel, I shall beg to be excused. Might have gone out and worked in the printing offices in Savannah, had I so wished, as they were short of men all the time, in fact could hardly issue their papers on account of the scarcity of printers. And so I am still loyal to the Stars and Stripes, and shall have no fears at looking my friends in the face when I do go home. November 14. The kaleidoscope has taken another turn. Six hundred taken away this forenoon. Don't know where to. As I was about the last to come to Millen, my turn will not come for some days, if only six hundred are taken out each day. Rebels say they go straight to our lines, but their being heavily guarded and every possible precaution taken to prevent their escape, it does not look like our lines to me probably go to Charleston, that seems to be the jumping-off place. Charleston, for some reason or other, seems a bad place to go to. Any city familiar with the war I want to avoid. Shall hang back as long as I can, content to let well enough alone. Some of my friends, of which Bullock is one, flanked out with those going off. What I mean by flanked out is crowding in when it is not their turn, and going with the crowd. Hendricks and I did that when we left Belle Isle, and we brought up in Andersonville. Well, let those do the flanking who want to. I don't. November 15. At about six or seven o'clock last night, six hundred men were taken away, making in all twelve hundred for the day. Another six hundred are ready to go at a moment's notice. I don't know what to think. Can hardly believe they go to our lines. Seems almost like a funeral procession to me as they go through the gate. Rowe and Hub Dakin talk of going today, if any go, having decided to flank. I have concluded to wait until it is my turn to go. If it is an exchange, there is no danger, but all will go, and if not an exchange, would rather be here than any place I know of now. Later. Eight hundred have gone, with Rowe and Dakin in the crowd, and I am here alone as regards personal friends, could not be induced to go with them, have a sort of presentiment that all is not right. Still later, six hundred more have gone, making twenty-six hundred altogether, that have departed, all heavily guarded. November 16. A decided thinness in our ranks this morning. Still housekeeping goes right along as usual. Rebels, not knowing how to figure, give us about the same for the whole prison as when all were here. Had a talk with a rebel sergeant for about an hour. Tried to find out our destination and could get no satisfaction, although he said we were going to our lines. Told him I was a mason, odd fellow, had every kind of religion in hopes to strike his, and flattered him until I was ashamed of myself. In a desultory sort of way, he said, Reckoned we were going north. 
Well, I will write down the solution I have at last come to, and we will see how near right I am after a little. Our troops, Sherman or Kilpatrick or some of them, are raiding through the South, and we are not safe in Millen, as we were not safe in Andersonville, and, as was painfully evident, we were not safe in Savannah. There is the whole thing in a nutshell, and we will see. Six hundred gone today. November 17. It is now said that the prisoners are being moved down on the coast near Florida. That coincides with my own view, and I think it very probable. We'll try and go about tomorrow. Hardly think I can go today. Later. Today's batch are going out of the gate. Makes me fairly crazy to wait. Fearful I am missing it in not going. This lottery way of living is painful on the nerves. There are all kinds of rumors. Even have the story afloat that now the raid is over, that drove us away from Andersonville, we are going back there to stay during the war. That would be a joke. However, I stick to my resolution that the rebels don't really know themselves where we are going. They move us because we are not safe here. They are bewildered. Believing this, am in a comparatively easy state of mind. Still, I worry. Haven't said a word in a week about my health. Well, I am convalescing all the time. Still lame and always expect to be. Can walk very well, though, and feeling lively for an old man. November 18. None being taken away today. I believe on account of not getting transportation. Notice that rebel troops are passing through on the railroad and immense activity among them. Am now well satisfied of the correctness of my views as regards this movement. Have decided now to stay here until the last. Am getting ready for action, however. Believe we are going to have a warm time of it in the next few months. Thank fortune I am as well as I am. Can stand considerable now. Food given us in smaller quantities, and hurriedly so, too. All appears to be in a hurry. Cloudy and rather wet weather, and getting decidedly cooler. My noble old coverlid is kept rolled up and ready to accompany me on my travels at any moment. Have my lame and stiff leg in training. Walk all over the prison until tired out so as to strengthen myself. Recruiting officers among us trying to induce prisoners to enter their army, say it is no exchange for during the war, and half a dozen desert and go with them. Even if we are not exchanged during the war, don't think we will remain prisoners long. November 19. A carload went at about noon and are pretty well thinned out. Over half gone, no one believes to our lines now, all hands afraid of going to Charleston. Believe I shall try and escape on the journey, although in no condition to rough it. Am going to engineer this thing to suit myself and have a little fun. Would like to be out from under rebel guard once more. When I can look around and not see a prison wall and a gun ready to shoot me, I shall rejoice. Have edged up to another comrade and we bunk together. Said comrade is Corporal Smith, belonging to an Indiana regiment. While he is no great guns, seems quite a sensible chap, and a decided improvement on many here to mess with. The nights are cool, and a covering of great benefit. My being the owner of a good blanket makes me a very desirable comrade to mess with. Two or three together can keep much warmer than one alone. It is said that a number of outsiders have escaped and taken to the woods. Another load goes tonight or early in the morning. My turn will come pretty soon. Nothing new in our situation or the prospects ahead. Food scarce, but of good quality. More go, and I go tomorrow. November 20. None as yet gone today, and it is already most night. My turn would not come until tomorrow, and if none go at all today, I will probably not get away until about day after tomorrow. Shan't flank out, but await my turn and go where fate decrees. Had a falling out with my companion Smith, and am again alone walking about the prison with my coverlid on my shoulders. 
am determined that this covering protects none but thoroughly good and square fellows. Later. Going to be a decidedly cold night and have made up with two fellows to sleep together. The going away is the all-absorbing topic of conversation. Received for rations this day a very good allowance of hardtack and bacon. This is the first hardtack received since the trip to Andersonville, and is quite a luxury. It is so hard that I have to tack round and soak mine up before I am able to eat it. There is a joke to this. Will again go to bed as I have done the last week, thinking every night would be the last at Camp Lawton. November 21. Got up bright and early, went to the creek and had a good wash, came back, after a good walk over the prison, and ate my two large crackers and small piece of bacon left over from yesterday, and again ready for whatever may turn up. Lost my diminutive cake of soap in the water, and must again take to sand to scrub with, until fortune again favors me. Men are very restless and reckless, uncertainty making them so. Try my very best not to have any words or trouble with them, but occasionally get drawn into it, as I did this morning. Came out solid, however. It is pretty well understood that I can take care of myself. Noon. Five hundred getting ready to go. My turn comes tomorrow, and then we will see what we will see. Decided rumors that Sherman has taken Atlanta and is marching towards Savannah, the heart of the Confederacy. All in good spirits for the first time in a week. November 22. And now my turn has come, and I get off with the next load going today. My trunk is packed and baggage duly checked. Shall try and get a layover ticket and rusticate on the road. We'll see the conductor about it. A nice cool day with sun shining brightly. A fit one for an adventure, and I am just the boy to have one. Coverlid folded up and thrown across my shoulder, lower end tied as only a soldier knows how. My three large books of written matter on the inside of my thick rebel jacket, and fastened in. Have a small book which I keep at hand to write in now. My old hat has been exchanged for a red zouave cap, and I look like a red-headed woodpecker. Leg behaving beautifully. My latest comrades are James Reddy and Bill Somebody. We have decided to go and keep together on the cars. One of them has an apology for a blanket, and the two acting in conjunction keep all three warm nights. Later, on the cars, in vicinity of Savannah en route for Blackshear, which is pretty well south and not far from the Florida line, are very crowded in a close box car and fearfully warm, try to get away tonight. In the woods near Doctortown Station No. 5, Georgia, November 23. A change has come over the spirit of my dreams. During the night the cars ran very slow, and sometimes stopped for hours on side tracks. A very long, tedious night, and all suffered a great deal, with just about standing room only. Impossible to get any sleep. Two guards at each side door, which were open about a foot. Guards were passably decent, although strict managed to get near the door, and during the night talked considerable with the two guards on the south side of the car. At about three o'clock this a.m., and after going over a long bridge which spanned the Altamaha River and in sight of Doctortown, I went through the open door like a flash and rolled down a high embankment. Almost broke my neck, but not quite. Guard fired a shot at me, but as the cars were going, though not very fast, did not hit me. Expected the cars to stop, but they did not, and I had the inexpressible joy of seeing them move off out of sight. Then, across the railroad track going north, went through a large open field and gained the woods, and am now sitting on the ground, leaning up against a big pine tree, and out from under rebel guard. The sun is beginning to show itself in the east, and it promises to be a fine day. Hardly know what to do with myself. If those on the train notify Doctortown people of my escape, they will be after me. 
think it was at so early an hour that they might have gone right through without telling any one of the jump off am happy and hungry and considerably bruised and scratched up from the escape the happiness of being here however overbalances everything else if i had george hendrix with me now would have a jolly time and mean to have as it is sun is now up and it is warmer birds chippering around and chipmunks looking at me with curiosity can hear hallooing off a mile or so which sounds like farmers calling cattle or hogs or something all nature smiles why should not i and i do keep my eyes peeled however and look all ways for sunday must work farther back toward what i take to be a swamp a mile or so away am in a rather low country although apparently a pretty thickly settled one most too thickly populated for me judging from the signs of the times it's now about dinner time and i have traveled two or three miles from the railroad track should judge and am in the edge of a swampy forest although the piece of ground on which i have made my bed is dry and nice something to eat wouldn't be a bad thing not over sixty rods from where i lay is a path evidently traveled more or less by negroes going from one plantation to another my hope of food lays by that road am watching for passers-by later a negro boy too young to trust has gone by singing and whistling and carrying a bundle and a tin pail evidently filled with somebody's dinner inasmuch as i want to enjoy this out-of-door gypsy life i will not catch and take the dinner away from him that would be the height of foolishness will lay for the next one travelling this way the next one is a dog and he comes up and looks at me gives a bark and scuds off can't eat a dog don't know how it will be tomorrow though might be well enough for him to come around later well it is most dark and will get ready to try and sleep have broken off spruce boughs and made a soft bed have heard my father tell of sleeping on a bed of spruce and it is healthy we'll try it not a crust to eat since yesterday forenoon am educated to this way of living though and have been hungrier hope the pesky alligators will let me alone if they only knew it i would make a poor meal for them thus closes my first day of freedom and it is grand only hope they may be many although i can hardly hope to escape to our lines not being in a condition to travel november twenty four another beautiful morning a repetition of yesterday opens up to me it is particularly necessary that i procure sustenance wherewith life is prolonged and will change my headquarters to a little nearer civilization can hear someone chopping not a mile away here goes later found an old negro fixing up a dilapidated post and rail fence approached him and inquired the time of day my own watch having run down he didn't happen to have his gold watch with him but reckoned it was nigh time for the horn seemed scared at the apparition that appeared to him and no wonder forgave him on the spot thought it policy to tell him all about who and what i was and did so was very timid and afraid but finally said he would divide his dinner as soon as it should be sent to him and for an hour i lay off a distance of twenty rods or so waiting for that dinner it finally came brought by the same boy i saw go along yesterday boy sat down the pail and the old darky told him to scamper off home which he did then we had dinner of rice cold yams and fried bacon it was a glorious repast and i succeeded in getting quite well acquainted with him we are on the bowden plantation and he belongs to a family of that name is very fearful of helping me as his master is a strong secesh and he says would whip him within an inch of his life if it was known promise him not to be seen by any one and he has promised to get me something more to eat after it gets dark later after my noonday meal went back toward the low ground and waited for my supper which came half an hour ago and it is not yet dark had a good supper of boiled seasoned turnips cornbread and sour milk the first milk i have had in about a year 
begs me to go off in the morning, which I have promised to do, says for me to go two or three miles on to another plantation owned by Le Cleve, where there are good negroes who will feed me. Thanked the old fellow for his kindness, says the war is about over and the Yanks expected to free them all soon. It's getting pretty dark now, and I go to bed filled to overflowing. In fact, most too much so. November 25. This morning got up cold and stiff, not enough covering, pushed off in the direction pointed out by the darky of yesterday, have come in the vicinity of negro shanties and laying in wait for some good benevolent colored brother, most too many dogs yelping around to suit a runaway Yankee. Little nigs and the canines run together. If I can only attract their attention without scaring them to death, shall be all right. However, there is plenty of time and won't rush things. Time is not valuable with me. We'll go sure and careful. Don't appear to be any men folks around, more or less women of all shades of color. This is evidently a large plantation, has thirty or forty negro huts in three or four rows. They are all neat and clean to outward appearances. In the far distance and toward what I take to be the main road is the master's residence, can just see a part of it, has a cupola on top and is an ancient structure. Evidently a nice plantation. Lots of cactus grows wild all over and is bad to tramp through. There is also whirls of palm leaves such as five-cent fans are made of. Hold on there, two or three negro men are coming from the direction of the big house to the huts. Don't look very inviting to trust your welfare with. We'll still wait, macabre-like, for something to turn up. If they only knew the designs I have on them, they would turn pale. Shall be ravenous by night and go for them. I am near a spring of water and lay down flat and drink. The Astor House mess is moving around for a change. Hope I won't make a mess of it. A lot of goats looking at me now, wondering, I suppose, what it is. Wonder if they butt. Shoo! Going to rain, and if so, I must sleep in one of those shanties. Negroes all washing up and getting ready to eat with doors open. No thank you. Dined yesterday. Am reminded of the song, What shall we do when the war breaks the country up and scatters us poor darkies all around? This getting away business is about the best investment I ever made. Just the friendliest fellow ever was. More than like a colored man, and will stick closer than a brother if they will only let me. Laugh when I think of the old darky of yesterday's experience, who liked me first rate, only wanted me to go away. Have an eye on an isolated hut that looks friendly. Shall approach it at dark. People at the hut are a woman and two or three children and a jolly-looking and acting negro man. Being obliged to lay low in the shade, feel the cold, as it is rather damp and moist. Later. Am in the hut and have eaten a good supper. Shall sleep here tonight. The negro man goes early in the morning, together with all the male darky population, to work on fortifications at Fort McAllister says the whole country is wild at the news of approaching Yankee army. Negro man named Sam and woman Sadie. Two or three Negroes living here in these huts are not trustworthy, and I must keep very quiet and not be seen. Children perfectly awestruck at the sight of a Yankee. Negroes very kind, but afraid. Criminal to assist me. Am five miles from Doctor Town. Plenty of goobers and yams. Tell them all about my imprisonment. Regard the Yankees as their friends. Half a dozen neighbors come in by invitation, shake hands with me, scrape the floor with their feet, and rejoice most to death at the good times coming. Breast a Lord has been repeated hundreds of times in the two or three hours I have been here. Surely I have fallen among friends. All the visitors donate of their eatables, and although enough is before me to feed a dozen men, I give it a tussle. Thus ends the second day of my freedom, and it is glorious. November 26. An hour before daylight, Sam awoke me and said I must go with him off a ways to stay through the day. Got up and we started. 
came about a mile to a safe hiding place, and here I am. Have plenty to eat and near good water. Sam will tell another trusty negro of my whereabouts, who will look after me as he has to go away to work. The negroes are very kind, and I evidently am in good hands. Many of those who will not fight in the Confederate Army are hid in these woods and swamps, and there are many small squads looking them up with dogs and guns to force them into the rebel ranks. All able-bodied men are conscripted into the army in the South. It is possible I may be captured by some of these hunting parties. It is again most night and have eaten the last of my food. Can hear the baying of hounds and am skeery shall take in all the food that comes this way in the meantime. Sam gave me an old jackknife, and I shall make a good bed to sleep on, and I also have an additional part of a blanket to keep me warm. In fine spirits, and have hopes for the future, expect an ambassador from my colored friends a little later. Later. The ambassador has come and gone in the shape of a woman, brought food, a man told her to tell me to go off a distance of two miles or so to the locality pointed out before daylight and wait there until called upon tomorrow. Rebel guards occupy the main roads and very unsafe. November 27. Before daylight came where I am now. Saw alligators, small ones. This out in the woods life is doing me good. Main road three miles away, but there are paths running everywhere. Saw a white man an hour ago, think he was a skulker, hiding to keep out of the army, but afraid to hail him. Many of these stay in the woods daytimes and at night go to their homes getting food. Am now away quite a distance from any habitation, and am afraid that those who will look for me cannot find me. Occasionally hear shots fired. This is a dangerous locality. Have now been out four days and fared splendidly have hurt one of my ankles getting through the brush, sort of sprain and difficult to travel at all. No water nearby and must move as soon as possible. Wild hogs roam about through the woods and can run like a deer. Palm leaves grow in great abundance and are handsome to look at, some of them very large. Occasionally see lizards and other reptiles and am afraid of them, if I was a good traveler, I could get along through the country and possibly to our lines. Must wander around and do the best I can, however. Am armed with my good stout cane and the knife given me by the negro. Have also some matches, but dare not make a fire lest it attract attention. Nights have to get up occasionally and stamp around to get warm. Clear, cool nights and pleasant. Most too light, however, for me to travel. The remnants of yesterday's food have just eaten. Will now go off in an easterly direction in hopes of seeing the messenger. November 28. No one has come to me since the day before yesterday. Watched and moved until most night of yesterday, but could see or hear no one. Afraid I have lost communication. In the distance can see a habitation and will move along that way. Most noon. Later, as I was poking along through some light timber, almost ran into four Confederates with guns. Lay down close to the ground, and they passed by me not more than twenty rods away. Think they have heard of my being in the vicinity and looking me up. This probably accounts for not receiving any visitor from the Negroes. Getting very hungry and no water fit to drink. Must get out of this community as fast as I can. Wish to gracious I had two good legs. Later. It is now nearly dark, and I have worked my way as near direct north as I know how. Am at least four miles from where I lay last night. Have seen negroes and white men, but did not approach them. Am completely tired out and hungry, but on the edge of a nice little stream of water. The closing of the fifth day of my escape. Must speak to somebody tomorrow or starve to death. Good deal of yelling in the woods. Am now in the rear of a hovel, which is evidently a negro hut, but off quite a ways from it. Cleared ground all around the house, so I can't approach it without being too much in sight. Small negro boy playing around the house. Too dark to write more. November 29. 
the sixth day of freedom and a hungry one still where i wrote last night and watching the house a woman goes out and in but cannot tell much about her from this distance no men folks around two or three negro boys playing about must approach the house but hate to noon still right here hold my position more than hungry three days since i have eaten anything with the exception of a small potato and piece of bread eaten two days ago and left from the day before that length of time would have been nothing in andersonville but now being in better health demand eatables and it takes right hold of this wandering sinner shall go to the house towards night a solitary woman lives there with some children my ankle from the sprain and yesterday's walking is swollen and painful bathe it in water which does it good chickens running around have serious meditations of getting hold of one or two of them before they go to roost then go farther back into the wilderness build a fire with my matches and cook them that would be a royal feast but if caught at it it would be harder with me than if caught legitimately presume this is the habitation of some of the skulkers who return and stay home nights believe that chickens squawk when being taken from the roost will give that up and walk boldly up to the house dr town station number five november thirty ha ha my boy you are a prisoner of war again once more with a blasted rebel standing guard over me and it all happened in this wise just before dark i went up to that house i spoke of in my writings yesterday walked boldly up and rapped at the door and what was my complete astonishment when a white woman answered my rapping asked me what i wanted and i told her something to eat told me to come in and sat down she was a dark-looking woman and could easily be mistaken from my hiding-place of the day for a negro began asking me questions told her i was a rebel soldier had been in the hospital sick and was trying to reach home in the adjoining county was very talkative told how her husband had been killed at atlanta and so forth she would go out and in from a shanty kitchen in her preparation of my supper i looked out through a window and saw a little darky riding away from the house a few minutes after i went inside thought i had walked into a trap and was very uneasy still the woman talked and worked and i talked telling as smooth lies as i knew how for a full hour and a half sat there and she all the time getting supper made up my mind that i was the same as captured and so put on a bold face and made the best of it was very well satisfied with my escapade anyway if i could only get a whack at that supper before the circus commenced well after a while heard some hounds coming through the woods and towards the house looked at the woman and her face pleaded guilty just as if she had done something very mean the back door of the house was open and pretty soon half a dozen large bloodhounds bounded into the room and began snuffling me over about this time the woman began to cry told her i understood the whole thing and she need not make a scene over it said she knew i was a yankee and had sent for some men at doctor town then five horsemen surrounded the house, dismounted, and four of them came in with guns cocked, prepared for a desperate encounter. I said, "'Good evening, gentlemen.' Uh, "'Good evening,' said the foremost. "'We are looking for a runaway Yankee prowling around here.' "'Well,' says I, "'you needn't look any farther. You have found him.' "'Yes, I see,' was the answer. They all sat down, and just then the woman said, "'Supper is ready, and to draw nigh.' drawed as nigh as i could to that supper and proceeded to take vengeance on the woman the fellows proved to be home guards stationed here at doctor town the woman had mounted the negro boy on a horse just as soon as i made my appearance at the house and sent for them they proved to be good fellows talked there at the house a full hour on the fortunes of war and so on told them of my long imprisonment and escape and all about myself after a while we got ready to start for this place one rebel rode in front one on each side and two in the rear of me was informed that if i tried to run away they would shoot me told them no danger of my running as i could hardly walk 
They soon saw that such was the case after going a little way, and sent back one of the men to borrow the woman's horse, was put on the animal's back, and we reached Doctor Town not far from midnight. As we were leaving the house, the woman gave me a bundle, said in it was a shirt and stockings, told her she had injured me enough and I would take them. No false delicacy will prevent my taking a shirt, and so my adventure has ended and have enjoyed it hugely, had plenty to eat with the exception of the two days and at the last had a horseback ride, how well I was reminded of my last ride when first taken prisoner and at the time I got the cover lid. In the bundle was a good white shirt, pair of stockings, and a chunk of dried beef of two pounds or so. One of the captors gave me ten dollars in Confederate money. Now am in an old vacant building and guarded, and it is the middle of the afternoon. Many citizens have visited me, and I tell the guard he ought to charge admission, money in it. Some of the callers bring food and are allowed to give it to me, and am stocked with more than can conveniently carry. Have had a good wash-up, put on my clean white shirt with standing collar and new stockings, and am happy. Dr. Town is a small village with probably six or eight hundred population, and nigger young ones by the scores. Am treated kindly and well, and judge from conversations that I hear that the battles are very disastrous to the rebels, and that the war is pretty well over. All the negroes are hard pressed, fortifying every available point to contest the advance of the Union army. This is cheering news to me. My escape has given me confidence in myself, and I shall try it again the first opportunity. A woman has just given me a bottle of milk and two dollars in money. Thanked her with my heart in my mouth. Having been captured and brought to this place, am here waiting for them to get instructions as to what they shall do with me. They say I will probably be sent to the prison at Blackshear, which is forty or fifty miles away. Think I should be content to stay here with plenty to eat. Am in a good clean room in a dwelling can talk with any one who chooses to come and see me. The room was locked during the night, and this morning was thrown open, and I can wander through three rooms. Guard is off a few rods where he can see all around the house. Occasionally I go outdoors and am having a good time. Later, having seen a Savannah paper which says Sherman and his hosts are marching toward that city, and for the citizens to rally to repel the invader. My swollen ankle is being rubbed today with ointment furnished by an old darky. I tell you there are humane people the world over who will not see even an enemy suffer if they can help it. While I have seen some of the worst people in the South, I have also seen some of the very best, and those too who were purely Southern people and rebels. There are many pleasant associations connected with my prison life, as well as some directly to the opposite. December 1. Still at Doctor Town, and the town is doctoring me up right smart. There is also a joke to this, but a weak one. The whole town are exercised over the coming of the Yankee army, and I laugh in my sleeve. Once in a while some poor ignorant and bigoted fellow amuses himself, cursing me and the whole U.S. army. Won't talk back much, having too much regard for my bodily comfort. Orders have come to put me on a train for Blackshear. Have made quite a number of friends here who slyly talk to me encouragingly. There are many Union people all through the South, although they have not dared to express themselves as such, but now they are more decided in their expressions and actions. Have a canteen of milk and many other luxuries. Darkies are profuse in their gifts of small things, have now a comb, good jackknife, and many little knick-knacks. One old negress brought me a chicken nicely roasted. Think of that, prisoners of war, roast chicken. Shall jump off the cars every twenty rods hereafter. Tried to get a paper of the guard who was reading the latest, but he wouldn't let me see it. Looks rather blue himself, and I surmise there is something in it which he don't like. All right, old fellow, my turn will come some day. Young Darkey brought me a cane, which is an improvement on my old one. Walk now the length of my limit with an old-fashioned crook cane, and feel quite proud. 
later got all ready to take a train due at three thirty and it didn't stop must wait until morning hope they don't stop for a month blackshear georgia december two in with the same men whom i deserted on the cars we are near the florida line was put in a passenger train at doctortown and rode in style to this place on the train were two more yanks named david and eli s buck who are michigan men they were runaways who had been out in the woods nearly three months and were inside of our gunboats when recaptured belonged to the sixth michigan cavalry david buck was one of kilpatrick's scouts a very smart and brave fellow understands living in the woods and thoroughly posted we have mutually agreed to get away the first chance and shall get to our lines david buck used to attend school at leone michigan and was educated for a preacher they are cousins we three yankees are quite a curiosity to the passengers on the train that brought us to this place some of them had evidently never seen a yankee before and we were stared at for all we were worth some smarties were anxious to argue the point with us in a rather we have got you style david buck is a good talker and satisfactorily held up our end of the war question in fact i thought talked them all out on their own grounds the ladies in particular sneered and stared at us occasionally we saw some faces which looked as if they were union and we often got a kind word from some of them the railroads are in a broken-down condition out of decent repair and trains run very slow the confederacy is most assuredly hard up and will go to pieces some of these days my outdoor life of the few days i roamed through the woods was just jolly being out from under rebel guard made me the happiest chap imaginable knew that i couldn't escape to our lines as i was not able to travel much and my sole business was to remain a tramp as long as possible and to get enough to eat which i did the negroes and especially the field hands are all union darkies and fed me all i wanted as a general thing made a mistake in going to the house of a white woman for food december three blackshear is an out-of-the-way place and shouldn't think the yankee army would ever find us here the climate is delightful here it is december and at the north right in the middle of winter and probably good sleighing and cold while here it is actually warm during the daytime and at night not uncomfortably cold the buck boys are jolly good fellows and full of fun seem to have taken a new lease of life myself both of them are in good health and fleshy and open for an escape any hour and we don't stay here but a few days the guards say why not keep us on the cars and run us around the country all the time there is no wall or anything around us here only guards encamped right in the open air have food once a day just whatever they have to give us last night had sweet potatoes i am getting considerably heavier in weight and must weigh one hundred and forty pounds or more still lame however and i fear permanently so teeth are firm in my mouth now and can eat as well as ever and oh such an appetite would like to see the pile of food that i couldn't eat found roe and bullock and hub dakin they are well and all live in jolly expectancy of the next move the old coverlid still protects my person the bucks have also each a good blanket and we are comfortable some fresh beef given us today not much but suppose all they have got guard said he wished to god he was one of us prisoners instead of guarding us december four another delightfully cool morning there are not a great many guards here to watch over us and it would be possible for all to break away without much trouble the men however are so sure of liberty that they prefer to wait until given legitimately would like to have seen this guard hold us last summer at andersonville fresh meat again today rebels go out to neighboring plantations and take cattle drive them here and butcher for us to eat rice is also given us to eat have plenty of wood to cook with have traded off the old mismated pair of brogans for a smaller and good pair and feel quite like a dandy have some money to buy extras 
have plenty of food yet from that given me at doctor town divide with the bucks or rather it is all one common mess and what any one owns belongs equally to the others rebels glum and cross and sometimes we laugh at them and then they swear and tell us to shut up or they will blow our heads off blackshear is a funny name and it is a funny town if there is any for as yet i haven't been able to see it probably a barn and a hen coop comprise the place cars go thundering by as if the yanks were after them about every train loaded with troops go first one way and then the other think they are trying to keep out of the way themselves december five guards said that orders were not to talk with any of the prisoners and above all not to let us get hold of any newspapers no citizens are allowed to come near us that shows which way the wind blows half a dozen got away from here last night and guards more strict to-day with an increased force going to be moved it is said in a few days why don't they run us right into the ocean that wouldn't do though our gunboats are there well keep us then that is punishment enough do what you are a mind to you dare not starve us now for we would break away in fact although under guard we are masters of the situation can see an old darkey with an ox hitched to a cart with harness on the cart loaded with sugar-cane this is quite a sugar country it is said on the road here saw the famous palmetto tree in groves live oaks are scattered all over and are a funny affair persimmon and pecan trees also abound here we are pretty well south now spending the winter but few die now no more than would naturally die in any camp with the same numbers it is said that some men get away every night and it is probably so december six thirteen months ago to-day captured one year and one month must be something due me from uncle sam and wages by this time all come in a lump when it does come no great loss without small gain and while i have been suffering the long imprisonment my wages have been accumulating believe that we are also entitled to ration money while in prison pile it on you can't pay us any too much for this business this is the land of the bloodhound are as common as the ordinary cur in the north are a noble-looking dog except when they are after you and then they are beastly should think that any one of them could whip a man are very large strong and savage-looking should think it would be hard for the negro to run away see no horses about here at all all mules and oxen and even cows hitched up to draw loads i walk the prison over forty times a day everybody knows me and i hail and am hailed as i walk around and am asked what i think of the situation tell them of my escape and the good time i had which incites them to do likewise the first opportunity occasionally a man here who growls and grumbles and says and thinks we will never get away and so forth some would find fault if they were going to be hung should think they would compare their condition with that of six months ago and be contented december seven another day of smiling weather still call our mess the astor house mess it is composed of only three the bucks and myself i am the only one of the original mess here and it is still the most prosperous and best fed of any we are all the time at work at something have a good piece of soap and have washed our clothing throughout and are clean and neat for prisoners of war eli s buck is a large fellow and a farmer when at home both are young and from the same neighborhood as i have said before are cousins and think a great deal of one another which is good to see relatives rarely get along together in prison as well as those who are not related there were brothers in andersonville who would not mess together seems funny but such is the case should like to see myself throwing over a brother for any one else guards denounce jeff davis as the author of their misfortunes we also denounce him as the author of ours so we are agreed on one point going to move the mess will escape en masse at the first move just for the sake of roaming the woods with the bucks in company with me shall have a good time and we can undoubtedly soon reach our troops in as much as they are raiding through the south dave buck is the acknowledged leader of us 
He prays. Think of that. December 8. There are many men of many minds here. That used to be a favorite copy at writing school in Jackson, Michigan. Many men of many minds, many birds of many kinds. How a person's thoughts go back to the old boyhood days in such a place as this. Happiest times of life are those of youth, but we didn't know it. Everybody told us so, but we didn't believe it, but now it is plain. Everyone, I think, has that experience. We all see where we might have done different if we had only had our lives to live over, but alas, it is not to be. A majority of the men here have about half enough to eat. Our mess has enough to eat, thanks to our own ingenuity. Now expect to go away from here every day. Have borrowed a needle, begged some thread, and have been sewing up my clothing. Am well fixed up, as are also the bucks. Am quite handy with the needle, and it is difficult to make some of them believe I am not a tailor by trade. If I always keep my ways mended as I do my clothes, I shall get along very well. Eli has come with four large yams bought of a guard, and we will proceed to cook and eat a good supper, and then go to bed and perhaps dream of something pleasant to remember the next day. Rumors of all kinds in camp and rebels say something is up that will interest us, but I can get no satisfaction as to what it is. Drew cuts for the extra potato, and Dave won, and he cut the article of food into three pieces, and we all had a share. Good boy. December 9. Still at Blackshear, and quiet. Many incidents happened when I was out in the wood, and I am just crazy to get there once more. Look at the tall trees in sight, and could hug them. My long sickness, and the terrible place in which I was confined so long, and my recovering health, and the hope now of getting entirely well and recovering my liberty, has made a new man of me a new lease of life, as it were. The bucks are the best of fellows, and having money which they use for my benefit the same as their own, we get along swimmingly. One of these days my northern friends and relatives will hear from me, am getting over my lameness, and have an appetite for more than my supply of food, certainly had a good constitution to stand all that has been passed through, during which time thousands and thousands died of apparently better health than myself. Of all my many messmates and friends in prison have lost track of them all. Some died, in fact nearly all, and the balance scattered, the Lord only knows where. What stories we can talk over when we meet in the north! This Blackshear country is rather a nice section. Warm and pleasant, although rather low. Don't know where we are located, but must not be far from the coast. December 10. The grand change has come, and a carload of prisoners go away from here today. Although the Bucks and myself were the last in prison, we are determined to flank out and go with the first that go. Our destination is probably Charleston, from what I can learn. We three will escape on the road, or make a desperate effort to do so, anyway. Can walk much better now than ten days ago, and feel equal to the emergency. Fine weather, and in good spirits, although many here are tired of being moved from place to place. More guards have come to take charge of us on the road, and it looks very discouraging for getting away, although Dave says we will make it all right. Place great reliance on him, as he has caution as well as the intention to escape. So like Hendrix, and added to it has more practical, quiet common sense. Eli Buck and myself acknowledge him as leader in all things. Now comes the tug of war. December 11. We flanked out this morning, or rather paid three fellows two dollars apiece for their turn to go. Are now thirty miles from Blackshear have been unloaded from the cars, and are encamped by the side of the railroad track for the night. Most dark. Rebel soldiers going by on the trains with hoots and yells. We are strongly guarded, and it augurs not for us to get away tonight. Our best hold is jumping from the cars. Ride on open platform cars with guards standing and sitting on the sides, six guards to each car. About sixty prisoners ride in each car, and there are thirty or forty cars. We're given rations yesterday, but none today. 
It is said we get nothing to eat to-night, which is bad, more so for the other prisoners than ourselves. Low country we come through and swampy. Bucks think we may get away before morning, but I doubt it. Rebs flying around lively and Yanks going for them, I guess. December 12. Routed up at an early hour and loaded on to the cars, which stood upon a side-track, and after being loaded have been here for six mortal hours. Small rations given us just before loading up. All are cramped up and mad. We will more than jump the first opportunity. We go to Charleston via Savannah. Wish they would hurry up their old vehicles for transportation. Being doubled up like a jackknife makes my legs stiff and sore, and difficult to use my limbs from cramped position. Worth four hundred dollars a day to see the rebel troops fly around. Would give something to know the exact position now of both armies. Guards are sleepy and tired out from doing double duty, and I think we can get away if they move us by night, which I am afraid they won't do. Bucks jubilant and confident, consequently, so am I. In the Woods, December 13. How does that sound for a location to date from? Yesterday, long toward night, our train started from its abiding place and rolled slowly toward its destination, wherever that might be. When near Savannah, not more than a mile this side, David Buck jumped off the cars and rolled down the bank. I jumped next, and Eli Buck came right after me. Hastily got up and joined one another and hurried off in an easterly direction through the wet, swampy country. A number of shots were fired at us, but we were surprised and glad to find that none hit us, although my cap was knocked off by a bullet hitting the forepiece. Eli Buck was also singed by a bullet. It seemed as if a dozen shots were fired. Train did not stop, and we ran until tired out knew that we were within a line of forts which encircle Savannah, going all the way around it, and only twenty rods or so apart. It was dark when we jumped off, and we soon came in the vicinity of a schoolhouse in which was being held a Negro prayer meeting. We peeked in at the windows, but dared not stop so near our jumping-off place, worked around until we were near the railroad again and guided by the track going south, the same way we had come. It was very dark. Dave Buck went ahead, Eli next, and myself last, going Indian file and very slow. All at once Dave stopped and whispered to us to keep still, which you may be sure we did. Had come within ten feet of a person who was going directly in the opposite direction, and also stopped at the same time we did. Dave Buck says, Who comes there? A Negro woman says, It's me and he walked up close to her and asked where she was going. She says, Oh, I knows you. You are Yankees and has jumped off to cause. By this time we had come up even with Dave and the woman, owned up to her that such was the case. She said we were her friends and would not tell of us, also said that not twenty rods ahead there was a rebel picket, and we were going right into them. I think if I ever wanted to kiss a woman it was that poor black negro wench. She told us to go about thirty rods away and near an old shed, and she would send us her brother. He would know what to do. We went to the place designated and waited there an hour, and then we saw two dusky forms coming through the darkness, and between them a wooden tray of food consisting of boiled turnips, cornbread, and smoked bacon. We lay there behind that old shed and ate and talked and talked and ate for a full hour more. The negro, Major, said he was working on the forts, putting them in order to oppose the coming of the Yankees, and he thought he could get us through the line before morning to a safe hiding place. If we all shook hands once, we did fifty times all around. The negroes were fairly jubilant at being able to help genuine Yankees, were very smart colored people, knowing more than the ordinary run of their race. Major said that in all the forts was a reserve picket force, and between the forts the picket. He said pretty well south was a dilapidated fort, which had not as yet been repaired any, and that was the one to go through or near, as he did not think there was any picket there. "'Breath de Lord for your safety,' says the good woman. 
We ate all they brought us and then started under the guidance of Major at somewhere near midnight. Walked slow and by a roundabout way to get to the fort and was a long time about it, going through a large turnip patch and over and through hedges. Major's own safety as much as ours depended upon the trip. Finally came near the fort and discovered there were rebels inside and a picket off but a few yards. Major left us and crawled slowly ahead to reconnoiter, returned in a few minutes and told us to follow. We all climbed over the side of the fort, which was very much out of repair. The reserve picket was asleep around a fire which had nearly gone out. Major piloted us through the fort, actually stepping over the sleeping rebels. After getting on the outside, there was a wide ditch which we went through. Ditch was partially full of water. We then went way round near the railroad again and started south, guided by the darkey, who hurried us along at a rapid gait. By near daylight we were five or six miles from Savannah and then stopped for consultation and rest. Finally went a mile further where we are now laying low in a swamp, pretty well tired out and muddy beyond recognition. Major left us at daylight, saying he would find us a guide before night who would show us still further. He had to go back and work on the forts. And so I am again loose, a free man, with the same old feeling I had when in the woods before. We got out of a thick, settled country safely, and again await developments. Heard drums and bugles playing reveille this morning in many directions, and we are all surrounded. Dave Buck is very confident of getting away to our lines. Eli thinks it is so if Dave says so, and I don't know or care so very much. The main point with me is to stay out in the woods as long as I can. My old legs have had a hard time of it since last night, and ache, and are very lame. It's another beautiful and cold day this 13th of December, biting frost nights, but warmer in the daytime. Our plan is to work our way to the Ogechee River and wait for the Stars and Stripes to come to us. Major said Sherman was marching right toward us all the time, driving the rebel army with no trouble at all. Told us to keep our ears open and we would hear cannon one of these days, possibly within a week. The excitement of the last twenty-four hours has worn me out, and I couldn't travel today if it was necessary. Have a plenty to eat, and for a wonder I ain't hungry for anything except things we haven't got. Dave is happy as an oyster and wants to yell. Where they are so confident, I am satisfied all will be well. As soon as it comes night, we are going up to some negro huts less than a mile off, where we hope and expect that Major has posted the inmates in regard to us. The railroad is only a short distance off, and the river only three or four miles. As near as we know, are about twenty miles from the Atlantic coast. Tell the boys it may be necessary for me to stay here for two or three days to get recruited up, but they think three or four miles tonight will do me good. Don't like to burden them, and shall try it. December 14. We are now three miles from yesterday's resting place, and near the Miller Plantation. Soon as dark last night, we went to the Negro huts and found them expecting us. Had a jubilee. No whites near, but all away. The Buck Boys passed near here before when out in the woods, and knew of many darkies who befriended them. Had a surfeit of food. Stayed at the huts until after midnight, and then a woman brought us to this place. Tonight we go to Jocko's hut across the river. A darky will row us across the little Ogochi to Jocko's hut, and then he will take us in tow. It is a rice country about here, with canals running every way. Negroes all tickle to death because Yankees coming. I am feeling better than yesterday, but difficult to travel. Tell the boys they had better leave me with the friendly blacks and go ahead to our lines, but they won't. Plenty to eat and milk to drink, which is just what I want. The whites now are all away from their homes and most of the negroes. Imagine we can hear the booming of cannon, but guess we are mistaken. Dave is very entertaining and good company. Don't get tired of him and his talk. Both of them are in rebel dress throughout and can talk and act just like rebels. Know the commanders of different rebel regiments. 
they say that when out before they on different occasions mixed with the southern army without detection said they didn't wonder the widow woman knew i was a yankee ain't up to that kind of thing december fifteen jocko's hut was not across the river as i supposed and wrote yesterday but on the same side we were on at about ten o'clock last night we went to his abiding place as directed and knocked after a long time an old black head was stuck out of the window with a nightcap on the owner of the head didn't know jocko or anything about him was short and crusty said go away from dar kept talking to him and he scolding at being disturbed said he had rheumatics and couldn't get out to let us in after a long time opened the door and we sat down on the doorstep told him we were yankees and wanted help was the funniest darker we have met yet would give something for his picture as he was framed in his window in the moonlight talking to us with the picturesque surroundings and us yankees trying to win him over to aid us finally owned up that he was jocko but said he couldn't row us across the river he was lame and could not walk had no boat and if he had the river was so swift he couldn't get us across and if it wasn't swift the rebels would catch him at it and hang him talked a long time and with much teasing by degrees his scruples gave way one at a time didn't know but he might row us across if only he had a boat and finally didn't know but he could find a boat to get thus far into his good graces took at least three hours went looking around and found an old scow fixed up some old oars and we got in before doing so however he had warmed up enough to give us some boiled sweet potatoes and cold baked fish rode us way down the river and landed us on the noted miller plantation and a mile in rear of the negro houses jocko after we forced our acquaintance on him with all kind of argument proved to be a smart able-bodied old negro but awful afraid of being caught helping runaways would give something for his picture as he appeared to us looking out of his cabin window just an old-fashioned genuine negro and so black that charcoal would make a white mark on him took us probably three miles from his hut two miles of water and one of land and then started back home after shaking us a dozen times by the hand and god blessing us said oh massa miller's niggers all union niggers and to go up to the huts in broad daylight and they would help us no whites at home on the plantation we arrived where jocko left us an hour or so before daylight and lay down to sleep until light i woke up after a while feeling wet and found the tide had risen and we were surrounded with water woke up the boys and scrambled out of that in a hurry going through two feet of water in some places the spot where we had laid down was a higher piece of ground than that adjoining got on to dry land and proceeded to get dry at about ten o'clock dave went up to the negro huts and made himself known which was hard work the negroes are all afraid that we are rebels and trying to get them into a scrape but after we once get them thoroughly satisfied that we are genuine yanks they are all right and will do anything for us the negroes have shown us the big house there being no whites around they having left to escape the coming yankee army we went up into the cupola and looked way off on the ocean and saw our own noble gunboats what would we give to be aboard of them their close proximity makes us discuss the feasibility of going down the river and out to them but the negroes say there are chain boats across the river farther down and picketed still it makes us anxious our being so near and we have decided to go down the river to-night in a boat and see if we can't reach them it is now the middle of the afternoon and we lay off from the huts eighty rods and the negroes are about to bring us some dinner during the night we traveled over oyster beds by the acre artificial ones and they cut our feet negroes say there are two other runaways hid a mile off and they are going to bring them to our hiding place later negroes have just fed us with cornbread and a kind of fish about the size of sardines boiled by the kettle full and they are nice fully as good as sardines think i know now where nearly all the imported sardines come from 
Negroes catch them by the thousand in nets, put them in kettles, and cook them in a few minutes when they are ready to eat. Scoop them out of the creeks. The two other runaways are here with us. They are out of the 3rd Ohio Cavalry. Have been out in the woods for two weeks. Escaped from Blackshear and traveled this far. I used to know one of them in Savannah. We do not take to them at all, as they are not of our kind. Shall separate tonight, they going their way and we going ours. Have secured a dugout boat to go down the Ogochi River with tonight. The Negroes tell us of a Mr. Kimball, a white man, living up the country fifteen miles, who is a Union man, and helps runaways or any one of Union proclivities. He lays up the river, and our gunboats lay down the river. Both have wonderful charms for us, and shall decide before night which route to take. Are on rice plantation, and a valuable one. Before the war, there were over fifteen hundred Negroes on this place. Cotton is also part of the production. Have decided to go down the river and try to reach our gunboats. It's a very hazardous undertaking, and I have my doubts as to its successful termination. December 16. Another adventure and a red-hot one. Started down the river in our dugout boat somewhere near midnight. Ran down all right for an hour, frequently seeing rebel pickets and campfires. Saw we were going right into the lion's mouth as the farther down the more rebels. All at once our boat gave a lurch and landed in a treetop which was sticking out of the water, and there we were, swaying around in the cold water in the middle or near the middle of the Ogochi. Dave went ashore and to a negro hut, woke up the inmates and narrated our troubles. A negro got up and with another boat came to the rescue. We're about froze with the cold and wet. Said not more than a mile further down, we would have run right into a chain boat with pickets posted on it. It really seems as if a divine providence were guiding us. After getting a breakfast of good things, started off toward the big Ogochi River and have traveled three or four miles, are now encamped, or rather laying down, on a little hillock, waiting for evening, to get out of this vicinity, which is a dangerous one. In our river escapade, lost many of our things, but still hang to my coverlid and diary. There are three or four houses in view, and principally white residences, those of the poor white trash order, and they are the very ones we must avoid. Have caught cold, and am fearfully out of traveling condition, but must go it now. A mistake in coming down the river. Am resting up, preparatory to traveling all night up the country. No chance of getting out by the coast. Have enough food to last all day and night, and that is a good deal can't carry more than a day's supply. Have now been out in the woods. This is the fourth day, and every day has been fresh adventures, thick and fast. If I could only travel like my comrades, would get along. Bucks praise me up and encourage me to work away, and I do. For breakfast had more of those imported sardines. Storm brewing of some sort and quite chilly. Saw rebel infantry marching along the highway not more than eighty rods off hugged the ground very close. Dogs came very near us, and if they had seen us, would have attracted the rebels' attention. Am writing with a pencil less than an inch long. Shall print this diary and make my everlasting fortune, and, when wealthy, will visit this country and make every negro who has helped us millionaires. Could not move from here half a mile by daylight without being seen, and as a consequence we are feeling very sore on the situation. Don't know, but I shall be so lame tonight that I cannot walk at all, and then the boys must leave me and go ahead for themselves. However, they say I am worth a hundred dead men yet, and will prod me along like a tired ox. Dave goes now bareheaded, or not quite so bad as that, as he has a handkerchief tied over his head. The program now is to go as straight to Mr. Kimball's as we can. He is probably twenty miles away, is a white Union man I spoke of a day or so ago in this same diary. We'll stick to him like a brother. Can hear wagons go along the road toward Savannah, which is only thirteen or fourteen miles away. Later, most dark enough to travel, and I have straightened up and am taking an inventory of myself, find I can walk with the greatest difficulty. 
The boys argue that after I get warmed up, I will go like a top, and we will see. December 17. And another day of vicissitudes. We traveled last night about four miles, piloted by a young negro. It was a terrible walk to me, slow and painful. We're fed and have food for today. Are now about three miles from a canal which we must cross before another morning. Negro say, Sherman most here, and breast de lord. Mr. Kimball lives nine miles away, and we must reach him some way, but it seems an impossibility for me to go so far. Are now in a high and fine country, but too open for us. Have to lay down all day in the bushes. David is a thorough scout, goes crawling around on his hands and knees, taking in his bearings. Troops are encamped on the main road. Every crossroad has its pickets, and it is slow business to escape running into them. Eli S. Buck has a sore throat and is hoarse. Pretty good jaunt for him, tough as he is. Shall have no guide tonight, as Dave thinks he can engineer us all right in the right direction. Some thinks he will leave us both and reach Kimball's tonight, and then come back and see us through. Guess I will be on hand to go along, however. December 18. Six days of freedom, and what a sight of hardship sweetened by kind treatment and satisfaction of being out from under guard. We traveled last night some four miles, and now are in a very precarious position. When almost daylight, we came to the canal and found cavalry pickets all along the towpath, walked along until we came to a lock. A cavalryman was riding his horse up and down by the lock. At the lock there was a smoldering fire. It was absolutely necessary that we get across before daylight. As the mounted picket turned his horse's head to go from us, Dave slid across the towpath and went across the timbers which formed the lock, and by the time the picket turned around to come back, Dave was hid on the opposite shore. At the next trip of the rebel, Eli went the same as Dave. The third one to go was myself, and I expected to get caught, sure. Could not go as quiet as the rest, and was slower. Thought the picket saw me when halfway across, but kept right on going, and for a wonder made it all right. Was thoroughly scared for the first time since jumping off the train. Am very nervous. All shook hands when the picket turned round to go back the fourth time. Getting light in the east, and we must move on, as the country is very open. Dare not travel over half a mile, and here we are hid almost in a woman's dooryard, not over thirty rods from her very door, are in some evergreen bushes and shrubs. It's now almost noon, and have seen a rather elderly lady go out and in the house a number of times. The intrepid Dave is going up to the house to interview the lady soon. Later, Dave crawled along from our hiding place until he came to the open ground, and then straightened boldly up and walked to the house. In fifteen minutes he came back with some bread and dried beef, and said the woman was a union woman and would help us. Her daughter slept at her uncle's a mile off last night, and expected her back soon, and perhaps the uncle, who is a violent sekesh, with her, said for us to lay low. Later, the daughter came home on horseback and alone, could see the old lady telling the daughter about us and pointing our way. About the middle of the afternoon the old lady started out toward us. Behind her came a young darky, and behind the darky came another darky, then a dog, then a white boy, then a darky, and then the daughter. Old lady peeked in, and so did the rest, except the grown-up girl, who was too afraid. Finally came closer, and as she got a good view of us, she says, "'Why, mother, they look just like anybody else.' She had never seen a Yankee before." brought us some more food, and after dark will set a table for us to come to the house and eat. Her name is Mrs. Dickinson. They went back to the house, and we proceeded to shake hands with one another. During the afternoon, five rebel soldiers came to the house, one at a time. It is now most dark, and we are about ready to go to the house and eat. Mr. Kimball lives only four miles away. December 19. We are now less than half a mile from Mr. Kimball's. After dark last night we went to Mrs. Dickinson's house and partook of a splendid supper. 
I wrote a paper directed to the officer commanding the first Yankee troops that should arrive here, telling what she had done for us runaway Yankees. She talked a great deal, and I thought was careless leaving the front door open. Three or four times I got up and shut that door. We had taken off our blankets and other wraps and left them in a sort of a kitchen, and were talking in the best room. I heard the gate click, and on looking out, saw two rebel officers coming to the house, and not six rods off. We jumped into the other room, and out of the back door, and behind a corn house, bareheaded. The officers were asked into the front room by the daughter. They asked who the parties were who ran out of the back way. She said she reckoned no one. They kept at her and jokingly intimated that some of her skulking lovers had been to see her. She kept talking back and finally said, Mother, did anyone just go away? And the old lady said, Why, yes, Brother Sam and his boy just went off home. Them confounded rebels had come to see the girl and spend the evening, and we shivering out in the cold joked her for an hour and a half about her lovers and we hearing every word. Finally they got up and bid her good night, saying they would send back some men to guard the house and keep her lovers away. Just as soon as they were down the road a ways, the daughter came out very frightened and said for us to hurry off as they would send back troops to look for us. Hurried into the house, got our things and some dried beef, and started off toward Mr. Kimball's house reached here just before daylight and lay down back of the house about eighty rods in the corner of the fence to sleep a little before morning. Just at break of day heard someone calling hogs. David got up and went toward an old man whom we knew was our friend Kimball, came to us and was glad to shake hands with genuine Yankees. Said one of his neighbors was coming over early to go with him to hunt some hogs and for us to go farther off and stay until night, and he would think, up during the day what to do with us. Did not want anything to eat. Came to this place where we are now, and feeling that our journey was most ended. Mr. Kimball said that Sherman was not over fifty miles off, and coming right along twenty miles per day, and our plan was to hide and wait coming events. Mr. Kimball is an old man, probably sixty years old, white-haired and stoop-shouldered. He had five sons, all drafted into the rebel army. All refused to serve. Two have been shot by the rebels. One is in some prison for his Union proclivities, and two are refugees. The old man has been imprisoned time and again, his stock confiscated, property destroyed, and altogether had a hard time of it. Still, he is true blue, a Union man to the backbone. Really think our trouble's coming to an end. Kimball said, Glory to God, the old stars and stripes shall float over my house in less than a week. It's a noble man who will stand out through all that he has for his principles when his interests are all here, is not only willing but glad to help us, and says anything he has is ours if it will help us toward our escape. Later, have been laying all day watching Kimball's house. Along in the morning the neighbor spoken of came to Kimball's, and they both went off on horseback to shoot hogs. The swine here roam over a large territory and become most wild, and when they want fresh pork they have to go after it with a gun. You may be sure the hunters did not come near us with Mr. Kimball for a guide. A negro boy went with them with a light wagon and mule attached. Near noon they returned with some killed hogs in the wagon, at three or four o'clock the old man came down where we were to look after his boys, he said, is in the best of spirits, says we are to hide tonight where he tells us, and stay until our troops reach us. That is jolly good news for me, as I hate to travel. Said, come to the house after dark, and he would have a supper prepared for us, and has just left us. Later have just eaten a splendid supper at Kimball's and getting ready to travel three miles to a safe hiding place. December 20. Well, we are just well fixed and happy. After partaking of a royal repast last night, served in an outbuilding near the main building of the Kimball home, we were directed to this place, which is on the banks of the Big Achubi River, in a most delightful spot. 
while we were at kimball's he had negro sentinels stationed at different points on the plantation to announce the coming of any rebel soldiers or citizens that might see fit to come near he gave us an axe a quart of salt a ham too big to carry conveniently and all the sweet potatoes we could drag along also a butcher knife went with us a mile as guide and then told us so we found the place pointed out also gave us some shelled corn to bait hogs and told dave how to make a deadfall to catch them we left the main road going directly west until we came to a fence then turned to the left and followed the line of the fence and when we had got to the end of it kept straight ahead going through a swampy low section after a while came to higher and dry ground and to the banks of the river is a sort of an island and as i said before a very pretty and pleasant spot out in the river grows tall canebrake which effectually hides us from any one going either up or down the river tall pines are here in abundance and nice grass plats with as handsome palm clusters as ever i saw are going to build us a house to keep off the cold and rain have matches and a rousing fire cooked our breakfast of nice ham and sweet potatoes we also roasted some corn and had corn coffee any quantity of hogs running around and dave is already thinking of a trap to catch them it will be necessary for we are making that ham look sick eat so much breakfast that we can hardly walk and don't know but will commit suicide by eating buzzards fly around attracted by the cooking are as large and look like turkeys our government should give to mr kimball a fortune for his patriotism and sacrifices to the union cause about eight miles above is a long bridge across the river and there it is thought a big fight will take place when sherman attempts to cross and so we will know when they approach as we could hear a battle that distance night we have built the coziest and nicest little house to lay in cut poles with the axe and made a frame and then covered the top with palm leaves just like shingles on a house at the north then fixed three sides the same way each leaf overlapping the other and the fourth side open to a fire and the river the water is cold and clear and nice to drink just like spring water have eaten the ham half up ditto potatoes the increased prosperity makes me feel well bodily and mentally and more so it is still the astor house mess we all cook and we all eat dave prays tonight as he does every night and morning and i ain't sure but all through the day is a thorough christian if ever there was one i also wrote a letter for mr kimball to the commanding union officer who may first approach these parts in it i told how he had befriended us and others we heard boats going by on the river today. At such times all we do is to keep still, as no one can see us. Rebels are too busy to look for us or anyone else. All they can do now is take care of themselves. Eli is making up our bed, getting ready to turn in. I have just brought a tin pail of nice water and we all drink. Take off our shoes for the first time in some days. A beautiful night, clear and cold and thus ends another day, and we are in safety. December 21. Got up bright and early, never slept better, getting rested up, we talk continually, both bucks are great talkers, especially David, cooked and ate our breakfast, and would you believe it, the ham is all gone. Incredible, the amount of food we eat. Wonder it don't make us all sick. Sweet potatoes getting low, Dave fixing up his deadfall for hogs, has rolled some heavy logs together forty rods away from our house, and fixed up a figure four spring trap, with the logs for weight, to hold down the animal which may be enticed into it, has scattered corn in and around the trap, and we wait for developments. Hogs are very shy of us and surroundings, are apparently fat and in good order, plenty of roots and shack which they eat, and thrive thereon buzzards are very curious in regard to us they light on the limbs in the trees and if their support is a dead limb it breaks and makes a great noise in the still woods two or three hundred altogether make a terrible racket and scare us sometimes 
The weather is very fine, and this must be a healthy climate. Dave is going out today to look around. As I have said before, he is a scout and understands spying around and won't get caught. If we had a fish hook and line or a net of some sort, could catch fish to eat. That would be a grand sport as we can see nice large fish in the water. The main road is away about one and a half miles, we think, by the sound of the teams which occasionally rumble along. Often hear shouting on the road as if cattle were being driven along toward Savannah. Once in a while we hear guns fired off, but it is no doubt hogs being killed. We also hear folks going up and down the river, but cannot see them. After dark we have no fire as that would expose us. It is so much plainer to be seen in the night. The river is wide, should think a third of a mile, as we can view it from away up the stream. The cane that grows in the river is the same as we have for fish poles at the north and are shipped from the south. Have added some repairs to the house, and it is now watertight, we think. Made a bed of soft boughs, and with our three blankets have a good sleeping place. Dave got a tall cane and fastened up on the house, and for a flag fastened on a piece of black cloth, the best we could do. That means no quarter, and it is just about what we mean, too. Don't believe we would be taken very easy now. I am getting fat every day, yet lame, and have come to the conclusion that it will be a long time before I get over it. The cords have contracted so in my right leg that they don't seem to stretch out again to their original length. That scurvy business came very near killing me. Later. I also went out of our hiding place and saw a way out in a field what I took to be a mound where sweet potatoes were buried. Came back and got a pair of drawers, tied the bottom of the legs together, and sallied forth. The mound of potatoes was a good way back from the house, although in plain sight. I crawled up and began digging into it with a piece of canteen. Very soon had a hole in it and found some of the nicest potatoes that you can imagine of the red variety, which I believe are the genuine southern yam. Filled the drawers crammed full, filled my pockets and got all I could possibly carry, then closed up the hole and worked my way back to camp. Eli was alone, Dave not having returned from his scouting trip. Had a war dance around those potatoes. Believe there is a bushel of them, and like to have killed myself getting them here. After I got into the woods and out of the field, straightened up and got the drawers on my shoulders, and picked the way to headquarters. We don't any of us call any such thing as that stealing. It's one of the necessities of our lives that we should have food, and if we have not got it, must do the best we can. Now, if we can catch a porker, we'll be fixed all right for some days to come. Think it is about the time of year for butchering. We don't expect to be here more than two or three days at farthest, although I shall hate to leave this beautiful spot, our nice house and all. Listen all the time for the expected battle at the bridge, and at any unusual sound of commotion in that direction, we are all excitement. Later. Dave has returned. He went to the main road and saw a negro, was lucky enough to get a Savannah paper three days old, in which there was nothing we did not know in regard to Sherman's coming. The negro said Yankee scouts had been seen just across the river near the bridge, and the main army is expected every day. The rebels will fall back across the river and contest the crossing. Fortifications are built all along clear to Savannah, and it may be reasonably expected that some hard fighting will take place. Savannah is the pride of the South, and they will not easily give it up. Dave did not tell the Negro that he was a Yankee, but represented himself as a conscript hiding in the woods to keep from fighting in the rebel army. Was glad to see supply of potatoes, and says I will do. Has freshly baited his trap for hogs, and thinks before night we will have fresh pork to go with the potatoes. Later, we went around a drove of hogs and gradually and carefully worked them up to the trap. Pretty soon they began to pick up the corn, and one of them went under the figure four, sprung it, and down came the logs, and such a squealing and scrambling of those not caught. The axe had been left near the trap standing up against a tree, 
and Dave ran up and grabbed it and struck the animal on the head and cut his throat. How we did laugh and dance around that defunct porker. Exciting sport, this trapping for fresh pork. In half an hour, Dave and Eli had the pig skinned and dressed. Is not a large one, probably weighs ninety pounds or so, and is fat and nice. Have sliced up enough for about a dozen men, and are now cooking it on sticks held up before the fire. Also frying some in a skillet which we are the possessors of. When the hogs run wild and eat acorns, roots, and the like, the meat is tough and curly, but is sweet and good. We fry out the grease and then slice up the potatoes and cook in it. Thanks to Mr. Kimball, we have plenty of salt to season our meat with. The buzzards are after their share, which will be small. And now it is most night again, and the Astor House larder is full. Seems too bad to go to bed with anything to eat on hand but must. That is the feeling with men who have been stars so long, cannot rest in peace with food laying around. My two comrades are not so bad about that as I am, having been well fed for a longer period. Have sat up three or four hours after dark, talking over what we will do when we get home, and will now turn in for a sound sleep. It's a clear moonlit night, and we can hear very plain a long distance can also see the light shining from campfires in many directions, or what we take to be such. December 22. As Dan Rice used to say in the circus ring, here we are again. Sleep so sound that all the battles in America could not wake me up. Are just going for that fresh pork today. Have three kinds of meat, fried pig, roast pork, and broiled hog. Good any way you can fix it won't last us three days at this rate, and if we stay long enough, we'll eat up all the hogs in these woods. Pretty hoggish on our part, and Dave says, for gracious sake, not to write down how much we eat, but as this diary is to be a record of what takes place, down it goes how much we eat. Tell him that inasmuch as we have a preacher along with us, we ought to have a sermon occasionally. Says he will preach if I will sing, and I agree to that, if Eli will take up a collection. One objection Eli and I have to his prayers is the fact that he wants the rebels saved with the rest, yet won't tell him so. Mutually agree that his prayers are that much too long. Asked him if he thought it stealing to get those potatoes as I did, and he says no, and that he will go next time. We begin to expect the Yankees along. It's about time. Don't know what I shall do when I again see Union soldiers with guns in their hands and behold the stars and stripes. Probably go crazy or daft or something. This is a cloudy, chilly day, and we putter around gathering up pine knots for the fire, wash our duds, and otherwise busy ourselves. Have saved the hogskin to make moccasins of, if the Union Army is whipped and we have to stay here eight or ten years. The hair on our heads is getting long again, and we begin to look like wild men of the woods. One pocket comb does for the entire party, two jack knives and a butcher knife. I have four keys jingling away in my pocket to remind me of olden times. Eli has a testament, and Dave has a Bible, and the writer hereof has not. Still, I get scripture quoted at all hours, which will, perhaps, make up in a measure. Am at liberty to use either one of their books, and I do read more or less. Considerable travel on the highways, and going both ways as near as we can judge. Dave wants to go out to the road again, but we discourage him in it, and he gives it up for today at least. Are afraid he will get caught, and then our main stay will be gone. Pitch pine knots make a great smoke which rises among the trees, and we are a little afraid of the consequences. Still, rebels have plenty to do now without looking us up. Many boats go up and down the river and can hear them talk perhaps fifty rods away. Rebel paper that Dave got spoke of Savannah being the point aimed at by Sherman, also of his repulses. Still, I notice that he keeps coming right along. Also quoted part of a speech by Jefferson Davis, and he is criticized unmercifully. Says nothing about any exchange of prisoners, and our old comrades are no doubt languishing in some prison. Later. 
considerable firing up in vicinity of the bridge can hear volleys of musketry and an occasional boom of cannon hurrah it is now four o'clock by the sun and the battle is certainly taking place later go it billy sherman we are listening and wishing you the best of success come right along and we will be with you give em another that was a good one we couldn't be more excited if we were right in the midst of it hurrah it is now warm for the johnnies if we had guns would go out and fight in their rear surround them as it were troops going by to the front and our cavalry should think also artillery can hear teamsters swearing away as they always do later it is now long after dark and we have a good fire fighting has partially subsided up the river but of course we don't know whether yankee troops have crossed the river or not great deal of travel on the road but can hardly tell which way they are going occasional firing no sleep for us to-night in the morning shall go out to the road and see how things look every little while when the battle raged the loudest all of us three would hurrah as if mad but we ain't mad a bit are tickled most to death december twenty three it is not yet daylight in the morning and are anxiously awaiting the hour to arrive when we may go out to the road slept hardly any during the night more or less fighting all night and could hear an army go by towards savannah also some shouting directly opposite us between the hours of about twelve and three all was quiet and then again more travel we conjecture that the rebel army has retreated or been driven back and that the yankees are now passing along following them up shall go out about nine o'clock later are eating breakfast before starting out to liberty and safety must be very careful now and make no mistake if we run into a rebel squad now might get shot we are nervous and so anxious can hardly eat we'll pick up what we really need and start perhaps good-bye little house on the banks of the ochibi we shall always remember just how you look and what a happy time we have had on this little island dave says pick up your blanket and that skillet and come along night safe and sound among our own united states army troops after an imprisonment of nearly fourteen months will not attempt to describe my feelings now could not do it staying with the eightieth ohio infantry and are pretty well tired out from our exertions of the day at nine o'clock we started out toward the main road when near it eli and i stopped and dave went ahead to see who was passing we waited probably fifteen minutes and then heard dave yell out come on boys all right hurry up eli and i had a stream to cross on a log the stream was some fifteen feet wide and the log about two feet through i tried to walk that log and fell in my excitement verily believe if the water had been a foot deeper i would have drowned was up to my arms and i was so excited that i liked never to have got out lost the axe which dave had handed to me and the old standby coverlid which had saved my life time and again floated off down the stream and i went off without securing it the more shame to me for it dave ran out of the woods swinging his arms and yelling like mad and pretty soon eli and myself appeared whooping and yelling the 80th Ohio was just going by, or a portion of it, however, and when they saw first one and then another and then the third coming toward them in rebel dress, with clubs which they mistook for guns, they wheeled into line, thinking perhaps that a whole regiment would appear next. Dave finally explained by signs, and we approached and satisfied them of our genuineness, said we were hard-looking soldiers but when we came to tell them where we had been and all the particulars they did not wonder went right along with them and at noon had plenty to eat are the guests of company i eightieth ohio at three the eightieth had a skirmish we staying back a mile with some wagons and this afternoon rode in a wagon only came about three or four miles to-day and are near kimball's whom we shall call and see the first opportunity the soldiers all look well and feel well and say the whole confederacy is about cleaned out 
Rebels fall back without much fighting. Said there was not enough to call it a fight at the bridge. Where we thought it a battle, they thought it nothing worth speaking of. Believe ten or so were killed and some wounded. Hear that some Michigan cavalry is with Kilpatrick off on another road, but they do not know whether it is the Ninth Michigan Cav or not. Say they see the cavalry every day nearly, and I must keep watch for my regiment. Soldiers forage on the plantations and have the best of food, chickens, ducks, sweet potatoes, etc. The supply wagons carry nothing but hardtack, coffee, sugar, and such things. Tell you, coffee is a luxury and makes one feel almost drunk. Officers come to interview us every five minutes, and we have talked ourselves most to death today. They say we probably will not be called upon to do any fighting during this war, as the thing is about settled. They have heard of Andersonville, and from the accounts of the place did not suppose that any lived at all. New York papers had pictures in of the scenes there, and if such was the case it seems funny that measures were not taken to get us away from there. Many rebels are captured now, and we look at them from a different standpoint than a short time since. December 24. This diary must soon come to an end. We'll fill the few remaining pages and then stop. Company I boys are very kind. They have reduced soldiering to a science, all divided up into messes of from three to five each. Any mess is glad to have us in with them, and we pay them with accounts of our prison life. No, they think half we tell them is lies. I regret the most of anything the loss of my blanket that stood by me so well. It's a singular fact that the first day of my imprisonment it came into my possession, and the very last day it took its departure, floating off away from me after having performed its mission. Should like to have taken it north to exhibit to my friends. The infantry move only a few miles each day, and I believe we stay here all day. Went and saw Mr. Kimball. The officers commanding knew him for a Union man, and none of his belongings were troubled. In fact, he has anything he wants now, announces his intention of going with the army until the war closes. Our good old friend, Mrs. Dickinson, did not fare so well. The soldiers took everything she had on the place fit to eat, all her cattle, pork, potatoes, chickens, and left them entirely destitute. We went and saw them, and will go to headquarters and see what can be done. Later. We went to General Smith, commanding 3rd Brigade, 2nd Division, and told him the particulars. He sent out foraging wagons, and now she has potatoes, corn, bacon, cattle, mules, and everything she wants. Also received pay for burned fences and other damages. Now they are smiling and happy, and declare the Yankees to be as good as she thought them bad this morning. The men, being under little restraint on this raid, were often destructive. Nearly every citizen declared their loyalty, so no distinction is made. General Smith is a very kind man, and asked us a great many questions. Says the Ninth Michigan Cavalry is near us, and we may see them any hour. General Hahn also takes quite an interest in us, and was equally instrumental with General Smith in seeing justice done to our friends the Kimballs and Dickinsons. They declare now that one of us must marry the daughter of Mrs. Dickinson, the chaplain performing the ceremony. Well, she is a good girl, and I should judge would make a good wife, but presume she would have something to say herself, and will not pop the question to her. They are very grateful, and only afraid that after we all go away, the rebel citizens and soldiers will retaliate on them. Many officers have read portions of my diary, and say such scenes as we have passed through seem incredible. Many inquire if we saw so-and-so of their friends who went to Andersonville, but of course there were so many there that we cannot remember them. This has been comparatively a day of rest for this portion of the Union Army, after having successfully crossed the river. We hear the cavalry is doing some fighting on the right in the direction of Fort McAllister. Evening. We marched about two or three miles and are again encamped for the night, with pickets out for miles around. Many refugees join the army prepared to go along with them, among whom are a great many Negroes. 
December 25, Christmas Day, and didn't hang up my stocking. No matter, it wouldn't have held anything. Last Christmas we spent on Bell Island, little thinking long imprisonment awaiting us. Us escaped men are to ride in a forage wagon. The army is getting ready to move. Are now twenty-four miles from Savannah, and rebels falling back as we press ahead. Night. At about nine o'clock this morning, as we all sat in the forage wagon, top of some corn riding in state, I saw some cavalry coming from the front. Soon recognized Colonel Acker at the head of the Ninth Michigan Cavalry, jumped out of the wagon and began dancing and yelling in the middle of the road and in front of the troop. Colonel Acker said, Get out of the way, you blank lunatic. Soon made myself known and was like one arisen from the dead. Major Brockway said, Ransom, you want to start for home. We don't know you. You are dead. No such man as Ransom on the rolls for ten months. All remember me and are rejoiced to see me back again. Lieutenant Colonel Way, Surgeon, Adjutant, Sergeant Major, all shake hands with me. My company A was in the rear of the column, and I stood by the road as they moved along, hailing those I recognized. In every case had to tell them who I was, and then would go up and shake hands with them, at the risk of getting stepped on by the horses. Pretty soon Company A appeared, and wasn't they surprised to see me. The whole company were raised in Jackson, Michigan, my home, and I had been regarded as dead for nearly a year could hardly believe it was myself that appeared to them. Everyone trying to tell me the news at home, all at the same time, how I was reported as having died in Richmond and funeral sermon preached, how so-and-so had been shot and killed, and so on and so on. And then I had to tell them of who of our regiment had died in Andersonville, Dr. Lewis, Tom McGill, and others. Although Jimmy Devers did not belong to our regiment, many in our company knew him, and I told them of his death. Should have said that as soon as I got to the company was given Captain Johnson's lead horse to ride, without saddle or bridle, and nothing but a halter to hang on with. Not being used to riding, in rebel dress, two or three pails hanging to me, I made a spectacle for them all to laugh at. It was a time of rejoicing. The Buck Boys did not get out of the wagon with me, and so we became separated, without even a good-bye. Before I had been with the company half an hour, General Kilpatrick and staff came riding by from the rear, and says to Captain Johnson, Captain, I hear one of your company has just joined you after escaping from the enemy. Captain Johnson said, Yes, sir, and pointed to me as a sergeant in his company. General Kilpatrick told me to follow him, and started ahead at a breakneck pace. Inasmuch as the highway was filled with troops, General Kilpatrick and staff rode at the side, through the fields, and any way they could get over the ground. The horse I was on is a pacer and a very hard-riding animal, and it was all I could do to hang on. Horse would jump over logs and come down on all fours, kerchug, and I kept hoping the general would stop pretty soon, but he didn't. Having no saddle or anything to guide the brute, it was a terrible hard ride for me, and time and again if I had thought I could fall off without breaking my neck, should have done so. The soldiers all along the line laughed and hooted at the spectacle, and the staff had great sport, which was anything but sport for me. After a while, and after riding five or six miles, Kilpatrick drew up in a grove by the side of the road, and, motioning me to him, asked me when I escaped, and so forth, soon saw I was too tired and out of breath. After resting a few minutes, I proceeded to tell him what I knew of Savannah, the line of forts around the city, and of other fortifications between us and the city, the location of the rivers, force of rebels, etc., asked a great many questions, and took down notes, or rather the chief of staff, Estes by name, did. After an extended conversation, a dispatch was made up and sent to General Sherman, who was a few miles away, with the endorsement that an escaped prisoner had given the information, and it was reliable. General Kilpatrick told me I would probably not be called upon to do any more duty, as I had done good service as a prisoner of war. 
said he would sign a furlough and recommend that I go home as soon as communication was open, thanked me for information, and dismissed me with congratulations on my escape. Then I waited until our Company A came up and joined them, and here I am encamped with the boys who are engaged in getting supper. We are only twelve or fourteen miles from Savannah, and the report in camp is to the effect that the city has been evacuated with no fight at all. Fort McAllister was taken today, which, being the key to Savannah, leaves that city unprotected, hence the evacuation. Communication will now be opened with the gunboats on the coast, and I will be sent home to Michigan. I mess with Captain Johnson, and there is peace and plenty among us. I go around from mess to mess this pleasant night, talking with the boys, learning and telling the news. O. B. Driscoll, Al Williams, Sergeant Smith, Mel Strickland, Sergeant Fletcher, Teddy Fox, Lieutenant Ingram, and all the rest think of something new every few minutes, and I am full. Poor Robert Strickland, a boy whom I enlisted, was shot since starting out on this march to the sea. Others, too, whom I left well, are now no more. The boys have had a long and tedious march, yet are all in good health and have enjoyed the trip. They never tire of telling about their fights and skirmishes and anecdotes concerning Kilpatrick, who is well liked by all the soldiers. Am invited to eat with every mess in the company, also at regimental headquarters, in fact, anywhere I am a mind to, can fill. And now this diary is finished and is full. Shall not write any more, though I hardly know how I shall get along without a self-imposed task of some kind. End of Diary it may interest someone to know more of many who have been mentioned at different times in this book, and I will proceed to enlighten them. George W. Hendricks came to the regiment in March 1865 when we were near Goldsboro, North Carolina. He says that after running away from Andersonville at the time of the discovery of a break in which all intended to get away in the summer of 1864, he traveled over 150 miles and was finally retaken by bushwhackers. He represented himself as an officer of the 17th Michigan Infantry, escaped from Columbia, South Carolina, and was sent to that place and put with officers in the prison there, changing his name so as not to be found out as having escaped from Andersonville. In due time he was exchanged with a batch of other officers and went home north. After a short time he joined his regiment and company for duty. He was both delighted and surprised to see me, as he supposed, of course, I had died in Andersonville, it having been so reported to him at the North. He did valiant service until the war was over, which soon happened. He went home with the regiment and was mustered out of service, since when I have never seen or heard of him for a certainty. Think that he went to California. Sergeant William B. Rowe was exchanged in March 1865, but never joined the regiment. His health was ruined to a certain extent from his long confinement, is still alive, however, and resides at Dansville, Michigan. Sergeant Bullock was also exchanged at the same time, but never did service thereafter. He is now an inmate of a Michigan insane asylum, and has been for some years, whether from the effects of prison life I know not, but should presume it is due to his sufferings there. His was a particularly sad case. He was taken sick in the early days of Andersonville, and was sick all the time while in that place, a mere walking and talking skeleton. There is no doubt in my mind that his insanity resulted from his long imprisonment. E. P. Sanders arrived home in Michigan in April 1865 and made me a visit at Jackson that summer. He was the only one of all my comrades in prison that I came in contact with who fully regained health or apparently was in good health. He was a particularly strong and healthy man and is now engaged in farming near Lansing, Michigan. Lieutenant William H. Robinson, who was removed from Belle Isle from our mess, 
it having been discovered that he was an officer instead of an orderly sergeant, was exchanged early in 1864 from Richmond and immediately joined his regiment, doing duty all the time thereafter. Soon after my escape and while with Company A, a note was handed me from Captain Robinson, my old friend, he having been promoted to a captaincy. The note informed me that he was only a few miles away and asked me to come and see him that day. You may rest assured I was soon on the road, and that day had the pleasure of taking my dinner with him. He was on his general staff, and I dined at headquarters, much to my discomfiture, not being up with such distinguished company. We had a good visit, I remember, and I went to camp at night, well satisfied with my ride told me that a pipe which I engraved and presented to him on Belle Isle was still in his possession and always should be, was a favorite with every one and a fine-looking officer. He is now a resident of Sterling, Whiteside County, Illinois, is a banker, hardware dealer, one of the city fathers, and withal a prominent citizen. It was lucky he was an officer and taken away from us on Belle Isle, for he would undoubtedly have died at Andersonville, being of rather a delicate frame and constitution. My good old friend Battese, I regret to say, I have never seen or heard of since he last visited me in the Marine Hospital at Savannah. Have written many letters and made many inquiries, but to no effect. He was so reticent while with us in the prison that we did not learn enough of him to make inquiries since then effective. Although for many months I was in his immediate presence, he said nothing of where he lived, his circumstances, or anything else. I only know that his name was Battese, that he belonged to a Minnesota regiment, and was a noble fellow. I don't know of a man in the world I would rather see today than him, and I hope some day, when I have got rich out of this book, if that time should ever come, to go to Minnesota and look him up. There are many Andersonville survivors who must remember the tall Indian, and certainly I shall, as long as life shall last. Michael Hoare tells his own story farther along in answer to a letter written him for information regarding his escape from the Savannah Hospital. Mike, at the close of the war, re-enlisted in the regular army and went to the extreme west to fight Indians, and when his term of service expired, again re-enlisted and remained in the service. In 1878 he was discharged on account of disability and is now an inmate of the disabled soldier's home at Dayton, Ohio. From his letters to me he seems the same jolly, good-natured hero as of old. I hope to see him before many months, for the first time since he took me by the hand and passed in and out of his tunnel from the Marine Hospital and to freedom. The two cousins Buck, David and Eli S., I last saw top of some corn in an army wagon I jumped from when I first encountered the Ninth Michigan Cavalry. Little thought that would be the last time I should see them. Their command belonged to the Eastern Army in the region of the Potomac, and when communication was opened at Savannah, they were sent there on transports. I afterward received letters from both of them, and David's picture, also his wife's whom he had just married. David's picture is reproduced in this book, and I must say hardly does him justice, as he was a good-looking and active fellow. Presume Eli is a farmer if alive, and Dave probably preaching. Limber Jim, who was instrumental in putting down the raiders at Andersonville, was until recently a resident of Joliet, Illinois. He died last winter in 1880, and it is said his health was always poor after his terrible summer of 1864. He was a hero in every sense of the word, and if our government did not amply repay him for valiant service done while a prisoner of war, then it is at fault. Sergeant Wynn of the 100th Ohio, who befriended me in Savannah, is, I think, a citizen of Cincinnati, Ohio, and a prosperous man. Anyway, he was in 1870 or thereabouts, was an upright man and good fellow. 
Every one knows the fate of Captain Wirtz, our prison commander at Andersonville, who was hung at Washington, D.C. in 1866 for his treatment of us Union prisoners of war. It was a righteous judgment. Still, I think there are others who deserve hanging fully as much. He was but the willing tool of those higher in command. Those who put him there knew his brutal disposition and should have suffered the same disposition made of him. Although I believe at this late day those who were in command and authority over Captain Wirtz have successfully thrown the blame on his shoulders, it does not excuse them in the least so far as I am concerned. They are just as much to blame that 13,000 men died in a few months at that worst place the world has ever seen as Captain Wirtz and should have suffered accordingly. I don't blame any of them for being rebels if they thought it right, but I do their inhuman treatment of prisoners of war. Hub Dakin is now a resident of Dansville, Michigan, the same village in which lives William B. Rowe. He has been more or less disabled since the war, and I believe is now trying to get a pension from the government for disability contracted while in prison. It is very difficult for ex-prisoners of war to get pensions, owing to the almost impossibility of getting sufficient evidence. The existing pension laws require that an officer of the service shall have knowledge of the origin of disease or else two comrades who may be enlisted men. At this late day it is impossible to remember with accuracy sufficient to come up to the requirements of the law. There is no doubt that all were more or less disabled, and the mere fact of their having spent the summer in Andersonville should be evidence enough to procure assistance from the government. And now a closing chapter in regard to myself. As soon as Savannah was occupied by our troops and communications opened with the North, a furlough was made out by Captain Johnson of our company and signed by Assistant Surgeon Young and then by Colonel Acker. I then took the furlough to General Kilpatrick, which he signed and also endorsed on the back, to the effect that he hoped General Sherman would also sign and send me north. From General Kilpatrick's headquarters I went to see General Sherman at Savannah and was ushered into his presence. The general looked the paper over and then said no men were being sent home now and no furloughs granted for any cause. If I was permanently disabled I would be sent to northern hospitals, or if I had been an exchanged prisoner of war would be sent north, but there was no provision made for escaped prisoners of war. Encouraged me with a hope, however, that the war was nearly over and it could not be long before we would all go home. Gave me a paper releasing me from all duty until such time as I saw fit to do duty and said the first furlough granted should be mine and he would retain it and send to me as soon as possible. Cannot say that I was very sadly disappointed, as I was having a good time with the company, and regaining my health and getting better every day, with the exception of my leg, which still troubled me. Stayed with the company until Lee surrendered, Lincoln assassinated, and all the fighting over, and then leaving Chapel Hill, North Carolina, in April, went to my home in Michigan. In a few weeks was followed by the regiment, when we were all mustered out of the service. As had been reported to me at the regiment, I had been regarded as dead and funeral sermon preached. It was my sad duty to call upon the relatives of quite a number who died in Andersonville, among whom were those of Dr. Lewis, John McGuire, and Jimmy Devers. The relics which had been entrusted to my keeping were all lost, with two exceptions, and through no fault of mine. At the time of my severe illness when first taken to Savannah, and when I was helpless as a child, the things drifted away from me some way and were lost. But for the fact that Battese had two of my diary books and Sergeant Wynne the other, they also would have been lost. I hope that this diary may prove successful in its mission of truly portraying the scenes at Andersonville and elsewhere during the time of my imprisonment, and if so, the object of its author shall have been accomplished. 
Yours very respectfully, John L. Ransom, late First Sergeant, Company A, Ninth Michigan Cavalry. National Soldiers' Home, Dayton, Ohio, May 5, 1881. Comrade John L. Ransom. Dear friend, the night I left the stockade, going within twelve feet of a guard, I went down to the city, had never been there before, and did not know where to go, but wandered about the streets, dressed in an old suit of rebel clothes, until twelve o'clock that night. It was October eighteenth, 1864, and I had been captured March fifth in Colonel Dahlgren's raid, the object of which was to release the officers confined in Libby Prison and the privates confined on Bell Island and Pemberton Prisons. My whole uniform was disposed of, and I had to wear dirty rebel rags. They marched us to Stevensville. We remained there but a short time, when we were marched about two miles and into the heart of a swamp. We did not know what the matter was, but found out that Kilpatrick had turned back to look for us, the forlorn hope, as we were called. If he had been one hour sooner, he would have released us, but fate would have it the other way. From the swamp we were marched to Richmond, surrounded by the mounted mob. They would not let us step out of ranks even to quench our thirst, and we had to drink the muddy water from the middle of the road. Every little town we came to the rebels would assemble and yell at us, the women the worst. When we reached the headquarters of rebeldom, the whole rebel city was out to meet us, and the self-styled rebel ladies were the worst in their vim and foul language. They made a rush for us, but the guard kept them off until we were safely put in the third story of the Pemberton building, where we were searched and stripped of everything we were not already robbed of. The next morning the Richmond people cried out for Jeff Davis to hang us, saying we were nothing but outlaws and robbers on an errand of plunder and rapine. The press tried to excite hostility against us and succeeded in a measure. We were kept by ourselves and not allowed to mix with the other prisoners. A special guard was kept over us, and we were allowed but two-thirds the small rations issued to the other men. The windows were all out of the room we were in, and a cold March wind blowing and cutting through our starving naked bodies. In July we were going to get hanged in Castle Thunder. We were told the same story every day, and it was getting stale, so we paid no attention to it. But sure enough, we were called out one morning and thought our time had come. They marched us up Casey Street toward Castle Thunder, and as we approached it, some fairly shivered at their promised doom. But instead of stopping at that celebrated hotel, we were taken across the river and put in cattle cars. Where we were going, none knew, but we started, and the next day reached Dansville. We were removed from the cars and put into a tobacco warehouse, and were kept there until the next morning, when we were put aboard the cars and started south again, until we came to the world-renowned hellhole, Andersonville. When we arrived, several men were dead in the cars, and the rebels would not let us remove them. The cars were packed like herring boxes, so you may imagine our situation. From there I was transferred to Savannah, and from the latter place I made my escape, as previously mentioned. As I have said, I wandered about until twelve o'clock, and was then in a worn-out condition. Not knowing where to turn or lay my head, I sat down under a tree to rest myself, and as I sat there, who should come along but a watchman? Hello, says he, what are you doing here at this hour of the night? I answered that I was one of the guards guarding the Yankees at the stockade, and that I had been down to Bryan Street to see my sister. All right, said he, you fellows have a hard time guarding them damned Yankees. Why don't you shoot more of them and get them out of the way? I passed on until I came to a place with a high board fence. I crawled over and looked around and found a small shed divided by a board partition. In one end they kept a cow, and in the other some fodder. I went in where the fodder was and threw myself down and went to sleep, intending to be up before day. 
but what was my surprise when it proved to be broad daylight before I awoke? I lay there thinking what to do when I heard the gate of the fence open. I jumped up and looked through a crack in the boards and saw an old man enter with a pail in his hand. Presently he came where I was in the fodder to get some for the cow. As he opened the door, he started back with fright, saying, Who are you and what brings you here? I saw by his face and voice that he was an Irishman, and I made up my mind to tell him the truth. He told me to remain where I was and he would try and get me something to eat. He went away and presently returned with a tin pan full of sweet potatoes and bacon. He told me the only way to get away was by the Isle of Hope, ten miles from the city on the Skidaway Shell Road. There was a picket post of twelve men right on the road, but I started off, and when I reached the picket, put on a bold face and told them I belonged to Maxwell's battery, stationed at the Isle of Hope, and they let me pass. I passed officers and soldiers on the road, but they never took any notice of me further than to return my kindly greeting. I finally reached the outpost on the road about a mile from Freedom. I had known, even before starting, that to pass that post I should have to have a pass signed by the commanding officer at Savannah. But there were swamps on both sides of the road, and I thought I could swim in the marsh and flank the post. I took off my jacket and made the attempt, but had to return to the road. I saw there was no use trying to escape by the Isle of Hope. I could not pass the outpost, and besides there was great danger that I should be hung as a spy. So I put back to Savannah that night. I had to wade the marsh to get by the post I first passed. I got safely back to my cowshed and laid there till woke up the next morning by my friend Gleason. When I told him where I had been, he would hardly believe me. He brought me something to eat and went away, but returned at night with two other men. Their names were Wall and Skelly, and they belonged to the 3rd Georgia Artillery. They said they were northern men, but were in Savannah when the war broke out and had to join the rebel army. I told them the history of my adventure by the Isle of Hope, and they were astonished. They said the only way was by the river to Fort Pulaski, fourteen miles from Savannah. The question was where to get a boat. They were known in Savannah, and their movements would be watched. They said they knew where there was a boat, but it was a government boat. I said that made it better, and if they would show me where the boat was, I would do the head work. So they showed me and left me the management. I went when everything was ready and muffled the oars and oar locks with a sentinel within twenty feet of me. The boat lay in the river near the gas house and a government storehouse, and the river was guarded by gunboats and the floating battery, and paved with torpedoes. But there is what is called the Back River, which flows into the savannah above Smith Island. The mouth of this stream was guarded by a picket crew sent from the battery every night. So when we left, we had to lay in a rice sluice, where we ran the boat in about an eighth of a mile, and raised the grass as the boat passed along to conceal our tracks. We heard them searching the next morning after the boat had been missed, but the search was at last given up. About this time Skelly began talking about being recaptured, as the shore was picketed all the way. He said there would be nothing done with me if I was recaptured but to put me back in the stockade, while he and Wall would be shot as deserters. He proposed returning to Savannah at once. He began to win the other fellow over, and I saw the game was up with me. Skelly was the only one of us who was armed, and he had a Colt's revolver. I told him that his plan was the best, and that I didn't want to be the means of getting him into trouble. I gained his confidence, but the thought of returning to Savannah never entered my head. I watched my chance, and at a favorable opportunity, snatched his pistol. I rose to my feet with the pistol at full cock, pointed it at his breast, and told him that one move towards returning to Savannah would end his career by a bullet from his own revolver. He turned all colors, but said nothing. I kept my distance and, at four o'clock in the afternoon, told them to get into the boat. 
I then sat down in the stern and told them to pull out, which they did with a vim. Just as we passed the mouth, we heard the click of oars on the picket boat, but they were too late, and all the danger we had to encounter was the pickets on the shore, which we had to hug on account of torpedoes in the channel. I don't know how we ever passed safely over the torpedoes and by the pickets, which latter were within forty yards of us all the way along until we reached Pulaski. All that saved us was that the pickets had fires lighted and were looking at them, and our oars and oarlocks being muffled, they did not hear or see us. It was very dark when we struck the mouth of the Savannah, and whereabouts Fort Pulaski lay we knew not but we kept pulling until halted by a soldier of the 144th New York Infantry, who was guarding the place at that time. We were ordered to pull in, which we did, and were taken up to the commanding officer and questioned. He said it was the most daring escape ever made up to that time, considering the obstacles we had to encounter. We were kept in the guardhouse until my statement was confirmed by the War Department, when I was released and sent to Washington, where I reported to the Adjutant General, who gave me a furlough and sent me to the hospital. I remained there until spring, when I rejoined my regiment and was mustered out at the close of the war. I remain your true friend, Michael Hoare. Rebel Testimony we cannot do better than copy into this book a very complete description of Andersonville Prison by Joseph Jones, surgeon, P.A.C.S., professor of medical chemistry in the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta, Georgia, as given at the Wirtz trial at Washington, D.C., he being a witness for the prosecution. Hearing of the unusual mortality among the prisoners confined at Andersonville in the month of August 1864, during a visit to Richmond, I expressed to the Surgeon General, S. P. Moore, Confederate States of America, a desire to visit Camp Sumter, with the design of instituting a series of inquiries upon the nature and causes of the prevailing diseases. Smallpox had appeared among the prisoners, and I believe that this would prove an admirable field for the study of its characteristic lesions. The condition of Pyer's glands in this disease was considered as worthy a minute investigation. It was believed that a large portion of the men from the northern portion of the United States, suddenly transported to a southern climate and confined upon a small portion of land, would furnish an excellent field for the investigation of the relations of typhus, typhoid, and malaria fevers. The Surgeon General of the Confederate States of America furnished me with letters of introduction to the surgeon in charge of the Confederate States Military Prison at Andersonville, Georgia, and the following is my description of that place. The Confederate Military Prison at Andersonville, Georgia, consists of a strong stockade, twenty feet in height, enclosing twenty-seven acres. The stockade is formed of strong pine logs firmly planted in the ground. The main stockade is surrounded by two other similar rows of pine logs, the middle stockade being 16 feet high and the outer one 12 feet. These are intended for offense and defense. If the inner stockade should at any time be forced by the prisoners, the second forms another line of defense while in case of an attempt to deliver the prisoners by a force operating upon the exterior, the outer line forms an admirable protection to the Confederate troops and a most formidable obstacle to cavalry or infantry. The four angles of the outer line are strengthened by earthworks upon commanding eminences from which the cannon, in case of an outbreak among the prisoners, may sweep the entire enclosure, and it was designed to connect these works by a line of rifle pits running zigzag around the outer stockade. These rifle pits have never been completed. The ground enclosed by the innermost stockade lies in the form of a parallelogram, the larger diameter running almost due north and south. 
This space includes the northern and southern opposing sides of two hills, between which a stream of water runs from west to east. The surface soil of these two hills is composed chiefly of sand, with varying mixtures of clay and oxide of iron. The clay is sufficiently tenacious to give a considerable degree of consistency to the soil. The internal structure of the hills, as revealed by the deep wells, is similar to that already described. The alternate layers of clay and sand, as well as the oxide of iron, which forms in its various combinations a cement to the sand, allows of extensive tunneling. The prisoners not only constructed numerous dirt houses with balls of clay and sand taken from the wells which they had excavated all over these hills, but they have also, in some cases, tunneled extensively from these wells. The lower portion of these hills, bordering on the stream, are wet and boggy from the constant oozing of water. The stockade was built originally to accommodate 10,000 prisoners, and included at first 17 acres. Near the close of the month of June, the area was enlarged by the addition of 10 acres. The ground added was situated on the northern slope of the largest hill. Within the circumscribed area of the stockade, the Federal prisoners were compelled to perform all the functions of life, cooking, washing, the calls of nature, exercise, and sleeping. During the month of March, the prison was less crowded than at any subsequent time, and then the average space of ground to each prisoner was only 98.7 feet, or less than 11 square yards. The Federal prisoners were gathered from all parts of the Confederate States east of the Mississippi, and crowded into the confined space, until, in the month of June, the average number of square feet of ground to each prisoner was only 32.3, or less than four square yards. These figures represent the stockade in a better light, even, than it really was, for a considerable breadth of land along the stream flowing from west to east between the hills was low and boggy, and was covered with the excrements of the men, and thus rendered wholly uninhabitable, and in fact useless for every purpose except that of defecation. The pines and other small trees and shrubs, which originally were scattered sparsely over these hills, were in a short time cut down by the prisoners for firewood, and no shade tree was left in the entire enclosure of the stockade. With their characteristic industry and ingenuity, the Federals constructed for themselves small huts and caves, and attempted to shield themselves from the rain and sun and night damps and dew. But few tents were distributed to the prisoners, and those were in most cases torn and rotten. In the location and arrangement of these huts, no order appears to have been followed. In fact, regular streets appear to be out of the question on so crowded an area, especially, too, as large bodies of prisoners were from time to time added suddenly and without any preparations. The irregular arrangement of the huts and imperfect shelters was very unfavorable for the maintenance of a proper system of police. The police and internal economy of the prison was left almost entirely in the hands of the prisoners themselves, the duties of the Confederate soldiers acting as guards being limited to the occupation of the boxes or lookouts arranged around the stockade at regular intervals, and to the manning of the batteries at the angles of the prison. Even judicial matters pertaining to the prisoners themselves, as the detection and punishment of such crimes as theft and murder, appear to have been, in a great measure, abandoned to the prisoners. The large number of men confined within the stockade, soon under a defective system of police, and with imperfect arrangements, covered the surface of the low ground with excrements. The sinks over the lower portions of the stream were imperfect in their plan and structure, and the excrements were in large measure deposited so near the borders of the stream as not to be washed away or else accumulated upon the low boggy ground. 
the volume of water was not sufficient to wash away the feces and they accumulated in such quantities as to form a mass of liquid excrement heavy rains caused the water of the stream to rise and as the arrangements for the passage of the increased amount of water out of the stockade were insufficient the liquid feces overflowed the low grounds and covered them several inches after the subsidence of the water the action of the sun upon this putrefying mass of excrements and fragments of bread and meat and bones excited most rapid fermentation and developed a horrible stench improvements were projected for the removal of the filth and for the prevention of its accumulation but they were only partially and imperfectly carried out as the forces of the prisoners were reduced by confinement want of exercise improper diet and by scurvy diarrhoea and dysentery they were unable to evacuate their bowels within the stream or along its banks and the excrements were deposited at the very doors of their tents the vast majority appeared to lose all repulsion of filth and both sick and well disregarded all the laws of hygiene and personal cleanliness the accommodations for the sick were imperfect and insufficient from the organization of the prison february twenty four eighteen sixty four to may twenty second the sick were treated within the stockade in the crowded condition of the stockade and with the tents and huts clustered thickly around the hospital it was impossible to secure proper ventilation or to maintain the necessary police the federal prisoners also made frequent forays upon the hospital stores and carried off the food and clothing of the sick the hospital was on the twenty second of may removed to its present site without the stockade and five acres of ground covered with oaks and pines appropriated to the use of the sick the supply of medical officers has been insufficient from the foundation of the prison the nurses and attendants upon the sick have been most generally federal prisoners who in too many cases appear to have been devoid of moral principle and who not only neglected their duties but were also engaged in extensive robberies of the sick from want of proper police and hygienic regulations alone it is not wonderful that from february twenty four to september twenty one eighteen sixty four nine thousand four hundred and seventy nine deaths nearly one-third the entire number of prisoners have been recorded at the time of my visit to andersonville a large number of federal prisoners had been removed to millen savannah charleston and other parts of the confederacy in anticipation of an advance of general sherman's forces from atlanta with the design of liberating their captive brethren however about fifteen thousand prisoners remained confined within the limits of the stockade and prison hospital in the stockade with the exception of the damp lowlands bordering the small stream the surface was covered with huts and small ragged tents and parts of blankets and fragments of oilcloth coats and blankets stretched upon sticks the tents and huts were not arranged according to any order and there was in most parts of the enclosure scarcely room for two men to walk abreast between the tents and huts if one might judge from the large pieces of cornbread scattered about in every direction on the ground the prisoners were either very lavishly supplied with this article of diet or else this kind of food was not relished by them each day the dead from the stockade were carried out by their fellow prisoners and deposited upon the ground under a bush arbor just outside of the southwestern gate from thence they were carried on carts to the burying ground one quarter of a mile northwest of the prison the dead were buried without coffins side by side in trenches four feet deep the low grounds bordering the stream were covered with human excrement and filth of all kinds which in many places seemed to be alive with working maggots an indescribable sickening stench arose from these fermenting masses of human filth 
there were near five thousand seriously ill federals in the stockade and the confederate states military prison hospital and the deaths exceeded one hundred per day and large numbers of the prisoners who were walking about and who had not been entered upon the sick reports were suffering incurable diarrhoea dysentery and scurvy the sick were attended almost entirely by their fellow prisoners appointed as nurses and as they received but little attention they were compelled to exert themselves at all times to attend the calls of nature and hence they retained the power of moving about to within a comparatively short period of the close of life owing to the slow progress of the diseases most prevalent diarrhoea and chronic dysentery the corpses were, as a general rule, emaciated. I visited two thousand sick within the stockade, laying under some long sheds which had been built at the northern portion for themselves. At this time, only one medical officer was in attendance, whereas at least twenty medical officers should have been employed. Scurvy, diarrhea, dysentery, and hospital gangrene were the prevailing diseases. I was surprised to find but few cases of malarial fever, and no well-marked cases either of typhus or typhoid fever. The absence of the different forms of malarial fever may be accounted for in the supposition that the artificial atmosphere of the stockade, crowded densely with human beings and loaded with animal exhalations, was unfavorable to the existence and action of the malarial poison. The absence of typhoid and typhus fevers, amongst all the causes which are known to generate these diseases, appeared to be due to the fact that the great majority of these prisoners had been in captivity in Virginia at Belle Isle and in other parts of the Confederacy for months, and even as long as two years, and during this time they had been subjected to the same bad influences, and those who had not had these fevers before either had them during their confinement in Confederate prisons, or else their systems from long exposure were proof against their action. The effects of scurvy were manifest on every hand and in all its various stages, from the muddy pale complexion, pale gums, feeble languid muscular motions, lowness of spirits and fetid breath, to the dusky dirty leaden complexion, swollen features, spongy purple livid fungoid bleeding gums, loose teeth, edematous limbs, covered with livid vibices and petechiae, spasmodically flexed, painful and hardened extremities, spontaneous hemorrhages from mucous canals, and large, ill-conditioned spreading ulcers covered with a dark, purplish fungus growth. I observed that in some of the cases of scurvy the parotid glands were greatly swollen, and in some instances to such an extent as to preclude entirely the power to articulate. In several cases of dropsy, the abdomen and lower extremities supervening upon scurvy, the patients affirmed that previously to the appearance of the dropsy, they had suffered with profuse and obstinate diarrhoea, and that when this was checked by a change of diet, from Indian cornbread baked with the husk to boiled rice, the dropsy disappeared. The severe pains and livid patches were frequently associated with swellings in various parts, and especially in the lower extremities, accompanied with stiffness and contractions of the knee joints and ankles, and often with a brawny feel of these parts, as if lymph had been effused between the integuments and aponeuroses, preventing the motion of the skin over the swollen parts. Many of the prisoners believed that scurvy was contagious, and I saw men guarding their wells and springs, fearing lest some man suffering with scurvy might use the water and thus poison them. I observed also numerous cases of hospital gangrene and of spreading of scorbutic ulcers which had supervened upon slight injuries. The scorbutic ulcers presented a dark purple fungoid elevated surface with livid swollen edges and exuded a thin fetid sanus fluid instead of pus. 
Many ulcers which had originated from scorbutic condition of the system appeared to become truly gangrenous, assuming all the characteristics of hospital gangrene. From the crowded condition, filthy habits, bad diet, and dejected, depressed condition of the prisoners, their systems had become so disordered that the smallest abrasion of the skin, from the rubbing of a shoe, or from the effects of the sun, or from the prick of a splinter, or from scratching, or a mosquito bite, in some cases took on a rapid and frightful ulceration and gangrene. The long use of salt meat, oftentimes imperfectly cured, as well as the most total deprivation of vegetables and fruit, appeared to be the chief causes of the scurvy. I carefully examined the bakery and the bread furnished the prisoners, and found that they were supplied almost entirely with cornbread from which the husk had not been separated. This husk acted as an irritant to the alimentary canal without adding any nutriment to the bran. As far as my examination extended, no fault could be found with the mode in which the bread was baked. The difficulty lay in the failure to separate the husk from the cornmeal. I strongly urged the preparation of large quantities of soup from the cow and calves' heads, with the brains and tongues, to which a liberal supply of sweet potatoes and vegetable might have been advantageously added. The material existed in abundance for the preparation of such soup in large quantities, with but little additional expense. Such aliment would have been not only highly nutritious, but it would have acted as an efficient remedial agent for the removal of the scorbutic condition. The sick within the stockade lay under several long sheds which were originally built for barracks. These sheds covered two floors which were open on all sides. The sick lay upon the bare boards or upon such ragged blankets as they possessed, without, as far as I observed, any bedding or even straw. The haggard, distressed countenances of these miserable, complaining, dejected, living skeletons, crying for medical aid and food, and cursing their government for its refusal to exchange prisoners, and the ghastly corpses with their glazed eyeballs staring up into vacant space, with the flies swarming down their open and grinning mouths and over their ragged clothes, infested with lice, as they lay amongst the sick and dying, formed a picture of helpless, hopeless misery which it would be impossible to portray by words or by the brush. A feeling of disappointment and even resentment on account of the United States government upon the subject of the exchange of prisoners appeared to be widespread, and the apparent hopeless nature of the negotiations for some general exchange of prisoners appeared to be a cause of universal regret and injurious despondency. I heard some of the prisoners go so far as to exonerate the Confederate government from any charge of intentionally subjecting them to a protracted confinement with its necessary and unavoidable sufferings in a country cut off from all intercourse with foreign nations, and sorely pressed on all sides, whilst, on the other hand, they charged their prolonged captivity upon their own government, which was attempting to make the Negro equal to the white man. Some hundred or more of the prisoners had been released from confinement in the stockade on parole, and filled various offices as druggists, clerks, carpenters, etc., in the various departments. These men were well clothed, and presented a stout and healthy appearance, and as a general rule they presented a more robust and healthy appearance than the Confederate troops guarding the prisoners. The entire grounds are surrounded by a frail board fence, and are strictly guarded by Confederate soldiers, and no prisoner, except the paroled attendant, is allowed to leave the grounds, except by a special permit from the Commandant of the interior of the prison. The patients and attendants, near two thousand in number, are crowded into this confined space and are but poorly supplied with old and ragged tents. Large numbers of them were without any bunks in their tents, and lay upon the ground, oft-times without even a blanket. No beds or straw appeared to have been furnished. 
the tents extend to within a few yards of the small stream the eastern portion of which as we have said before is used as a privy and is loaded with excrements and i observed a large pile of cornbread bones and filth of all kinds thirty feet in diameter and several feet high swarming with myriads of flies in a vacant space near the pots used for cooking millions of flies swarmed over everything and covered the faces of the sleeping patients and crawled down their open mouths and deposited their maggots in the gangrenous wounds of the living and in the mouths of the dead mosquitoes in great numbers also infest the tents and many of the patients were so stung by these pestiferous insects that they resembled those suffering from a slight attack of the measles the police hygiene of the hospital were defective in the extreme the attendants who appeared in almost every instance to have been selected from the prisoners seemed to have in many cases but little interest in the welfare of their fellow captives the accusation was made that the nurses in many cases robbed the sick of their clothing money and rations and carried on a clandestine trade with the paroled prisoners and confederate guards without the hospital enclosure in the clothing effects of the sick dying and dead federals they certainly appeared to neglect the comfort and cleanliness of the sick entrusted to their care in a most shameful manner even after making due allowances for the difficulties of the situation many of the sick were literally encrusted with dirt and filth and covered with vermin when a gangrenous wound needed washing the limb was thrust out a little from the blanket or board or rags upon which the patient was lying and water poured over it and all the putrescent matter allowed to soak into the ground floor of the tent the supply of rags for dressing wounds was said to be very scant and i saw the most filthy rags which had been applied several times and imperfectly washed used in dressing wounds where hospital gangrene was prevailing it was impossible for any wound to escape contagion under these circumstances the results of the treatment of wounds in the hospital were of the most unsatisfactory character from this neglect of cleanliness in the dressings and wounds themselves as well as from various other causes which will be more fully considered i saw several gangrenous wounds filled with maggots i have frequently seen neglected wounds amongst the confederate soldiers similarly affected and as far as my experience extends these worms destroy only the dead tissues and do not injure specially the well parts i have even heard surgeons affirm that a gangrenous wound which had been thoroughly cleaned by maggots healed more rapidly than if it had been left to itself this want of cleanliness on the part of the nurses appeared to be the result of carelessness and inattention rather than of malignant design and the whole trouble can be traced to the want of the proper police and sanitary regulations and to the absence of intelligent organization and division of labor the abuses were in a large measure due to the almost total absence of system government and rigid but wholesome sanitary regulations in extenuation of these abuses it was alleged by the medical officers that the confederate troops were barely sufficient to guard the prisoners and that it was impossible to obtain any number of experienced nurses from the confederate forces in fact the guard appeared to be too small even for the regulation of the internal hygiene and police of the hospital the manner of disposing of the dead was also calculated to depress the already desponding spirits of these men many of whom have been confined for months and even for two years in richmond and other places and whose strength had been wasted by bad air bad food and neglect of personal cleanliness the dead house is merely a frame covered with old tent cloth and a few bushes situated in the southwestern corner of the hospital grounds when a patient dies he is simply laid in the narrow street in front of his tent until he is removed by federal negroes detailed to carry off the dead if a patient dies during the night he lies there until the morning and during the day even the dead were frequently allowed to remain for hours in these walks 
in the dead house the corpses lie upon the bare ground and were in most cases covered with filth and vermin the cooking arrangements are of the most defective character five large iron pots similar to those used for boiling sugar-cane appear to be the only cooking utensils furnished the hospital for the cooking of two thousand men and the patients were dependent in a great measure upon their own miserable utensils they were allowed to cook in the tent doors and in the lanes and this was another source of filth and another favorable condition for the generation and multiplication of flies and other vermin the air of the tents was foul and disagreeable in the extreme and in fact the entire grounds emitted a most nauseous and disgusting smell i entered nearly all the tents and carefully examined the cases of interest and especially the cases of gangrene upon numerous occasions during the prosecution of my pathological inquiries at andersonville and therefore enjoyed every opportunity to judge correctly of the hygiene and police of the hospital there appeared to be almost absolute indifference and neglect of the part of the patient of personal cleanliness their persons and clothing in most instances and especially those suffering with gangrene and scorbutic ulcers were filthy in the extreme and covered with vermin it was too often the case that the patients were received from the stockade in a most deplorable condition i have seen men brought in from the stockade in a dying condition begrimed from head to foot with their own excrements and so black from smoke and filth that they resembled negroes rather than white men that this description of the stockade has not been overdrawn will appear from the reports of the surgeon in charge we will first examine the consolidated report of the sick and wounded federal prisoners during six months from the first of march to the thirty first of august forty two thousand six hundred and eighty six cases of sickness and wounds were reported no classified record of the sick in the stockade was kept after the establishment of the hospital without the prison this fact in conjunction with those already presented relating to the insufficiency of medical officers and the extreme illness and even death of many prisoners in the tents in the stockade without any medical attention or record beyond the bare number of the dead demonstrates that these figures large as they seem to be are far below the truth as the number of prisoners varied greatly at different periods the relations between those reported sick and well as far as those statistics extend can best be determined by a comparison of the statistics of each month during this period of six months no less than five hundred and sixty-five deaths are recorded under the head of morbi vani in other words those men died without having received sufficient medical attention for the determination of even the name of the disease causing death during the month of august fifty-three cases and fifty-three deaths are recorded as due to marasmus surely this large number of deaths must have been due to some other morbid state than slow wasting if they were due to improper and insufficient food they would have been classed accordingly and if to diarrhoea or dysentery or scurvy the classification in like manner would have been explicit we observe a progressive increase in the rate of mortality from three point eleven per cent in march to nine point oh nine per cent of mean strength sick and well in august the ratio of mortality continued to increase during september for notwithstanding the removal of one-half the entire number of prisoners during the early portion of the month one thousand seven hundred and sixty seven deaths are registered from september one to twenty one and the largest number of deaths upon any one day occurred during this month on the sixteenth viz one hundred and nineteen the entire number of federal prisoners confined at andersonville was about forty thousand six hundred and eleven and during the period of near seven months from february twenty four to september twenty one nine thousand four hundred and seventy nine deaths were recorded that is during this period near one-fourth or more exactly one in four point two or twenty three point three per cent 
terminated fatally. This increase of mortality was due in great measure to the accumulation of the sources of disease as the increase of excrements and filth of all kinds and the concentration of noxious effluvia and also to the progressive effects of salt diet, crowding, and the hot climate. Conclusions First, the great mortality among the federal prisoners confined in the military prison at Andersonville was not referable to climatic causes or to the nature of the soil and waters. Second, the chief causes of death were scurvy and its results and bowel affections, chronic and acute diarrhea and dysentery. The bowel affections appear to have been due to the diet and the habits of the patients, the depressed, dejected state of the nervous system and moral and intellectual powers, and to the effluvia arising from the decomposing animal and vegetable filth. The effects of salt meat and the unvarying diet of cornmeal, with but few vegetables and imperfect supplies of vinegar and syrup, were manifested in the great prevalence of scurvy. This disease, without doubt, was also influenced to an important extent in its origin and course by the foul animal emanations. Third, from the sameness of the food and form, the action of the poisonous gases in the densely crowded and filthy stockade and hospital, the blood was altered in its constitution even before the manifestation of actual disease. In both the well and the sick, the red corpuscles were diminished, and in all diseases uncomplicated with inflammation, the fibrous element was deficient. In cases of ulceration of the mucous membrane of the intestinal canal, the fibrous element of the blood was increased, while in simple diarrhea, uncomplicated with ulceration, it was either diminished or else remained stationary. Heart clots were very common, if not universally present, in cases of ulceration of the intestinal mucous membrane, while in the uncomplicated cases of diarrhea and scurvy, the blood was fluid and did not coagulate readily, and the heart clots and fibrous concretions were almost universally absent. From the watery condition of the blood there resulted various serous effusions into the pericardium, ventricles of the brain, and into the abdomen. In almost all the cases which I examined after death, even the most emaciated, there were more or less serous effusions into the abdominal cavity. In case of hospital gangrene of the extremities, and in case of gangrene of the intestines, heart clots and vibrous coagula were universally present. The presence of these clots in the cases of hospital gangrene, while they were absent in the cases in which there were no inflammatory symptoms, sustains the conclusion that hospital gangrene is a species of inflammation, imperfect and irregular though it may be in its progress, in which the fibrous element and coagulation of the blood are increased, even in those who are suffering from such a condition of the blood, and from such diseases as are naturally accompanied with a disease in the fibrous constituent. Fourth, the fact that hospital gangrene appeared in the stockade first and originated spontaneously without any previous contagion and occurred sporadically all over the stockade and prison hospital was proof positive that this disease will arise whenever the conditions of crowding, filth, foul air, and bad diet are present. The exhalations of the hospital and stockade appeared to exert their effects to a considerable distance outside of these localities. The origin of hospital gangrene among the prisoners appeared clearly to depend in great measure to the state of the general system induced by diet and various external noxious influences. The rapidity of the appearance and action of the gangrene depended upon the powers and state of the constitution as well as upon the intensity of the poison in the atmosphere or upon the direct application of poisonous matter to the wounded surface. 
this was further illustrated by the important fact that hospital gangrene or a disease resembling it in all essential respects attacked the intestinal canal of patients laboring under ulceration of the bowels although there were no local manifestations of gangrene upon the surface of the body this mode of termination in case of dysentery was quite common in the foul atmosphere of the confederate states military hospital in the depressed depraved condition of the system of these federal prisoners fifth a scorbutic condition of the system appeared to favor the origin of foul ulcers which frequently took on true hospital gangrene scurvy and hospital gangrene frequently existed in the same individual in such cases vegetable diet with vegetable acids would remove the scorbutic condition without curing the hospital gangrene from the results of the existing war for the establishment of the independence of the confederate states as well as from the published observations of dr trotter sir gilbert blaine and others of the english navy and army it is evident that the scorbutic condition of the system especially in crowded ships and camps is most favorable to the origin and spread of foul ulcers and hospital gangrene as in the present case of andersonville so also in past times when medical hygiene was almost entirely neglected those two diseases were almost universally associated in crowded ships in many cases it was very difficult to decide at first whether the ulcer was a simple result of scurvy or the action of the prison or hospital gangrene for there was great similarity in the appearance of the ulcers in the two diseases so commonly have those two diseases been confined to their origin and action that the description of scorbutic ulcers by many authors evidently includes also many of the prominent characteristics of hospital gangrene this will be rendered evident by an examination of the observations of dr lind and sir gilbert blaine upon scorbutic ulcers sixth gangrenous spots followed by rapid destruction of the tissue appeared in some cases where there has been no known wound without such well-established facts it might be assumed that the disease was propagated from one patient to another in such a filthy and crowded hospital as that of the confederate states military prison at andersonville it was impossible to isolate the wounded from the sources of actual contact with gangrenous matter the flies swarmed over the wounds and over filth of every kind the filthy imperfectly washed and scantily supplies of rags and the limited supply of washing utensils the same wash bowl serving for scores of patients were sources of such constant circulation of the gangrenous matter that the disease might rapidly spread from a single gangrenous wound the fact already stated that a form of moist gangrene resembling hospital gangrene was quite common in this foul atmosphere in cases of dysentery both with and without the existence of the entire service not only demonstrates the dependence of the disease upon the state of the constitution but proves in the clearest manner that neither the contact of the poisonous matter of gangrene nor the direst action of the poisonous atmosphere upon the ulcerated surface are necessary to the development of the disease seventh in this foul atmosphere amputation did not arrest hospital gangrene the disease almost universally returned almost every amputation was followed finally by death either from the effects of gangrene or from the prevailing diarrhea and dysentery nitric acid and escherotes generally in this crowded atmosphere loaded with noxious effluvia exerted only temporary effects after their application to the diseased surfaces the gangrene would frequently return with redoubled energy and even after the gangrene had been completely removed by local and constitutional treatment it would frequently return and destroy the patient as far as my observation extended very few of the cases of amputation for gangrene recovered the progress of these cases was frequently very deceptive i have observed after death 
the most extensive disorganization of the stump when during life there was but little swelling of the part and the patient was apparently doing well i endeavored to impress upon the medical officers the view that on this disease treatment was almost useless without an abundance of pure fresh air nutritious food and tonics and stimulants such changes however as would allow of the isolation of the cases of hospital gangrene appeared to be out of the power of the medical officers eighth the gangrenous mass was without true pus and consisted chiefly of broken down disorganized structures the reaction of the gangrenous matter in certain stages was alkaline ninth the best and in truth the only means of protecting large armies and navies as well as prisoners from the ravages of hospital gangrene is to furnish liberal supplies of well-cured meat together with fresh beef and vegetables and to enforce a rigid system of hygiene tenth finally this gigantic mass of human misery calls loudly for relief not only for the sake of suffering humanity but also on account of our own brave soldiers now captive in the hands of the federal government strict justice to the gallant men of the confederate armies who have been or who may be so unfortunate as to be compelled to surrender in battle demands that the confederate government should adopt that course which will best secure their health and comfort in captivity or at least leave their enemies without a shadow of an excuse for any violation of the rules of civilized warfare in the treatment of prisoners. End of Witnesses' Testimony The variation from month to month of the proportion of deaths to the whole number of living is singular and interesting. It supports the theory I have advanced above, as the following facts taken from the official report will show. In April, one in every sixteen died. In May, one in every twenty-six died. In June, one in every twenty-two died. In July, one in every eighteen died. In August, one in eleven died. In September, one in every three died. In October, one in every two died. In November, one in every three died. Does the reader fully understand that in September one-third of those in the pen died? that in october one half of the remainder perished and in november one third of those who still survived died let him pause for a moment and read this over carefully again because its startling magnitude will hardly dawn upon him at first reading it is true that the fearful disproportionate mortality of those months was largely due to the fact that it was mostly the sick that remained behind but even this diminishes but little the frightfulness of the showing did any one ever hear of an epidemic so fatal that one-third of those attacked by it in one month died one-half of the remnant the next month and one-third of the feeble remainder the next month if he did, his reading has been much more extensive than mine. The total number of deceased Union soldiers during and in consequence of the war is 316,233. Of these, only 175,764 have been identified, and the rest will probably remain forever unknown. Of the grand total, 36,868 are known to have been prisoners of war who died in captivity. There are 72 national cemeteries for the dead of the Union armies, besides which there are 320 local and post cemeteries. The largest of the government grounds are Arlington, Virginia, the former homestead of General Robert E. Lee, 15,547 graves, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 15,300 graves, Salisbury, North Carolina, 12,112 graves, Beaufort, South Carolina, 10,000 graves, Andersonville, Georgia, 13,706 graves, Marietta, Georgia, 10,000 graves, 
New Orleans, Louisiana, 12,230 graves, Vicksburg, Mississippi, 17,012 graves, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 12,964 graves, Nashville, Tennessee, 16,529 graves, Memphis, Tennessee, 13,958 graves, Jefferson Barracks, near St. Louis, Missouri, 8,601 graves. The National Cemetery near Richmond, Virginia, contains 6,276 graves, of which 5,450 are of unknown dead, mostly prisoners of war. The cemeteries are kept in good condition and are generally well sodded and planted with ornamental trees. The following is an appeal to Congress in behalf of the ex-prisoners of war issued by Felix Lebaum, President of the National Ex-Prisoners of War Association, and I hope that the united efforts of every one of the survivors will be concentrated with an object in view which shall substantially benefit those who performed a most valuable service in putting down the rebellion, suffering horrors and privations that cannot fully be described, and for which privations and sufferings they have never been recognized in the existing pension laws. APPEAL TO CONGRESS it is a historical fact that in the early part of 1864, shortly after the battles of the wilderness, certain high officials of the federal government decided that it was more economical to stop the exchange of prisoners of war entirely. The policy of non-exchange was understood to be based on the following facts. That a soldier counted for more in the Confederate Army, then acting on the defensive, that many of the Andersonville prisoners were men whose term of service had already expired, that all of them were disabled by starvation and exposure, and unfit for further service, while every Confederate was able-bodied and in for the war, so that an exchange would have been a gratuitous strengthening of the armies of the Confederacy, which at the same time would have prevented the prisoners held in the South from falling into the hands of Sherman. August 14, 1864, General Grant telegraphed to General Butler, It is hard on our men held in southern prisons not to exchange them, but it is humane to those left in the ranks to fight our battles. If we now commence a system of exchange which liberates all prisoners taken, we will have a fight on till the whole South is exterminated. If we hold those captured, they count for more than dead men. In accordance with General Grant's opinion, General Butler then wrote a letter in reply to General Old's proposals of exchange. In his famous Lowell speech, Butler said, In this letter these questions were argued justly, I think, not diplomatically, but obtrusively and demonstratively, not for the purpose of furthering an exchange of prisoners, but for the purpose of preventing and stopping the exchange and furnishing a ground on which we could stand. The men who languished at Andersonville and other Confederate prisons played in their sufferings and death an active part in the termination of the war. This part was not so stirring as charging on guns or meeting in the clash of infantry lines. But as the victims of a policy dictated by the emergency of a desperate condition of affairs, their enforced long-continued hardships and sufferings made it possible for the Union generals and their armies to decide the deplorable struggle so much sooner and to terminate the existence of the Confederacy by the surrender at Appomattox. No soldier or seaman in this or any other country ever made such personal sacrifices or endured such hardships and privations as those who fell into the hands of the Confederates during the late war. The recital of their sufferings would be scarcely believed were they not corroborated by so large a number of unimpeachable witnesses on both sides. Colonel C. T. Chandler's CSA report on Andersonville, dated August 5, 1864, in which he said, It is difficult to describe the horrors of the prison which is a disgrace to civilization, was endorsed by Colonel R. H. Chilton, Inspector General CSA, as follows, 
the condition of the prisoners at andersonville is a reproach to us as a nation the sixty thousand graves filled by the poor victims of the several prisons tells a story that cannot be denied or misunderstood when we consider the hardships and privations to which these men were subjected the wonder is not that so many died but that any survived we submit it is hardly possible that any man who was subjected to the hardships and inhuman treatment of a confederate prison for even two or three months only could come out any other than permanently disabled statistics show that of those who were released nearly five per cent died before reaching home in a few instances there was a roll kept of thirty to fifty of those men who when released were able to travel home alone and it is now found that nearly three-fourths of the number have since died the roll of the andersonville survivors association shows that during the year eighteen eighty the number of deaths averaged sixteen and one-third per cent of the total membership showing an increase of five per cent over the death rate of eighteen seventy nine but few of the most fortunate of these survivors will live to see the age of fifty and probably within the next ten years the last of them will have passed away congress has from time to time enacted laws most just and liberal or that were intended to be so toward the men who were disabled in the late war but a large majority of the prison survivors are excluded from a pension under these laws this comes partly from the unfriendly spirit in which the pension department has been administered for the last six years and partly from the peculiar circumstances surrounding their several cases many paroled prisoners on reaching the union lines were at once sent home on furlough without receiving any medical treatment the most of these were afterwards discharged under general order number seventy seven dated war department washington d c april twenty eighth eighteen sixty five because physically unfit for service and hence there is no official record whatever as to their disease if one of those men applies for a pension he is called upon to furnish the affidavit of some army surgeon who treated him after his release and prior to discharge showing that he then had the disease on which he now claims a pension for reasons stated this is impossible the next thing is a call to furnish an affidavit from some doctor who treated the man while at home on furlough or certainly immediately following his final discharge showing that he was then afflicted with identical disease on which pension is now claimed this is generally impossible for many reasons in most cases the released prisoner felt it was not medicine he wanted but the kindly nursing of mother or wife and nourishing food so no doctor was called at least for some months after reaching home in the instances where the doctor was called not infrequently he cannot now be found cannot swear that the soldier had any particular disease for the first six months after reaching home as he was a mere skeleton from starvation and it required months of careful nursing before he had vitality enough for a disease to manifest itself then again in many cases the poor victim has never suffered from any particular disease but rather from a combination of numerous ills the sequence of a wrecked constitution commonly termed by physicians general debility but the commissioner refuses to grant a pension on disease save where the proof is clear and positive of the contracting of a particular disease while in the service of its existence at date of final discharge and of its continuous existence from year to year for each and every year to present date in most cases it is impossible for a prison survivor to furnish any such proof and hence his application is promptly rejected besides these there are hundreds of other obstacles in the way of the surviving prisoner of war who applies for a pension one thing is he is called upon to prove by comrades who were in prison with him the origin and nature of his disease and his condition prior to and at the time of his release 
this is generally impossible as he was likely to have but few comrades in prison with whom he was on intimate terms and these if not now dead cannot be found they are men without sufficient knowledge of anatomy and physiology and not one out of a hundred could conscientiously swear to the origin and diagnosis of the applicant's disease is it not ridiculous for the government to insist upon such preposterous evidence which if produced in due form is a rule drawn up by the applicant's physician and sworn to by the witness cum grano salis and in most cases amounts to perjury for charity's sake. Hence it will be seen the difficulty surrounding the prison survivor who is disabled and compelled to apply for a pension are so numerous and insurmountable as to shut out a very large majority of the most needy and deserving cases from the benefits of the general pension laws entirely we claim therefore that as an act of equal justice to these men as compared with other soldiers there ought to be a law passed admitting them to pensions on record or other proof of confinement in a confederate prison for a prescribed length of time such as bill four four nine five introduced by the hon j warren keifer m c of ohio provides for if this bill is to benefit these poor sufferers any it must be passed speedily as those who yet remain will at best survive but a few years longer this measure is not asked as a pecuniary compensation for the personal losses these men have sustained as silver and gold cannot be weighed as the price for untold sufferings but it is asked that they may be partly relieved from abject want and their sufferings alleviated to some extent by providing them with the necessaries of life, for nearly all of them are extremely poor, consequent on the wreck of their physical and mental powers. Honoring President James A. Garfield In the closing of this book, we deem it fitting to produce a very correct likeness of our beloved president who lies at death's door smitten by the hand of the assassin guiteau this is done more in appreciation of the peculiar sadness of the circumstances and the anxiety of the people than because of any connection which the cut may have with the other contents of the book read twice referred to the committee on invalid pensions and ordered to be printed Mr. Keifer, by unanimous consent, introduced the following bill. A bill granting pensions to certain Union soldiers and sailors of the late War of the Rebellion who were confined in so-called Confederate prisons. Whereas during the late Rebellion many soldiers and sailors of the Federal Army and Navy through the fortunes of war became prisoners and were confined in so-called Confederate prisons to the detriment and permanent injury of their health, but whose debility is of such a general and indefinable character as to exclude them from the benefits of existing pension laws. Therefore, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America America in Congress assembled, that the Secretary of the Interior be, and he hereby is, authorized and required to place upon the pension rolls of the United States, upon application and proof of being made to the satisfaction of the Department, all honorably discharged soldiers and sailors of the Federal Army and Navy, who during the late war were captured and confined during the period of six months or more in any of the prisons or places commonly used for the confinement of prisoners by the so-called Confederate authorities during the late rebellion, and who are not now beneficiaries, nor entitled to become so under existing pension laws of the United States. Section 2. That such pension shall in such case begin from the date of the discharge of the soldier or sailor aforesaid from the military or naval service of the United States, and shall be at the rate of eight dollars per month in cases where the term of imprisonment shall have been more than six months and less than one year, and one dollar per month additional for each full month of such imprisonment in excess of one year, and the said pension shall be paid 
paid at the same time and in the same manner as other pensions are paid, provided that nothing in this act shall be construed to authorize the reduction or to prevent the increase of the pension of any person now receiving or entitled to receive the benefits of existing pension laws. End of Andersonville Diary Escape and List of the Dead by John L. Ransom Recording by David Wales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 